the deputant's wish. Written by Fanny Finch and published by Starfall Publications. Manifestos of Love Series Book. Available on Amazon and free with Kindle Unlimited. Enjoy. Chapter 1 Dorset, 1823, Sebastian My lord, you wish to stop here? We are so near to your home now. Indeed, but if I turn up empty-handed, I will never hear the end of it, I'm sure. Sebastian laughed as he reached for the carriage door and called out of the window to his valet, who sat up beside the driver of the carriage. Sticking his head beyond the window, he felt the bristle of the wind tangling his cinnamon-coloured hair. When he saw Wareham Town ahead, he smiled. The road to the town was surrounded in red tulips and yellow daffodils that had raised their heads above the grass verges to greet the spring day. The town road was busy with people hurrying to the market. Stop at the market, Sebastian called to be heard, never once putting his head back through the window. It was exhilarating to be back here again after so long away. University had been an adventure, but there was nothing quite like Wareham and the countryside of Dorset. Oxford was beautiful, that couldn't be doubted. Yet, this place had something Oxford could never merit. It is home. Sebastian smiled at the thought as the carriage pulled to a stop in the cobbled street by the market. He leapt from the door as his valet stepped down from the front of the carriage. Marty was so concerned about climbing down from such a height that he plainly didn't look where he was putting his feet properly and tripped, his whole body leaping off the side of the carriage. Whoa! Sebastian stepped forward and caught his friend in time. Careful, Marty. Thank you, my lord. Marty straightened himself and adjusted his tailcoat. I seem to be getting worse. Truly, I hadn't noticed. Sebastian clapped him on the back with good humour. I'll be back shortly. Have no fear, we will be home soon. He walked off, stretching his tall frame with ease through the cobbled road as he headed to the stalls nearby. Marty had been his valet ever since he went to university and was proving himself something of a clumsy fellow over the last few years. Sebastian hardly minded. Marty was his friend as well as his valet, and there was no man with a better heart than him. As Sebastian stepped between the stalls, searching for a gift to bring his mother and cousin, now he had returned home, he noted Marty followed behind him. You fancied a walk, Marty? Eager to see Wareham again. I know what you mean. Sebastian tipped his chin up and admired the town square, with the church spire beyond and the Yellowstone Priory on the corner. It was a beautiful place, one that always managed to warm his heart, even if there was something preying on his mind. You can see standing here, looking at this town now, why I'm so reluctant to do... Well, what we discussed last night, he whispered, lowering his voice to make sure only Marty was the one who heard him as people passed them in the market. The Grand Tour, Marty whispered too. I thought your father was eager for you to go to the continent. He is eager, but I am not so sure about it. Sebastian saw a flower stall and turned his footsteps toward it. Sure, the continent would be fun, but I'd rather be home at least for a while, whilst there are some who need to stretch their wings and fly far away. I think I'm what some call a home bird. Home is good for me. Yet Sebastian was still not certain about his future. As much as he doubted a grand tour, he knew his father, Daniel Lewis, the Duke of Gordon, was eager for him to go. Now, let's see what they have. Sebastian bent down and appraised the flowers. If I turn up with a fair bunch for both my mother and my cousin, they are certain to welcome my return with open arms. Marty laughed heartily and shook his head. When you came back at Christmas, they threw their arms around you anyway. That is because I bought the finest Christmas presents. Sebastian laughed too, continuing the jest. The bonds he had with his family were close ones, and he knew their affections had nothing to do with his gifts but he was always eager to show his respect for them through such gestures. His mother, Arabella, had embraced him tightly when he gifted her a fine miniature at Christmas. 
As for Catherine, as much as any gift warmed her heart, there was one thing in particular she always wanted. She dreamed of wearing a pair of earrings she had admired since she was a child, with innocent love and adoration. He half wondered at times if it was more about Catherine's love for her aunt that made her dote on her aunt's earrings, rather than the object themselves. She longs for the pair of earrings that my mother wears so much. Now, let's see. How about these? Sebastian turned and reached a hand toward a yellow rose, when another's hand reached down for the same flower. I'm sorry. Sebastian pulled back, startled that as his hand had brushed this other, there had been a jolt up his arm. Feeling the spark, he turned quickly to see just who the hand belonged to. No, no, it was my doing. A melodic voice spoke hurriedly. The lady giggled, lifted her hand and brushed back a loose lock of light blonde hair. The rich brown eyes widened when she saw Sebastian, and her plump lips parted. It's not possible. It's Elizabeth. Sebastian said nothing for a few seconds, but stared like a fool. His jaw slackened as he stared at the lady who had been his childhood friend, Elizabeth Vaughan, daughter of Baron Grey. Lord Wareham, Elizabeth hurried to curtsy. Sebastian remembered his manners and bowed too, feeling strangely tongue-tied in her company. The last time they had parted, he'd struggled to leave her. It was something he couldn't deny that despite their long childhood, friendship. He'd felt something deeper in her company the last time he'd known her. It was a fondness, a bond he'd struggled to label. When he went to university he'd fooled himself into thinking it was a childhood fancy, and nothing more. But their meeting today was instantly challenging that idea. Elizabeth, I mean, Lady Elizabeth, I should address you as such now. He laughed and bowed for a second time. Marty coughed behind him, earning his attention. Marty waved a hand, silently telling Sebastian he'd already bowed once. Goodness, the last three years have been kinder to you than me. He shifted his focus back to Elizabeth. She smiled and pushed that lock of hair behind her ear again. As sweet as ever, I see. Her eyes flitted over him, and he couldn't help doing the same thing. He admired the bold dark eyes, the subtle cheekbones and the golden colour of her hair in the sun. She had grown much since he had last seen her, and though she was not as tall as him, she had a strength of figure that was most alluring. When he couldn't help gazing at her curves, hugged by the white and pastel pink patterned gown, he cleared his throat feeling like a fool. Apparently I have forgotten how to make conversation whilst I've been away. He smiled and stepped closer toward her. How are you, Elizabeth? I mean, Lady Elizabeth. A difficult thing to remember, my lord, she teased him. So often when we were children together you called me such and I called you Seb. Well, I have no objection to you calling me such a thing again. He lowered his voice and moved even nearer to her, enjoying the proximity. He'd quite forgotten the flowers, thinking only of Elizabeth. She'd changed in his years away, not just in maturity, but in beauty. Where she'd been fair of face before, she now shone as golden as the sun above them. In contrast, Sebastian felt quite like a bumbling fool, uncertain what to do with his hands. He fidgeted with them, then let them fall still to his sides, hanging the ends of his tailcoat. Ah, cannot call you Seb now. Look at you. She gestured to him. You are quite a man, my lord. Am I? He turned in a circle as if parading for her with his arms outstretched. Have I changed very much? You are taller, certainly. She stood on her toes in emphasis, trying to reach his height. I remember you and I competing in height, to see who would grow taller, and my maid drew pencil marks on a wall. For a long time, I was taller than you. That is because I always slumped when we played such a game. He confessed in a conspiratorial whisper. I could not have you losing a game, could I? You didn't? 
She laughed raucously at the idea. I'm afraid I did. If we played such a game now, the result would be the same. He bent at the knees, making himself shorter than her. She laughed once again. That sound entranced Sebastian so much, he quite forgot where he was and why he was there. All he could think of was Elizabeth and this feeling that was sizzling in his breast. It was more than just the usual warmth that had always been there for his friend. There's a heat there too now. His eyes flitted over her face and her figure before he cleared his throat and internally reprimanded himself. Concentrate. Be a gentleman. I should not be ogling my friend. Yet it was impossible not to admire the woman Elizabeth had become. The fondness that had been there before was something deeper, something he longed to act on. Well, I cannot tell you how glad I am to see you again. Are you home for good? she asked, looking eager to have an answer. I don't know that. Yes. The lie fell from his lips easily. Out of the corner of his eye he saw Marty falter, staring at him wide-eyed. Sebastian couldn't say anything more, realising that he'd willingly said the lie just for the chance to see Elizabeth smile again. I'm glad. With you around, the season will be a good one. The way her eyes gazed at him, Sebastian felt jittery and excited all at once. Was it possible she felt something too? Was there a chance that when their hands had touched, she'd felt that same spark? Would the gentleman like to buy flowers for his sweetheart? The stallholder asked, striding forward. The happy lady gestured between the two of them with her plump hands. Oh. Sebastian froze as Elizabeth laughed and blushed a deep shade of crimson. She thinks we are sweethearts. The idea filled him with such excitement that he didn't seek to correct the lady. He just looked at Elizabeth and raised his eyebrows, enjoying listening to her laugh. We are not sweethearts, but thank you, Elizabeth explained hurriedly. Sebastian clamped down on the disappointment he felt, knowing that even if she did feel something, she would hardly declare it now. But that is no reason not to buy flowers. Sebastian reached down and picked up a bunch of the yellow roses that she had been reaching for. They were the perfect match, just as golden as her hair and complexion, yet rich with their multitude of petals. The flower of love, is it not? For you, Lady Elizabeth, he passed the flowers to her. I'll buy them, ma'am. As he handed a few coins over, Elizabeth smiled broadly and pressed her nose to the blooms, inhaling their sweet rose scent, as soft and delicate as a honeysuckle. Thank you, my lord, Elizabeth said in a rush. They are quite my favourite, yellow roses. Then I am glad to have learnt it. Enjoy them, my lady. He nodded his head to her. I must go. Elizabeth looked away as a lady at a distance called her name, waving her hand. It was so good to see you again, Seb. I mean, my lord. It seems you are struggling too with this new formality between us. Shall we just abandon it? He teased her in a pretend scandalous whisper. Ha! If only we could, my lord. I cannot tell you how glad I am to see you again. She clutched the roses to her chest and backed up, then curtsied. Sebastian only remembered to bow when he felt Marty elbow him in the back. I hope we shall see much of each other now you are home, Elizabeth called, then turned hurrying off to her friend, whom she showed the flowers to with vigour. Sebastian didn't move, but stared in her direction, both entranced and flawed. That was not what I was expecting, Sebastian whispered, as his valet moved to his side, tipping back his head so his dark black curly hair danced about his temple. Well, if ever Cupid's arrow was shot, I saw it then. Marty turned and pretended to fire at Sebastian. Are you feeling all right? I'm not so sure she is a beauty, is she not? Sebastian confessed, then turned back to the stall, selecting two more bunches of flowers for his mother and cousin. Certainly. And her humour. It is something I've missed. We were always great friends as children. What I saw then wasn't friendship, 
Marty teased at his side. When Sebastian narrowed his eyes at his valet, Marty stepped away. I might go hide on the other side of the stall. I fear you'll hit me with the flowers. Ha! I wouldn't destroy the flowers in such a way. He handed over the coins, then he and Marty strode through the market, heading back toward the carriage. Yet Sebastian was distracted. He looked back every few seconds, in the direction in which Elizabeth had parted, eager to see her again. She's gone. I wasn't looking for her. Yes, and I believe a storm is coming. Can you feel that rain? Marty held out his hands, gesturing to the bright blue sky and the golden sunshine above. See, we can all tell such fibs. You're a fool, Marty, Sebastian said good-naturedly with a laugh as he waved the flowers at his valet. Marty ran off before the flowers could strike him. I knew you were going to do that. Then run faster. Despite the words, Sebastian paused and looked back through the market again. He caught a glimpse of Elizabeth at a distance. She was wandering the markets with her friend, but not interested in the stalls. She stared at the flowers instead, inhaling their scent. Just the sight of her made Sebastian feel that jittery excitement again. He clutched the flowers he held, trying not to let that tremble spread through his body. Perhaps I have found a reason not to go on that grand tour after all, he murmured to himself, then turned and strode back to the carriage, his thoughts full of Elizabeth. Chapter 2 Sebastian Oh, Sebastian, I cannot tell you how much I love my flowers. Arabella fussed with the flowers in the nearest vase that she had placed on a sideboard. Where are my flowers? Daniel teased, walking around Sebastian and clapping him on the shoulder. Ha! I didn't think you'd want them, father. Good call. How are you, son? Daniel softened his words and turned to embrace Sebastian, clapping him on the shoulder with it. Sebastian held his father, then stepped back, gazing at how his father had changed over the last few years. Daniel was much the same, but the lines in his face were growing. His cinnamon hair, that was a lot like Sebastian's own, didn't have any greys in it yet, though the whiskers on his chin weren't quite as rich in colour as they had once been. The light brown eyes held humour as he looked at Sebastian. How was the journey? he asked. It was eventful. You'll never guess who I saw in town. Sebastian was eager to speak of Elizabeth, but before he could, Arabella grew distracted. Your cousin and your aunt and uncle are to come tonight to welcome you home. She turned away from her flowers and hurried toward him, embracing him too. He'd grown so tall that his mother was shorter than him these days, but could just as easily pull him into a hug and squeeze so tight that he struggled to breathe. Can't breathe, mother, he complained and teased her. Oops, sorry. Arabella released him, stepping back and smiling. Her auburn hair was tucked up into a neat chignon. She smelled sweetly of herbs and flowers, a scent that always followed her around. They are to be here soon, and your celebratory dinner shall begin. We're so proud of your achievements at Oxford. Indeed we are. Daniel clapped Sebastian on the shoulder again. Come, let's find you a drink. Claret? Yes, please. If I remember university well, you're used to stronger stuff by now, Daniel said with a playful warning glare. Don't expect that here. I was as good as gold at university, father, Sebastian insisted, but couldn't keep a straight face as he said it. Oh, Sebastian. Arabella tapped him around the arm. What? I was simply one of the men there, mother. There is often drinking. At his words, she still tutted and shook her head. I remember it well, Daniel concurred and moved to a drinks cabinet in the side of the room, collecting three claret glasses before he returned. Anything to report from your final days? Other than your success, of course. Well, there was one who I met in the market today. Sebastian tried to speak of Elizabeth once again. Oh, thank you, love. Arabella took the glass from Daniel and smiled at him, lifting the glass to her lips. The brush of their hands together brought smiles to both of them. 
Sebastian laughed as he looked between his parents, startled at how sweet and noticeable the love was still between them. After so many years of marriage, many couples might have found distance between them, but not his parents. They always appeared to be very much in love. Who did you meet? Daniel said. Sebastian took the glass, glad the conversation was steering back to what he intended to speak of. Elizabeth, Lady Elizabeth, daughter of Baron Grey, he explained. It has been a few years since I've seen her. She has grown up so much. Is she not a beauty? Arabella said eagerly. I couldn't deny that. Sebastian nodded in agreement. She's a lady now. Arabella took Sebastian's hand and drew him to a seat nearby. I wouldn't be surprised if she marries soon. At the words, Sebastian busied himself with an imagination. He saw Elizabeth walking down the aisle of a church, and the gentleman she was going to meet was Sebastian. In her bouquet were yellow roses, and as she reached him at the altar, she took his hand. That same spark he had felt in the market passed through his arm again. What is happening to me? He eagerly gulped from the claret, startled by how much power his thoughts had over his body, making him feel heated. Careful with that wine, Daniel laughed as he sat on another chair between them. Funnily enough, I saw Baron Grey recently at a dinner. We talked of his daughter. You did? Sebastian lowered his glass, eager to hear more. It's plain he hopes his daughter to make a match soon. She has a good dowry is beautiful, and has a reputation for being quite the lady from last season. I don't doubt he's right. It wouldn't surprise me if she was betrothed before the end of the season. Daniel sat back and cleared his throat. It wasn't quite a cough, but Arabella looked toward him all the same. Sebastian waited too, to see if his father would have one of his coughing attacks, but no such sound followed. It was a rare occasion these days for his father to struggle with the problem that plagued his lungs. But Sebastian had seen time and time again growing up that it was his mother who was his father's healer. She helped him when he most needed it. You do not need to look at me like that, love, Daniel laughed at his wife. I'm perfectly all right. I know. She reached forward and tapped his hand on the chair arm between them. That touch had Sebastian thinking of Elizabeth again. He sipped his wine, considering that if Elizabeth was to make a match this season, was it so absurd for him to hope that he could be the gentleman she married? The mere thought had his knee bobbing and his hand fidgeting with his wine glass. Such excitement and heat bled through him that he felt a sudden need to pull at his cravat and loosen its tightness. Now, let us talk of you, Sebastian. Daniel shifted his focus back to his son. What of the Grand Tour? Oh, well, Sebastian took a sharp intake of breath. He didn't want to go on the Grand Tour. He'd already been having doubts, but how could he do so now after meeting Elizabeth again? I am a home bird, as I told Marty. I wish to be here. With Elizabeth. We'll see, Sebastian said quietly, tapping his glass. He exchanged a look with his mother that showed him at once Arabella saw his doubts on the matter. She nodded almost imperceptibly, accepting his hesitation, yet Daniel hadn't noticed. You will love it, Daniel said eagerly. What an experience it is to travel the continent, see wonders that you've only read about in books. Hmm, Sebastian mumbled noncommittally. A bell rang in a distant part of the house, cutting off their conversation. Ah, that will be them. Arabella moved to her feet and hurried to the door of the parlour. What do you say, Sebastian? Daniel leaned toward him, tapping his arm. The grand tour. We must talk of the particulars soon. We'll see. 
Sebastian's fidgeting grew worse with his knee bobbing up and down so much now that Daniel looked toward it. When did you get so fidgety? Just hungry, father. Sebastian lied and looked around the room, seeking another subject to talk about. The parlour was rich in beauty. The walls had been plastered ornately with cornices and coving around a hanging candelabra and the wall sconces. Duck egg blue furnishings filled the space, with silver-rimmed rococo settees and chairs surrounding Sebastian. It was one of his favourite rooms, as he could remember getting up to much mischief with his cousin in this parlour. Once they had tipped over a chair when playing their games as children, and it had fallen into the fireplace. Fortunately, the fire had just been ash at the time. Though Arabella had not been pleased to find the armchair returned to its place covered in ash, with small sooty handprints all over the duck egg blue cushion. Ah, here he is, a familiar voice called. Sebastian stood as his aunt and uncle walked in. Aunt Clara was the first to hurry forward, her cinnamon hair that many in the family shared tucked behind her head. She reached for Sebastian and embraced him warmly. This house has not been the same without you. Thank you, Aunt, Sebastian said, glad to see her too. Uncle, how are you? Horatio stepped forward and offered his hand to shake Sebastian's. Glad to be here, he confessed. If I had to listen to one more evening of Catherine bemoaning your absence, I would have gone mad. He laughed heartily, speaking of which. He turned, his dark hair on his forehead dancing as he looked at his daughter. Where is he? Catherine ran into the room. So eager to see Sebastian, she ran straight into an armchair and tipped over it. Sebastian laughed at once as Horatio pinched his brow trying not to laugh. Clara moved to her daughter's side. Catherine, dear, you must look where you put your feet. That takes too long. Catherine straightened herself to stand and brushed off her mother. It's simply my eagerness to see Seb that makes me so clumsy. Then explained dropping an entire tea service this morning, Horatio teased his daughter. Sebastian laughed with Daniel as the latter produced a wine glass for Horatio. Looks like you need this, Daniel said to Horatio, who took it eagerly. Seb! Catherine launched herself at Sebastian. A mix of her mother and father, she bore hair that was a mixture of brown and black with strongly arched brows and dark eyes. To reach Sebastian, she tripped again on a rug. He managed to catch her with one arm and brushed it off as an embrace. So eager to see me, cousin. He laughed as she straightened herself up. You have taken so long to come home, she reprimanded him and tapped him around the arm. Ow! He pretended to be hurt by her. That's what happens at university. They keep you caged like animals. They do not, Daniel corrected him across the room as he passed a wine glass to his sister Clara. They do. Did you not hear about Lord Byron when he was at Cambridge? He kept a bear in his rooms. Did he really? Catherine laughed at the absurdity of the idea. You were not caged like a bear, Daniel rolled his eyes. Simply glad to be home, father. Sebastian raised his glass in the air in a mock toast. Daniel mirrored the action and laughed. Now, I'm stealing him away. Catherine took Sebastian's hand and dragged him across the room, pulling so sharply that he nearly fell over. Whoa! Sebastian worked hard not to fall on his face. Their parents laughed heartily and wandered toward the open door that led to the dining room. Sebastian and Catherine didn't follow, but ended up in the boxed window seat that was plush with cushions. Catherine eagerly pulled him down, smiling widely. Home has not been the same without you. You have no idea what it is like to put up with all our parents alone. She rolled her eyes in an exaggerated manner. Your parents fuss me as they cannot fuss you. You love it, really, Sebastian teased her. You adore my parents. I do, but I'm still glad to share the attention. Catherine brushed off the matter with a wave of her hand. 
You must tell me everything about university. It sounds like such an adventure. Hmm. Sebastian hurried to take another sip, not so eager to answer. Whilst he had enjoyed university, it had not been without its bad days, and there had been plenty of times when he would have rather been home than in Oxford. If he'd had his way, he would have been home before now. You are more eager for adventure than I am? I'm sure. He waved his wine glass at her. Then I must live vicariously through you. She gestured to him. Sebastian was distracted and looked out of the window, his mind elsewhere. Ah, but I see your thoughts are not with me. What? Sebastian looked back at his cousin. Come now, Seb. You and I have known each other our whole lives. You think I cannot see when you are thinking of something. You do this. She adopted a foolish expression, frowning cross-eyed with her lips firmly pressed together. Ha! I do not look like that much of an imbecile, surely. I make no comment. Catherine held up her hands in innocence. I have missed your good humour. And I yours, she waved at him. Now confess, Seb. What is it that has you so distracted this evening? Sebastian put his wine glass down on the windowsill and leaned forward, knowing at once that he could trust his cousin with his secret. She was his greatest friend, and the two had practically lived in one another's pockets since they could walk. I saw Lady Elizabeth today, Sebastian whispered. She and I have become great friends since you've been away, Catherine said distractedly. You have? Sebastian raised his brows. I see this meeting has quite struck you, has it? Catherine whispered knowingly. It has, Sebastian nodded. I would struggle to describe it. There was always a fondness there, but when I saw her today, bang, it was as if I was struck with a lightning bolt. You should have seen my valet. He scoffed, shaking his head. Marty said I'd been struck by Cupid's arrow itself. Are you in love? So quickly? Catherine leaned forward. No, no. Yet Sebastian felt his gut tighten in rejection of the idea. He knew Elizabeth very well, and this meeting was the spark of something new between them. Perhaps I am in danger of finding myself in love with her. You could say that. Catherine held a hand over her mouth, her eyes wide. How wonderful. Her words were muffled with her hand over her mouth. Care to speak clearly? Sebastian asked, and she lowered that hand. Well, perhaps I could be of assistance to you. She sat taller with a victorious smile. Assistance? How? he asked. If you wish to court Elizabeth, maybe I could encourage the relationship. Nudge it along. She mirrored her words by nudging his elbow. You would do that? Of course, on one condition. Catherine held up a finger. Help me get the one thing that I have always wanted. Sebastian sighed, knowing just what she was going to ask for. You wish for my mother's earrings? Of course, those beautiful ones, the long gold bands with two pearls and a diamond in each. I just wish to borrow them for a while. She has so many she would never notice. Catherine waved a hand in the air. They are her favourites. And mine, Catherine reminded him. I've longed to borrow them for so long, but she would never let me. Come on, Seb, help me. Take them. Borrow them, she corrected him, and I will help your potential courtship of Elizabeth. So, what do you say? She offered her hand as if they were about to strike a business deal. Sebastian hesitated, knowing his mother loved those earrings. Then he saw Elizabeth's face in his mind's eye again, and his heart thudded in his chest. Very well, you have your deal. Chapter 3 Elizabeth What do you think, Sarah? Elizabeth turned around in front of the mirror, watching as her pastel blue gown shimmered in the last light through the window. Will I do for this assembly? Why, my lady, what a pleasure it would be to dance with you tonight. 
Sarah adopted a deeper tone and appeared in the mirror's reflection behind Elizabeth, offering an excessively flamboyant bow. Elizabeth laughed deeply and turned to her maid, knowing the playful ways of Sarah had always given her a reason to smile. May I have this dance? Sarah continued this false depth of voice as she pretended to be a gentleman and then cleared her throat. Please say yes, as it's rather painful to maintain this odd tone. Elizabeth pretended to giggle modestly, raising a fan to her lips to hide her face, then curtsied to her maid. Thank you for watching. Before we continue into the story, do us a favor. Hit the subscribe button this way we will be able to create more audiobooks for free for you. Thank you again. Now, back to our story. Why, yes, I'd be delighted, good sir. She gave her hand to Sarah, who led her into a dance around the room. They hopped together, laughing when Sarah leapt over a hairbrush that had fallen off the vanity table. Ha! How ridiculous I'll look laughing like this. Tell me, how is one supposed to dance and laugh modestly behind a fan at the same time? She mocked herself, trying to dance with Sarah, then raised the fan. Gentlemen must think it's strange that a lady is forever hiding her face, Sarah agreed, nodding her head so her light brown curls bobbed around her ears. Exactly. Let me cast it away. So, at least then, they can see me smile. Elizabeth dramatically tossed the fan. It landed somewhere on the table and knocked a handheld mirror onto the floor too. They laughed as Sarah now had to jump over this obstacle as well as the first as they danced. Sarah led her to the side, back and forth as she took Elizabeth's hands, then turned Elizabeth under her arm. Ah, scandalous, my lady, to be seen to smile so much in a gentleman's company, Sarah teased her. Oh, I know. Elizabeth covered her mouth in pretend shock. Imagine that, being so caught up in a gentleman's company as to actually be scandalous. Sarah swept an arm around Elizabeth and came close. Like this? Sarah laughed at the words. Elizabeth pretended to swoon, casting a hand to her forehead and tipping backward. Oomph! I'm going to have to get stronger if we're playing this game. Sarah held her up with an arm under her waist. Ha! Have I grown so large? Elizabeth teased and stood straight again. Both she and Sarah were slight in figure, but where Elizabeth had grown curves, Sarah was slim. Her maid was her dearest friend, who she shared every secret with. The two had played such nonsensical games together for so long that Elizabeth could not even remember when it first began. It is absurd, though, is it not? she asked seriously for one minute. Every mad thing a lady is told to do on a night such as tonight at an assembly. You mean to dance freely, then modestly do this. Sarah snatched up the fan and fluttered it in front of her face, batting her big blue eyes. Elizabeth giggled, holding a hand over her mouth to try and muffle the sound. And one must drink freely, too. Sarah reached for an empty glass beside them yet also wave one's dance card in front of a gentleman's eye. She took Elizabeth's dance card off the table and tried to do everything all at once. I think you'll need another hand tonight. I may need it. Elizabeth took the dance card from her maid and threaded it around her wrist. I'd rather be myself at such events. I am proper enough. You are proper, very refined, my lady. You know that. Sarah reached forward and adjusted a few of the loose golden locks of Elizabeth's hair. Yet what I object to is the constant game at these affairs. Entice a man to dance, but do not be so bold as to look him in the eye for too long. Be coy, yet be endearing. It is a world full of contradictions and games. Elizabeth huffed and dropped down onto her stool by her vanity table. Sarah stood behind her, adjusting a few pins in her hair that had come loose in their game. I wish marriage was not a game. It is not always. Oh, it is. You should hear my mother and father talking of it. Elizabeth huffed and fidgeted with the dance card. 
My father speaks of it as if he is playing some grand chess game. Each piece on the board is a different suitor and offers different things. It's quite absurd to hear him talk in such a way when truly all the pieces look the same to me. I never was very good at the game. Not a single piece has caught your eye, my lady, Sarah asked. Not one. No. Elizabeth spoke hurriedly, then fidgeted even more with her dance card. The day before, something had happened that had changed her view of things. She'd met Lord Wareham again, or as she had known him for so long as they were children together, Sebastian. She rather pictured casting aside all the pieces of her father's chessboard, knocking the suitors to the ground that had taken the place of the bishop, the king, the pawns and more. In the middle of the chessboard, she'd place a yellow rose to symbolise one man. He was not who I was expecting. She couldn't deny the attraction she had felt to Sebastian. He'd grown much since she had last seen him. He was not only taller and more mature in figure, but his shoulders had broadened a little, yet his figure was slim. His honey-coloured eyes were endless, seeming to go on forever as he stared at her, and the strong jawline had tempted her into thinking what it would be like to run a finger across it. Goodness, he has wormed his way into my thoughts again. She shook her head, trying to stop her thoughts that had run away with her. Not a single man has caught your eye, Sarah said again, trying to nudge a response from her. There is a man I find handsome, certainly, Elizabeth confessed, though she chewed her lip, determined not to say his name. She pictured Sebastian as he had handed her the yellow roses and the broad smile on his lips. He is like no other man I know. Yet there would be objections to such a match. She shifted in her seat, thinking he'd only given her the roses as the stall owner had made that comment about them being sweethearts. It was his attempt to cover up an awkward situation. A sweet attempt, and one she appreciated. Though she wished he'd given them to her for another reason. Why would there be any objections? Sarah asked as she walked toward the wardrobe and pulled out a pelisse for Elizabeth to wear over her gown to the assembly. He is young. Elizabeth sighed, knowing full well what her father would say. Every gentleman my father has so far discussed when it comes to being a suitor is much older than I. He calls any man over the age of twenty-five. A good age to marry. Absurd, is it not? Pah! I question why a man has to be twenty-five and a woman only eighteen, Sarah whispered. A lady just last month married and she was eighteen. What different expectations there are on the genders. Yes, perhaps so. Elizabeth took her shawl from her maid, then smiled. As she was now twenty, her father was growing impatient and wanted her married. If only I could be so fortunate as to dance as we dance, but with a young man. Would you be swept up in a rake's arms, my lady? Sarah danced by herself in the room, then mirrored the swoon Elizabeth had made. If only. What excitement that would be. To have one's heart beating so much for another. Elizabeth danced, then swooned too, copying Sarah's movements so that they both fell down onto the end of the bed and laughed heartily together. Elizabeth was so busy laughing that she didn't notice the creak of the door opening. Elizabeth, what is all this? At her mother's voice, Elizabeth sat up sharply and Sarah leapt to her feet, hurrying to pick up the hairbrush from the floor and tidy the vanity table. Elizabeth shifted her focus to her mother. In the doorway stood Miranda, her own blonde hair tucked up in such a way that not a single hair was out of place. Where Elizabeth's dark eyes brought a warmth to her face. Her mother's dark eyes were much colder and smaller. They had a habit of piercing anyone she looked at to the spot, as Elizabeth felt so pierced now as she sat on the edge of the bed. You are playing your games again, Miranda folded her arms and raised her eyebrows. There is nothing wrong with a game, mother. You are a young lady now, not a child anymore. Miranda walked past Sarah and glared at her too. 
If your maid cannot behave as she should do, then I shall have to find a replacement for her. Sarah bobbed a curtsy, hanging her head. That will not be necessary. Elizabeth spoke up with passion and stood hurriedly. Her mother often attempted to interfere with such things, but Elizabeth had learned long ago that she could argue with her mother freely. It was simply about having the confidence to hold her ground. Sarah is a dear friend as well as my maid, and I will not have her sent away. Besides, I was the one who started the game. Sarah lifted her head enough to reveal a smile. Hmm. Miranda didn't look convinced, but clasped her hands together, the long fingers curling like claws. She moved toward Elizabeth, then adjusted a few loose hairs in her updo. It is imperative you act like a young lady now, Elizabeth. You have heard your father. He is so keen for you to make a match this season, you must consider marriage seriously and not think of it as one of your childish games. She cast a glance in Sarah's direction as she spoke. It is a game, if not a childish one, is it not? Elizabeth asked. And the prize for the winner is certainly not I, it is my dowry. I know that well enough. Elizabeth, Miranda raised a hand and pinched the bridge of her nose in frustration. Fear not, mother. I am not wishing to start an argument. I am merely speaking, practically. Elizabeth forced a smile, showing her mother she understood matters. You make things cheap when they are actually logical. Miranda walked around her, adjusting the bodice of Elizabeth's gown. When Elizabeth wriggled, she shared a humoured smile with Sarah, who stifled a laugh by turning away, covering her mouth and busying herself by tidying the chamber. Gentlemen marry ladies with good dowries, and ladies marry men of position who have enough money to provide for them. It is a marriage of two wealthy parties, there is nothing wrong in that, is there? Miranda asked as she came to stand in front of Elizabeth again. I suppose not, Elizabeth murmured. Good, I'm glad you agree. Miranda turned to walk to the door. I guess I was just wondering if love ever factors into marriage, mother. Her words made her mother stop in the doorway. Slowly she turned back to face Elizabeth, those brown eyes dark again. The plays I go to see in Wareham speak of love. It seems most poems that have ever been written speak of love too. I'm certain that when Shakespeare wrote, Shall I compare thee to a summer's day? He was thinking of love, and not comparing the lady's dowry to a hidden treasure. Your romantic notions. Miranda sighed heavily and leaned on the door frame. I love you dearly, Elizabeth, but I must admit it's time you grew up. Your naivety when it comes to such matters could give you a broken heart. Confused by the words, Elizabeth frowned. A broken heart? Just so. Miranda turned, ready to walk out again. Marry for friendship and position, my dear. That is the greatest assurance for the safety of anyone's heart. She smiled rather sadly. I shall be waiting downstairs for you when you are ready. As Miranda left and the door swung shut behind her, Elizabeth turned to Sarah with raised eyebrows. What exactly did she mean by that? I do not know. Sarah shrugged and stepped forward, offering the shawl that had fallen off Elizabeth when she had dropped down to the bed. Hurriedly, Elizabeth put the shawl back on, but found she could not smile now. My lady, I do not think it is naive to wish to fall in love. You do not? Elizabeth asked, pausing in her task. My mother seems to think it is. She has called me a fool three times already this week, and now naive too. That is because she does not have your heart. Sarah smiled. We're all entitled to our different attitudes to life. The way we live our days, our decisions, and even marriage. It is your choice, not your mother's, even though she wishes to control it. Elizabeth smiled sadly, fearing her parents had full control over her marriage. I believe love can be found anywhere, my lady. 
Sarah smiled and wistfully gazed into the distance as if she was thinking of someone. You shouldn't give up on it. You have so many potentially suitors, do you not? Potential suitors? Yes. But they might as well court a bank check rather than I. Elizabeth chewed her lip, knowing the way gentlemen's eyes lit up when they saw her. They do not really see me when they dance with me. They merely see the money. I am sure of it. Then you should wait for someone who dances with you and not with the money. Sarah took her shoulders and turned her to face the door. Now go. You never know who you might find there tonight at the ball. Maybe this man will be there that you find so handsome. Perhaps he will be. Elizabeth strode out of the room and glanced back just once, smiling with her thanks to her maid. Before she left, her eyes lingered on something else in the room. It was the vase full of yellow roses. Chapter 4 Sebastian This seems like a really bad idea, Sebastian muttered as he followed his cousin into Arabella's chamber. Shh, Catherine pleaded, waving her arm at him. We only have so long to do this before we're called downstairs to go to this assembly. We must act fast. What's the worst that could happen? We could be caught, Sebastian hissed as he closed the door behind them. Or, oops! As Catherine spun around, her elbow knocked a glass scent bottle on a table, topped with a silver stopper. Sebastian hurried to catch it, dropping to the floor and landing on his stomach with his hands outstretched. He barely caught it before it could smash. Or that could happen, he said, and scrambled to his knees, replacing the bottle on the table. You have been obsessed with these earrings for far too long. Wait, I don't think it was there. Sebastian fussed with the bottle, rearranging its position three different times. Was it like that, or like that? Oh, I don't know. Catherine grabbed his elbow and tugged him to his feet. It's fine, and I am not obsessed with these earrings. You tried to take them once when she took them off after dinner, Sebastian reminded her. That was years ago. I was only trying to borrow them. Catherine shrugged, clearly not seeing a problem with it. Come on, you wish for my help, don't you? Yes. Sebastian had to acknowledge inwardly that he didn't know what to do when it came to pursuing a lady for courtship. It wasn't something he'd ever considered before, and he feared being a bumbling idiot as he'd been with Elizabeth at the market. He'd bowed twice to her and stared for part of the time, not knowing what to say. Just be more careful, Sebastian pleaded. Try not to knock anything else. I shall be as quiet as a mouse and just as light-footed too. Catherine turned and tiptoed exaggeratedly across the chamber, moving around Arabella's vanity table and away from the bed. Sebastian followed her closely at first fearing Catherine would knock something else over. A quick glance toward the bed showed there was not just a pair of ladies' slippers by the bed, but a pair of man's slippers too. He chuckled to himself, realising that despite his parents maintaining the illusion of having separate bedchambers, they still spent most nights in one another's company. Oomph! Sebastian walked straight into the back of Catherine, for he hadn't been looking where he was going. Ow! Be more careful! Catherine waved an arm at him, and in doing so, knocked a tall vase from another table. Sebastian scrambled to catch it, this time grasping it to his stomach as he fumbled. The water from the vase splashed over his tailcoat and he frowned. Well, unless this dries, I'll have to change before the assembly. We need to hurry. Any minute she could realise we are no longer downstairs. Catherine moved to a second vanity table. On the surface was a wooden box. She lifted the lid, chewing her lip in hope. Oh, I thought it would be a jewellery box. Sebastian peered over his cousin's shoulder to see it was a box full of dried herbs. He smiled at the sight as the scents of lavender and rosemary filled the air. That's my mother. He took one of the dried sprigs of rosemary from the box. She always has herbs everywhere. For her healing? Yes. 
Sebastian placed the spring to his nose and inhaled. It was no secret in the family that Arabella was a skilled healer. She had nursed Sebastian through illnesses as a child and had done the same for Catherine too. After one or two sicknesses, Sebastian could remember, his Aunt Clara declaring there was no physician or doctor that was as skilled as Arabella. They lacked the knowledge of the natural world that Arabella had. It's a scent I always associate with my mother. Sebastian returned the sprig to the box with a smile and closed the lid. We shouldn't be invading her privacy like this. I'm not invading her privacy. Catherine rolled her eyes at him. I'm just borrowing the earrings. I shall return them, have no fear. She walked away and headed back to the first vanity table, clearly fearing she'd missed something. As she walked, she kicked up the rug behind her, plainly not noticing. Sebastian hurried to flatten it again and looked at the door. Maybe this truly was a bad idea. We should just prepare for the assembly. He wiped at the water droplets on his tailcoat. You are certain Elizabeth will be there? She will. Catherine nodded as she started opening drawers in the short table. Her father is eager for her to make a match, so she's being dragged to every event of the season at the moment. The words had Sebastian pausing. With her father so eager for her to make a match, it made Sebastian worry that he would not be enough to earn either Elizabeth's good opinion or her father's. What is the Baron wanting for his daughter, do you know? Sebastian asked, fidgeting with his tailcoat. You do not want to hear it. Catherine shook her head as she paused, reaching into one of the drawers. The last time Elizabeth and I had tea, he walked in, talking of what a match she would make. You should have seen poor Elizabeth, blushing a deep shade of red. For one who is usually so passionate in giving her own opinions unafraid, I worry that when it comes to her father she feels a great sense of duty. I see. Sebastian swallowed uneasily. A lady like Elizabeth should not marry for a sense of duty. She should marry for love, Catherine teased him. Well, let us hope Cupid struck her with an arrow that day in the market as he struck you. Hmm, Sebastian frowned, uncertain what to think or feel. If her father wants her to make an excellent match, then he may want someone different to myself. Why? Ooh! As Catherine bent down to look in a bottom drawer, she nearly toppled over the stool. She fell into it instead, making Sebastian steeple his hands in front of his face in fear. We shall break everything in this room before we find the earrings at this rate. Seb? Catherine sat straight. May I remind you that you are a Marquis and also heir to a dukedom? Why would her father reject you? I can think of a few reasons. For one, I am young, Sebastian reminded Catherine. How old were our fathers when they married? Catherine wrinkled her nose in response. Exactly. Quite a bit older than I. He sighed and sat down on another stool by the table. It may count against me. Secretly, there was something more that plagued his mind. It was his capacity to look like a fool in front of Elizabeth. He feared his nervousness would make him tongue-tied again, and he wouldn't know what to say to her. If he was going to know her better, to have the chance to charm her at all, as he was charmed by her, then he needed to find a way to feel more at ease. Yet I have no experience of charming. What's this? Aha, it is a jewellery box. Catherine placed a small wooden box on the table, then sighed with drama when she lifted the lid. The earrings are not here. Oh well, if she's wearing them. At Sebastian's words, they both abruptly laughed. God's wounds, do you think we are in here looking for something she has on? It's possible. She's always wearing them. Catherine returned the box to the drawer, then fiddled about. Wait, what's this? She pulled out a second box. This one was longer and thinner than the last. It was an old tramp box, plainly handmade and carved on all sides. 
Sebastian stood and moved to his cousin's side, the better to see the engravings. Each panel told a tale of Aesop's fables, and on one side the etching of a fox caught Sebastian's attention the most. The way the tail coiled around the body and the pointed snout bent down to the side made the fox appear cunning. The image bothered him for some reason, and he pulled to loosen his cravat. Catherine lifted the lid and peered inside. What is all this? She lifted out a myriad of papers and spread them on the vanity table. Sebastian bent forward and looked at the papers, noticing that they were all scandal sheets. And in each one there was an article that had either been highlighted or cut out and separated from the rest. His eyes darted across the various headlines. A local witch has ensnared men's senses with love potions. The witch is at work again. Bonadea, friend or foe to young ladies of Wareham. Who's Bonadea? Sebastian asked, lifting one of the articles from the table so he could read it. The article spoke at length about whispers of a local healer, or a woman who some believed to be a witch. She claimed to be able to help women, but the writer suspected she actually made love potions that could trick a man into falling in love. How absurd, Sebastian muttered. They call this woman, this Bonadea, a witch. Sebastian, look at this. Catherine lifted a book out of the box and proffered it to him. He pulled back the cover, prompting a bundle of letters to fall out. As Catherine sifted through the letters, he looked through the book, finding it was a sort of recipe volume. On each page, there was a healing recipe, or a tonic. He even found a cupcake recipe. In his mother's familiar handwriting, each one was accompanied by a small description of what the tonic was supposed to do to help the person who took it. Look at these. These are all from ladies asking for help. Catherine offered some of the letters to Sebastian. His eyes flicked from one to the next in a rush. Dear Bonadea, I'm in such need of help from a broken heart, and a friend of mine told me you were the one to write to who may be able to help. Bonadea, dear friend, you have helped me before, and now I have come to you again. I now ask for assistance for my daughter, whose confidence has suffered greatly as she has lost her love. One letter to the next revealed desperate appeals for help. Some letters were from ladies who were in need of healing tonics, suffering illnesses that the local doctor could not help them with. Yet there were other letters that spoke of troubles of the heart and soul, and the writers begged Bonadea for help. I do not understand, Sebastian whispered. Come on, Seb, can't you see it? Your mother, the healer, is someone else as well. Catherine took the book out of his hands and turned it over, peeling the back cover to reveal the last page in the volume. Imprinted in the middle of the page was Arabella's signature, only she hadn't written the name Arabella, but another, Bonadea. God's wounds. Sebastian stood and took stock of everything he was looking at. The legend of Bonadea wasn't something he'd heard of before, but looking at all these letters he saw at once that they were dated years before. She helped so many people. Clearly. Look at all these thank you notes. Catherine pointed toward more note cards in the bottom of the box. She was so good to people. Why did she not continue to do this? You haven't seen the scandal sheets? Sebastian pointed down at the stories in the scandal sheets. The more he looked, the more he understood what must have happened. My mother helped people up until these rumours of a witch being at work and love potions began. Pa, my mother would laugh at the idea of a love potion. She's a botanist, a woman of science, not magic. Yet the rumour was out. Catherine tapped one of the scandal sheets beside her that spoke rivetingly of a witch, urging everyone in Wareham to check their neighbour. Such gossip, such spread of mistrust. What a shame this had to end. It is. Sebastian froze as there was a sound in the corridor. Quick, we must put this back, he whispered in a low tone. I cannot tell my mother I have discovered her secret in this manner. 
Catherine hurried to return everything to the box. I still think it's a shame she has to keep such a thing a secret. She should be proud of all that she has done. Catherine managed to drop some of the letters. Catherine! Sebastian hurried to pick them up and thrust the letters into the box. He put it back in the drawer and hurried to close it. We agree. We do not talk of this to my mother, nor to anyone. Agreed. Catherine flinched when another sound followed in the corridor. Catherine? Sebastian? Where are you two? Daniel called, his voice distant in the house. We have to leave for the assembly now. We're coming! Catherine called back. Sebastian waved a hand at her. He might have heard where that came from. He grabbed his cousin's wrist and dragged her up from the stool toward the door. I didn't think of that. They hurried out of the door and onto the landing. Sebastian breathed a sigh of relief when they reached the staircase, undiscovered by anyone. Partway down the stairs he saw his mother and father together by the door. Arabella adjusted Daniel's cravat as the two smiled, leaning toward one another and talking in soft whispers. She holds on to such a secret. Sebastian couldn't help mirroring that smile as he looked at his parents, understanding that his father must have known. Suddenly it explains how the two came together. Perhaps my father was one of my mother's customers when she was Bonadea. Seb! Catherine gripped his arm tightly. Ow, what are you trying to do? Sebastian said and brushed his cousin off his arm. I've just had an idea, she whispered, glancing down to make sure Arabella and Daniel were so caught up in their own conversation they were not looking in hers and Sebastian's direction. What if the legend of Bonadea was to come back again? You're not making any sense. I was just wondering if it could be of use to us. I shall tell you more later. Catherine put upon an easy smile and walked down the stairs, eagerly catching up to her aunt and uncle, who praised how fine she looked as she reached them. Sebastian followed, but at a slower pace. What is Catherine thinking, I wonder? Chapter 5 Elizabeth Mama, please! If you introduce me to one more gentleman tonight, then you can guarantee I will not be able to remember his name, Elizabeth pleaded with her mother. Tush! Miranda took Elizabeth's hand and threaded it through the crook of her arm, then led her around the room, smiling simperingly at everyone she passed. There is Lord Fotheringham. Oh, what a gentleman he is. An earl, no less. We should introduce you. Mama! Elizabeth hissed, pulling sharply on her mother's arm so strongly that she nearly toppled her mother over. Miranda turned an accusing glare on her. He is at least twice my age. He is closer in age to you than to I. Don't be impertinent, Miranda said sharply. I am not being impertinent. I am using my eyes, Elizabeth said with spirit as she nodded at Lord Fotheringham. If you are to arrange my marriage for one of advantage, as you and father so wish to do, then at least assure me that you will not marry me to a man who, who, Elizabeth struggled for words, growing distracted as they watched Lord Fotheringham together. The gentleman busied himself with canapes from a tray, unaware he was being watched. He got most of the cream around his chin and on his fingers, then proceeded to wipe the cream on the shawl of an unsuspecting lady who walked past. Very well. Perhaps not Lord Fotheringham, Miranda said, and took Elizabeth's hand once again, steering her away. Thank you. Elizabeth sighed with some relief as they passed a server carrying a tray of wine glasses and eagerly reached for one, tipping it back to her lips. Her keen conversation with Sarah earlier that evening about love seemed a distance away now. Every gentleman she had met so far this evening had opened their conversation with an enthusiastic discussion either about his own title and position or an inquiry into her dowry. The lack of subtlety made Elizabeth lift that glass to her lips again. Careful, dear. You know what your father thinks if you drink too much. Miranda took the glass from Elizabeth's hands, leaving Elizabeth to totter on her feet, reaching toward it again. 
Gone is my momentary relief then. You're a lady now, Elizabeth, Miranda hissed under her breath. Well, it's hardly the act of a child to enjoy a glass of wine, is it? Elizabeth's words prompted Miranda to smile, though she bit her lip and tried to hide it. Ah, here comes your father. Goodness, look at the fine gentleman on his arm. Miranda preened and fluttered a fan in front of her face. Smile, Elizabeth, smile. Elizabeth forced a smile, but refrained from copying her mother with the ridiculous fluttering of a fan as her father arrived at their sides with a gentleman beside him. In the busy assembly room filled with candles, the man's face was basked in a soft orange light. May I introduce Lord Wetherington, her father declared with grandeur, his eyes wide as he practically stared at the man in awe. My lord, this is my wife, Baroness Grey, and my daughter, Lady Elizabeth Vaughan. How do you do? The gentleman bowed deeply. Such a grand evening we have here tonight. I understand you are much talked of, my lady. He stepped toward Elizabeth and whispered to her, almost playfully, Am I? She looked around, startled at the idea. The assembly rooms were so busy, she hadn't paid attention to the people looking her way before. She now saw gentlemen that preened like birds, adjusting the lapels of their tailcoats and fussing with their cravats, all sneaking glances her way. I wonder why. She looked at her father, seeing he flushed a pale shade of pink. Have you been speaking of me tonight, father? Only a little, Thomas Vaughan. Baron Grey said, with a wide smile, clearly proud of himself. Lord Wetherington is a successful businessman, Elizabeth, and now has a seat in the House of Lords. An impressive feat indeed, Elizabeth said, turning back to face the Lord with interest. Are you an eager MP, my Lord? Do you enact much change? Ha! That is not what Lords do, my Lady. He spoke with jollity. I beg your pardon? She reeled a little, reaching for the glass of wine that was in her mother's hands and longing to have it back. One enjoys the perks of that sort of position, he said with pride, tipping his chin higher. Naturally, a lord of my standing is searching for a lady to keep him company on his visits to London. Naturally, she said, her voice deep as she took the glass from her mother's hands. Miranda tried to hold it back but plainly couldn't do so without making a scene, so she soon relented. Well, I wish you luck in your search for a wife, my lord. Thank you. He bowed his head to her again, then turned to her father. What is your daughter's dowry, my lord? Elizabeth's lips parted in horror as she stared at him. They'd barely exchanged two sentences together, and already the man was sizing her up. I feel like a pig at a bacon market, she muttered to her mother. Miranda narrowed her eyes, warning her not to say any more. Let us talk more, my lord. Thomas led the gentleman away. What? Elizabeth stepped forward as Lord Wetherington and her father disappeared amongst the crowds. Surely father is not serious. Why were not? Miranda asked and tugged on Elizabeth's wrist. She was so distracted, starring after her father and Lord Wetherington, she did not really straight away just where her mother was dragging her. Lord Wetherington is a good option for marriage. Great standing indeed, and as he has a seat in the House of Lords, you can guarantee he moves in the circles of the greats. Imagine sitting down to dinner with the Prince Regent Elizabeth, what a thing that would be. I am not sure I have ever thought of meeting him. Elizabeth wrinkled her nose, remembering all the caricatures she'd seen in magazines. As far as she could make out, the Prince Regent was a drunkard and had lecherous wandering eyes. I have little wish to see him. Mother. Elizabeth paused, realising at last, just where her mother had dragged her. Why have you brought me back to the ballroom? Well, assemblies are for dancing, are they not? Swiftly and with tact, Miranda managed to snatch the wine glass out of Elizabeth's hand again. Step forward, 
look beautiful and in need of a dance. Short of waving my arms madly at gentlemen who pass by, I do not know how to accomplish such a thing, Elizabeth murmured. Tush, Elizabeth. Remember, you are a lady now. Yes. You remind me daily, Elizabeth said tiredly and sighed. This was not the evening she had hoped for, frustrated by the gentleman that looked at the dowry she carried, as if it were her shadow, rather than at who she was. Elizabeth looked around in search of another. There will perhaps be one here, tonight, who would be eager to talk to me. Her head flicked from side to side as she searched for his face. Who are you looking for, dear? Miranda asked. No one. Elizabeth lied and continued her search. By the great doorway on the far side of the assembly rooms, a family walked in, who were instantly recognisable to Elizabeth. The Duke and Duchess of Gordon led the way, with their niece and Elizabeth's friend Catherine walking behind them. Finally, the face that Elizabeth had been searching for so assiduously followed them. Sebastian. He was dressed handsomely in a rich dark green suit and an embroidered waistcoat with a subtle leaf pattern. His hair was a little wilder than most. Unaware he was being watched, he pushed a hand through the loose locks of his cinnamon hair, thrusting it back a little as he talked to his cousin at his side. Sebastian and Catherine laughed about something together, then looked away. Who are you looking at with such eagerness? Miranda asked restlessly, craning her neck like a heron to see where Elizabeth was looking. Nowhere. Despite her words, Elizabeth found it difficult to look away from Sebastian. There was an excitement there. It had been the same when she met him in the market the day before. Almost as if the years apart had been nothing at all and had passed in the blink of an eye. He was still the Sebastian she knew as a child, the happy soul the one that was always smiling, yet he was no longer a boy. He was a man. Sebastian turned and looked across the room. When their eyes met, Elizabeth flinched, as if a bolt of lightning had struck her across that space. Are you staring at Lord Wareham? Miranda inhaled sharply, as if Elizabeth had committed a great sin indeed. What's wrong with such a notion? Elizabeth asked turning to face her mother again. Pa! As if I need to point it out. Miranda lifted the glass she had taken off Elizabeth and downed its contents. Now who is drinking too much, Elizabeth said, earning raised eyebrows from her mother. Be careful, dear. Miranda stepped closer to her, lowering her voice. The Marquis of Wareham may be the heir to a dukedom. Something I thought you and father would have approved of very greatly. Elizabeth added tartly. The night before, she had listened to her father go on at length of how it was imperative Elizabeth made an impressive match. For some reason, Sebastian had cropped up more than once in her thoughts as she listened to her father. It would be an advantageous match and would surely please my parents. Though that was not why she had thought of him. She had eagerly thought of his laughter and the yellow roses he'd gifted her instead. He is too young. Miranda's sharp words made the thought of Sebastian disappear. Yes, he is a gentleman now, but such men of his age rarely marry indeed. They head off to the continent for grand tours or go to London and attend the season there. They do not stay home and marry childhood friends. Perhaps she is right. It struck her how worldly Sebastian was in comparison to her. He was young, had the world before him and was the heir to a dukedom. With so much before him, all the promise of adventure and excitement the world could offer, he would not stay home and marry someone he had known for years. Her heart rate slowed in her chest as she accepted her mother was right. I should not allow myself to think of Sebastian so much. Mama, Elizabeth hissed, looking around herself at the dance floor, fearful that some of the dancers may have overhead their conversation. I am being practical, Elizabeth, as you should be. If you have raised any thoughts at all to Lord Wareham, then think again. 
Miranda returned to her searching of the crowd. Now who else should you be thinking of? Elizabeth sought out Sebastian's face, but he had disappeared in the crowd now. What excitement she'd had, that kernel of hope, faded. She rather imagined the yellow roses he had given her would have lost their petals that night and drifted to the floor. As Sebastian disappeared, she thought how right her mother was. Perhaps Elizabeth held on to naive and romantic notions regarding Sebastian. He was a friend, and certainly kind to her, but not a serious prospect for marriage who would consider her. I must accept it. Who is this? I wonder. Miranda elbowed Elizabeth, earning her attention. Smile, dear. Remember that. Elizabeth performed her wooden smile once more as her father returned with a different gentleman beside him. May I introduce Lord Lysel, the son of a Viscount no less, Thomas said with clear delight as he gestured to the gentleman beside him. The gentleman bowed, then stood straight, his eyes finding Elizabeth straight away. She curtsied, rather shocked by the handsome face. He was unusually handsome, with a long chin, a narrow nose and indistinct cheekbones. But there was something in the richly dark brown eyes that was quite entrancing. It is a pleasure to meet you both, he said with charm, nodding his head in turn to both Elizabeth and her mother, yet his eyes quickly returned to Elizabeth. For the first time that night, she felt as if a gentleman wished to look at her, rather than discuss her dowry. I confess I'm delighted by this meeting, he continued with ease, a warm smile appearing on his lips. You are much talked of this evening, Lady Elizabeth. So I've heard, she said tiredly, darting her eyes to the crowd around them again. Ha! I see such news doesn't delight you, he whispered, almost mischievously as he stepped toward her. I was keen to meet you for myself. I am not one for all this talk of dowries and money. I see what their main topic of discussion is then, she pointed out as he continued to smile. Horrid, isn't it? he asked with a practical shudder. We meet one another in this room and the first thing so many think of is money. Not a world I am always a fan of myself. His words made her stiffen in surprise. Yes, I quite agree. She stared, waiting for him to go on. He has a handsome face, certainly one I could grow to be fond of. Intrigued by his words, she ignored the eager stares of her mother and father and cleared her throat, intending to talk to him without their intrusion. What world would you wish to see here, my lord, rather than this one? She stepped toward him a little. One where we meet and talk as equals, without this talk of money he explained in a low tone. When we meet strangers, we could ask the questions that really matter then. We could ask of likes and distastes, opinions on the world, even the meaning of life. Grand topics indeed, Elizabeth commented, so struck by his different conversation that she looked only at the gentleman's face and ignored everything else. Perhaps, but at least then we'd feel as if we were having a real conversation, rather than just going through the motions, he jested, leaning toward her and speaking conspiratorially, making the heavily styled dark brown hair around his ears dance. She laughed with him, deciding that perhaps her father had done her a good turn for a change. Is it possible my father has actually found a good man in this crowd? And what is your own opinion, my lady? he asked with interest, gesturing to her. Are you fond of this world? I think it rather stiff and formal. Gentlemen speak of dowries, and ladies flutter fans in front of their faces to try and get attention. At her side, her mother abruptly closed her fan. It's as if everyone is performing and has quite forgotten how to truly enjoy themselves. I agree wholeheartedly. In fact, what do you say to us deciding to enjoy ourselves now? He offered his hand to her. Would you dance, Lady Elizabeth? She glanced toward her parents, 
seeing them both nodding eagerly like clucking chickens. Well, maybe Lord Lyle is different from the crowd. I would be happy to, my lord. Chapter 6 Sebastian You must speak to her, you must, Catherine insisted, pulling on Sebastian's arm as they picked at the canapes. Sebastian was barely paying attention but staring across the room at the dance floor where he saw Elizabeth dancing with the son of a Viscount, Reuben Lyle. Elizabeth smiled sweetly as she danced with the gentleman, cutting a beautiful figure across the room. The more Sebastian watched, the more angered he grew, disappointed not to have yet danced with Elizabeth tonight. You know what they say, faint heart never won fair maiden, Catherine said, elbowing him to get his attention, just as cowering in a corner certainly never did. That is not what I am doing. I can hardly go and interrupt her whilst she is dancing with another gentleman, can I? Sebastian reminded his cousin. Then wait for her. You must say something to her about what you feel, Seb. What else could win a lady's heart other than a full declaration of love? Catherine said wistfully and clutched a hand to her heart. Is that what you hope for, cousin, someday? He whispered playfully. A gentleman to declare his heart to you? What woman would not? She rolled her eyes. You must do it. Catherine, at this point, I would be happy to simply spend more time with Elizabeth. I'm not prepared to drop to one knee and propose just yet, Sebastian hissed. You might have to, if what our parents say is true and her father is eager to see her married, Catherine reminded him. Look, she is leaving the dance floor now. Sebastian lost interest in the canapes and turned around, searching for Elizabeth across the room. She left the dance floor and Lord Lysel lifted her hand to his lips, kissing the back. Sebastian could not see her face as it happened, but he had the perfect view of Lord Lysel's. There is something in that look. Something I do not like. Hmm, what a strange way to look at a lady, Catherine observed at his side. Indeed, he concurred, as he continued to watch Elizabeth. Lord Lyle wandered off and another gentleman stepped toward Elizabeth, extending his hand. It seems you've missed your chance, cousin, Catherine said and returned her focus to the canapé's table. She dropped a small pastry in her clumsiness, then kicked it under the table so no one would see what she had done. Sebastian smiled at her action, though it didn't last long. The more he watched Elizabeth with the gentleman, the more he realised something was amiss. Elizabeth turned the gentleman down and stepped away, but plainly the gentleman did not take no for an answer. Instead, he followed her cut in front of her and thrust his hand forward again. Maybe I haven't missed it yet, Sebastian said as an idea occurred. He stepped away from his cousin and crossed the room, being careful to adjust his waistcoat and his tailcoat as he went, hoping everything was in place. He halted behind the gentleman that was trying to persuade Elizabeth to dance, listening to their conversation for a minute. Lord Wetherington, you are very kind. But as I said, I cannot dance now, Elizabeth insisted. Why ever not, the man pleaded. I, I have agreed to dance with another. The obvious lie was plain, so much so that Sebastian chewed the inside of his mouth to stop himself from smiling. Yes, that's right. May I see your dance card? Lord Wetherington was persistent as he tried to take the card from her wrist. What? No. Elizabeth pulled back her hand and tottered on her heels, looking dangerously close to tipping over in her eagerness to escape him. My dance partner will be along shortly. I'm here already. Sebastian stepped forward, moving around Lord Wetherington. He took Elizabeth's hand before she could fall over and held it safely in his own. Her eyes widened at him, and he winked, showing he understood her need to escape this gentleman. She smiled a little. Forgive me, Lord Wetherington, but I am the gentleman who has reserved the next dance with Lady Elizabeth. If you would excuse us. Lord Wetherington's lips parted and closed as he seemed ready to object, 
then he gave up. He bowed and parted quickly. The moment he was gone, Elizabeth squeezed Sebastian's hand. Oh my goodness, thank you. Thank you so much. A lady quite in distress, he whispered to her. Forgive my presumptuousness, but I could think of no other way to help you avoid him. No, no, you did the perfect thing, she assured him. The extent of her smile warmed him. It seemed he was not the only one affected by their close proximity to one another. Come, we must continue the illusion and dance together. She drew him toward the dance floor and he happily followed. This is where I have wanted to be all evening. As they bowed and curtsied to one another, surrounded by other dancers, the opening notes of a waltz began. Sebastian offered his hand to Elizabeth and drew her forward until she was practically in his embrace, with her hand on his shoulder and his on her waist. She blushed crimson, and the mere sight of it made his heart thud against his ribcage. There is something here. He led her into the dance, charmed by how easily she followed his movements. She was an excellent dancer. Perhaps she was not the most skilled, but her movements were always elegant, and she was a beauty to watch on the floor. I must thank you again, Elizabeth said after a minute had passed in silence between them. Sebastian shook himself, realising how intently he'd been staring at Elizabeth, yet he was not the only one. She had gazed back with equal intensity. There is no need to thank me. I did what any other man would have done to help you, and you know me by now, Elizabeth. He winked at her again. I could never see you afraid of anything. I remember a time when we were children together, when you saved me from when I fell in the river. She smiled at the memory, her dark eyes lighting up. Did I? Sebastian laughed, finding the memory returned suddenly. He and Elizabeth had been playing with Catherine and other children from the village along a river in the hot summer. You and Catherine went paddling with your skirts round your knees. That's right, Elizabeth nodded. I slipped and fell in. Then the current dragged me along. You jumped in and pulled me out again. Well, I thought you'd swam enough that day as it was, he jested, pulling a warm laugh from her. You see, this is why I have missed you. Her sudden confession had him slowing their movements. They no longer swept around the floor but moved from side to side in a much more intimate dance. You always did have a habit of making me smile, even when it felt like a hard thing to do. I'll always endeavour to make you smile, I promise you that, he said, his voice growing deeper without him thinking about it. She smiled once again. They continued to dance, and this time there was no conversation between them, only this intense gaze. When the music ended and they parted, Sebastian was breathless, bowing as he held on to her hand. She seemed equally affected, her chest rising and falling. How about a drink? he asked, eager to spend more time with her. Yes, I'd be glad of that. Her fingers tightened around his hand as he led her from the floor. Yes, this is what I wanted, a chance to spend more time with Elizabeth. Then two figures cut in front of them and brought them to a sharp stop. One was Baroness Grey and the other Lord Lysel, the gentleman that Elizabeth had danced with before. Lord Wareham, it is good to see you home again, Baroness Grey declared, though she was rather wooden in her delivery leading him to suspect she was saying the pleasantry out of duty rather than out of any genuine feeling. It is good to see you too, Lady Grey, he bowed to her. If you would excuse us, I must reclaim my daughter from you. There is a matter on which I'd like to speak to her about. Lady Grey took Elizabeth's other hand and drew her away. Come, Lady Elizabeth, Lord Lyle said. I must beg to reserve the next dance from you. For a second, Elizabeth looked at Sebastian alone. It gave him hope, even as she was pulled away with his heart thudding in his chest again. Then she turned away. Her eyes found Lord Lyle's, and she smiled, just as she had smiled with Sebastian. 
he was left feeling as cold as ice. Of course, Lord Lysel. Lord Wareham, we shall have to share that drink another time. I'd like that. Sebastian was frozen to the spot as Elizabeth walked away, not bothering to glance back at him as she took Lord Lysel's arm. Well? a voice asked in Sebastian's ear. He turned his head to the side, in time to see Catherine dropping one of the canapes that she balanced precariously in the palm of her hand. He caught it for her before it could drop to the floor. How was your dance? It was... something special, Sebastian said with a sigh. Yet I fear I am too late. What do you mean? Catherine asked, taking the canopy from him and popping it in her mouth. Have you not seen the gentleman who has taken her away? Lord Reuben Lyle. Handsome, is he not? Catherine said with a dreamlike quality in her eyes. That hardly helps. Sebastian sighed heavily. I fear Elizabeth has already been charmed by him, Catherine. Perhaps she will only ever see me as an old friend her blush as they had danced together, and the intensity of her gaze confused him. I do not know what to think any more. Leave it to me, I shall find out for you. Catherine thrust the rest of the canapes into his hands, then wiped the crumbs from her fingers and walked off into the crowd. Catherine. And a merry couple will be. Catherine whispered a tune to herself as she rounded the dance floor, watching Elizabeth from afar. She cast a quick glance back at her cousin and saw Sebastian drinking from a brandy glass, downing it rather quickly. She chuckled and looked away again, recognising the look in his eyes. Despite the promise Sebastian had made to help Catherine borrow her aunt's earrings, there was another reason that Catherine was so eager to help her cousin with his quest for love. Her closest friend in the world was Sebastian. There was not a heart that was kinder, nor a friend that had been more loyal than he. If anyone deserved happiness in this world, it was her cousin. I'll help you, Sebastian, even if it takes a little art and craftiness to get what you long for. Catherine waited until Elizabeth stepped off the dance floor and parted from Lord Lyle again. As Elizabeth wandered to the corner of the room, she tried to take a wine glass from a server, but was too slow and missed it. Catherine saw an opportunity and picked up two wine glasses from a table nearby, then approached her friend. Something tells me y you could do with this, Catherine said, and proffered the glass forward. You are a lifesaver, Elizabeth gushed as she took the glass and eagerly sipped. I am so thirsty after all this dancing. So I see. Catherine laughed and nodded at the floor. There has scarcely been a dance yet where you have not been dancing. It's all nonsense, really. Elizabeth waved a hand and turned her back to the dance floor. Nonsense? What do you mean? Catherine asked with eagerness to have an answer. I mean that I half wonder if sometimes gentlemen ask us ladies to dance because they feel it is what should be done rather than doing it out of any wish to truly dance with us. Elizabeth sighed loudly and looked to the ceiling as if pleading with the heavens above. Oh, if only there was a better sign of what was in a man's heart. I sense a secret is lurking. Catherine playfully threaded her arm through her friends and drew her deeper into the assembly rooms. Tell me what has you so concerned. Is it Lord Lyle? You seemed quite entranced with him just now. I did. Elizabeth stiffened, then chewed her lip, as if uncertain about the idea. I do not know, Catherine. I don't know what to think. How do you mean? Catherine asked, bringing them to a stop in the shadows of the room. I mean one handsome gentleman being charming is certainly enough to turn one's head, but who knows what is in a man's heart? Are they being charming because they like me too, or do they think merely of my dowry? Elizabeth leaned against the wall, encouraging Catherine to do the same. It seems my father has spread around this room exactly what the value of my dowry is. Imagine that. 
Is he hoping to sell you like the cows at a cattle market? Catherine asked, holding her hand to her lips with dramatic horror. Ha! It certainly seems like it, Elizabeth giggled and stepped closer to her, lowering her voice. May I confess something to you? Always. Catherine nudged her with her elbow, urging her on. I wish for love, Catherine, Elizabeth said, her smile of humour fading. She pressed her lips together and looked past Catherine's shoulder, straight into the wall with a frown. Something I suppose many think is impossible in this circle, when lots marry for advantage alone. Not impossible, surely. Perhaps unlikely. Catherine had to admit it was a possibility. More than once had she seen that her own parents, Horatio and Clara, were a match of love. But they'd commented on enough other marriages for Catherine to see not everyone was so fortunate. Love matches do happen, though. One must simply find it. Yet how can a woman be certain of the gentleman's intentions? Elizabeth asked, returning to chewing her lip. I wish I knew, Catherine. I truly do. Then perhaps there is something you could do. Catherine tapped her wine glass as an idea formed in her mind. It was absurd, really, a grand idea that would involve some deception and trickery. Yet if Elizabeth and Sebastian did find themselves in love afterward, what would it matter? It would be trickery, all in the name of a greater cause. Happiness. There was a part of Catherine that realised her plan was foolish, maybe even naive yet another part of her thought only of Sebastian and his happiness. He deserves this chance. I am certain of it. You know of a way? Elizabeth asked eagerly, stepping closer toward Catherine. I have heard something. Catherine looked around the room, wary of others overhearing them. She waited until a group of tittering ladies passed them by, then lowering her voice so only Elizabeth had a chance of hearing her. Have you heard of a woman they call Bonadea? Bonadea, Elizabeth repeated, then wrinkled her nose. No, never. It is a name I have only recently heard myself. Catherine took another sip from her wine, buying time as she formulated the full plan in her head. Who is she? Elizabeth asked, clearly impatient to learn more. She is a local healer. Catherine explained in a rush, yet she also has the reputation for helping women in other regards. Those that have had their hearts broken have gone to her for advice, just as those seeking love have gone to her too. Seeking love? Elizabeth's eyes widened. What does she do for them? That I do not know. Catherine shook her head. Yet I heard a whisper once that suggested Bonadea had helped a woman to learn the truth in her heart of who she loved, even when she was so confused that she could not see it for herself. That is what I need. Elizabeth leaned on the wall and dramatically sighed once again. Someone to advise me. I feel as if my mind is full of dark clouds these days. Then you must write to her. Catherine nodded, taking her friend's hand and squeezing it tight. I hear people write to Bonadea by leaving letters in an old oak tree by the river in Wareham. Where the river curves away from the bridge, you'll find an old oak there with a notch inside. Write to her and leave your letter there. Then pray. Tell me what she says. Lord knows we could all do with some advice when it comes to matters of the heart. I will. Goodness, Catherine. Thank you for this. Elizabeth squeezed her hand back. Elizabeth? Is that you? Baroness Grey appeared from the shadows. Catherine smiled as she released her friend's hand, but Lady Grey only returned a polite smile. Catherine had seen more than once in her friendship with Elizabeth that Lady Grey was no great admirer of hers. Lady Grey had commented a couple of times that Catherine needed to stop being so clumsy if she was to be a fine lady some day. Come, Elizabeth. There are other gentlemen you must meet tonight. Miranda held out her hand to Elizabeth, as if she was calling a dog to heal. I am being summoned, Elizabeth whispered with humour and walked away. I'll see you later. 
Enjoy your evening, Catherine called to her, then waited for her friend to leave. The moment she was gone, Catherine leaned on the wall again and tipped her wine glass back to her lips. At last it seems I have thought of a way to help Seb after all. Chapter 7 Sebastian What on earth is Catherine thinking? Sebastian muttered as he flicked the reins of the horse and rode madly away from the house. All morning he'd not stopped thinking of what Catherine had told him the night before. Her supposition to effectively bring back Bonadea from retirement was an outrage to him. My mother could never know of this. What would she say to know we had discovered her secret and then used it? Catherine had laughed at him and assured him he was thinking too much. Her plan would simply be a way to use Bonadea's name to open a line of communication to Elizabeth. Absurd, Sebastian muttered to himself again as he turned the horse across the open fields and rode in the direction of Elizabeth's house. He reached the top of such tall hills that he could not only see Wareham Town, with the church spire reaching up toward the clouds with the priory behind and the river that ran down toward the sea, but he could also glimpse the ocean itself on the horizon. The wispy white clouds gave way to rich blue hues of the sea. Elizabeth's house was close to the ocean, so he rode toward it, intent on seeing her. Sebastian intended to make himself plain that day. He would arrive at Elizabeth's house just as any other prospective suitor would do after an assembly and make his suit known. Then perhaps Elizabeth would see him for who he was and what he intended. Give me a chance, Elizabeth. That is all I ask. When the hills dropped away, Sebastian cut down into a valley, racing his black steed hard. He pulled up outside of the gates of Elizabeth's house to discover he was not the only one who had come to call. Dear God, he muttered, as the horse snorted beneath him as if in agreement. There was a line of carriages that led up the driveway toward the house, each one waiting their turn for their occupants to descend. Some gentlemen ran out of patience and left their carriages early, prompting irritation from their drivers who were left stranded and uncertain where to go now. There was a jam of carriages, with some cart drivers yelling at their neighbours, urging others to get out of the way. Are they all here to call on Elizabeth? Sebastian cut through the line of carriages easily on his horse and went straight to the stable, where the old stable master greeted him warmly, remembering him from years before. This is madness, Robert, Sebastian said with a deep laugh as he jumped down from the horse. What has caused all this mayhem? It seems Cupid was up to some mischievous last night, my lord, Robert explained with a deep rumbling laugh as he took the reins from Sebastian's grasp. He shot that many arrows at the men Elizabeth met. There is enough to fill this house. You go on in, my lord. I'm sure the mistress will be glad to see you. Thank you. Sebastian hurried off, moving around the angered carriage drivers as he headed to the door. Stepping inside, he stumbled to a stop, startled to see that the jam continued inside when it came to the gentleman. Baron Gray's opulent and grand hallway was full of gentlemen who queued up along one side. Many carried flowers, some preening their own bouquets, and some looking jealously at others, wishing they had the better bouquet. A small group of three gentlemen stood by the other end of the room, arguing with someone. Now, gentlemen, please, my daughter is a lady, after all. Baroness Grey's words rang out. One of the men stepped away, giving Sebastian the perfect view of Lady Grey. She stood tall and her small eyes darted over a sheet of paper in her hands. You must all be patient and wait your turn. My daughter is currently entertaining Lord Wetherington's company. The mention of that name made Sebastian's hands tighten into fists, remembering the way Lord Wetherington had tried to force Elizabeth into a dance last night after she had turned him down. Please, wait your turn. Lady Grey gestured to the wall where the three gentlemen returned, muttering between themselves. 
Sebastian's eyes darted along the queue, shocked at the breadth of gentlemen that had come to call on Elizabeth. There were some around Lord Lyle's age, all well-dressed and carrying bouquets, but there were a few others that were much older, some that Sebastian recognised as having already had one or two wives. There was one particular gentleman that was so old, he walked with a cane and a crooked back, his skin sagging off his cheeks. His name was Sabias, and Sebastian remembered well the stories that had circled about him. He'd had three wives in his life, all who had died young. Elizabeth will not be the next of his wives. Yet Lady Grey greeted Sabias as she greeted any of the other men, not discerning him as someone who was an ill match for her daughter. What is wrong with Lady Grey? Will she not even pick a gentleman that is well suited for Elizabeth? Lord Wareham, she declared in sudden surprise and walked toward him in the doorway. What a surprise to see you here today. Good day, my lady, Sebastian bowed deeply. I see I have called at a busy time. Very busy indeed, Lady Grey chuckled. It seems my daughter had quite an effect on many of the gentlemen at the assembly last night. Yes, I can see. He was discomfited, his eyes darting around the room restlessly. That or her dowry had the desired effect. Sebastian's eyes shot between the gentlemen's faces as he recognised more than one man that his father had spoken of in the past. Daniel had described them as men that put their wallets first before the people in their lives. I came to see Lady Elizabeth. Sebastian explained, shifting his focus back to Lady Grey. You have been a good friend to her all these years. Lady Grey smiled broadly. The mention of being a friend alone made Sebastian stiffen. She sees me as nothing more to her daughter. Yet I fear today is not the best time for friends. As you can see. Lady Grey giggled once more as if she were a young girl rather than a woman and gestured to all the men in the room. Elizabeth has other things on her mind besides that of friends. You will have to come for a visit soon. When, my lady? he asked eagerly. He hoped to declare that he wasn't just coming as a friend but as a suitor, yet she was already looking away from him, no longer interested in conversation and it made him hesitate. Oh, soon she declared non-committally and looked past him. If you would excuse me, Lord Wareham, a very important gentleman has arrived. She stepped around him. The suggestion that he was unimportant in comparison had Sebastian struggling for words. He stepped back, staring agog as none other than Lord Lysel strode into the room. He commanded attention with the firm strikes of his Hessian boots on the marble floor. Many of the men turned to look at Lord Lyle, then held their bouquets a little lower, clearly sensing, as Sebastian did, that Baroness Grey's favourite suitor for her daughter had arrived. Lord Lyle. Baroness Grey smiled simperingly and curtsied to such an extent that she was in danger of falling over. When she did indeed totter on her feet, Sebastian held out a hand and she grabbed it. Oh, thank you, Lord Wareham. Lord Lysel didn't appear to have noticed she was in danger of falling at all and looked past her toward a distant door. It is good to see you again, Lady Grey. May I be given the privilege of having an audience with your daughter? Lord Lysel shifted his focus back to the Baroness. I confess myself quite struck by her last night. How kind, Lady Grey said, taking her hand away from Sebastian and not giving him a second glance. This way, I'll take you to her at once. Many of the gentlemen stepped forward to object, but Lady Grey ignored them all and marched away, with Lord Lyle at her heel. Sebastian didn't miss the way Lord Lyle turned a victorious smile toward the other gentlemen, even if Lady Grey didn't see it. The door opened and she bustled Lord Lyle inside. He must have been greeted by the Baron, for a deep husky voice sounded for the few seconds that the door was open. Sebastian waited, watching as Lady Grey hurried back toward him, preening and straightening the creases in her gown. As you can see, she said hurriedly with a beaming smile, we are so busy today, and Elizabeth has many men she must meet. 
what a meeting this shall be with Lord Lysel, no less. Indeed, Sebastian muttered woodenly. Come back another day, my lord. She curtsied, clearly aware that he was a marquis, and she didn't wish to cause offence. Then she turned her back on him and walked away, as if his presence didn't matter to her at all. I wasn't even given the chance to see Elizabeth. Sebastian stared at the long line of waiting men before cursing under his breath. Even if he did wait in line with the rest, Elizabeth would simply see him as one of the crowd, and Lady Grey might even intervene before such a meeting could happen. I am a friend to this family only, it seems, he muttered angrily as he turned on his heel and left the house, hurrying down the front steps by taking them two at a time. Swiftly he avoided the arguing coach drivers on the drive and turned back to the stable. He was so busy cursing under his breath that he didn't notice as he stepped into the courtyard that there was someone in his way. Oomph! he exclaimed and jumped back just as a lady appeared before him. Sebastian! a familiar melodic voice said in surprise. Elizabeth! He caught her wrist, stopping her from falling down, then stood straight himself. She smiled at once, her eyes wide in equal shock to see him. He released her hand hurriedly, then laughed. Aren't you supposed to be in there? he asked, pointing at the house, with a ridiculously long line of gentlemen waiting to see you. Do not remind me. She pressed her hands to her temple and rubbed in circles, clearly suffering a headache. Goodness, am I glad to see you, my lord. She returned to his title no longer calling him by his Christian name, as she had done in her surprise when they had bumped into one another. His stomach tightened at the change. You are? You are a breath of fresh air amongst all this performance. She waved a hand back at the house. You will not believe how many hours I've been sitting in that room. Either I have been pushed to the piano where my father has demanded I sing and play for my visitor's pleasure, or I sit primly in a chair whilst my father and the suitor talk to one another about the value of my dowry. Is it not absurd? Very. Sebastian nodded, so struck by her sudden appearance in the stable courtyard that he was only now starting to recover and truly look at her. She was dressed beautifully, in a sage green gown that was cinched high on her waist and fell to the ground in soft pleats. Her golden hair was fastened at the back of her head in a sweet updo with only two curls that escaped by her cheeks. She was indeed beautiful. But what captivated him the most was the way she blew out her cheeks dramatically, pushed the curls away and smirked mischievously at him. You would have laughed, I'm sure of it. She stepped toward him, whispering conspiratorially. Some of the gentlemen are so eager to impress me that they sit there and recount all their successes and achievements in life. What achievements do they amount to? he asked in wonder, then tapped his chin in playful thought. Let me guess, today, dear Lady Elizabeth, I succeeded in getting into my carriage to come and see you. What a feat. At his jest, she fell about laughing. Or perhaps, my driver has succeeded in pulling me to your side. What exertion I have gone to in order to come and see you. I hope you are grateful for it. His mockery once again had her laughing. She placed her hands to her stomach and bent double. Oh, please, my stomach, you'll have to stop. Hard to stop when you laugh like that, he confessed, then glanced over his shoulder. Come, further into the courtyard if you wish to escape these gentlemen for a minute longer. He offered her his hand, startled when she took it, and such a jolt passed up his arm that his whole body flinched. He drew her further into the courtyard, away from the opening where she may have been glimpsed from the driveway. I am sorry you have to put up with such nonsense. At least there are moments of relief such as your humour. She turned to face him completely, such a smile on her lips that it gave him hope. When she looks at me like that, surely she must feel something of what I feel. What other explanation could there be for it? You have come to see me too? 
Heavens, my mother must have asked you to wait a long time if you're at the back of that long queue. She jerked a thumb toward the house. Ah, not quite. Sebastian sighed. Your mother thanked me for coming to see you as a friend, then promptly gave me my marching orders and dismissed me. She did. Elizabeth was outraged, her hands moving to her hips. That's ridiculous. I am glad you agree, Sebastian whispered. At least I have stolen a few minutes away with you far from her gaze. Elizabeth blushed and bowed her head forward a little, breaking their connected gaze. I fear she thinks my company is no good for you, Sebastian continued. Perhaps she believes old friends should remain old and in the past. Nonsense, ignore her, and promise you will always call on me, Elizabeth asked pleadingly, stepping forward in such a way that Sebastian's mouth turned dry. When she asked him in such a manner, he realised he would not have denied her anything. Of course I'll always come, his voice softened. They shared a smile, both staring at one another, before a horse snorted across the courtyard. Sebastian looked away, noting his horse was becoming restless with Robert who groomed him. Now my horse is playing chaperone, it seems. I am glad to have seen you for a few minutes today, Sebastian murmured, returning his focus to Elizabeth. At least it's something before you must see Lord Lyle. Lord Lysel, is he here? Elizabeth stood taller. Yes. Sebastian nodded. He arrived just now. He realised his mistake the moment the words were out of his mouth for Elizabeth stepped back. Then I must see him. At once. It was good to see you, my lord. Call again soon. She spun on her heel and left, hurrying into the house through a side door so fast that Sebastian didn't even have a chance to wish her a good day or say goodbye. Flummoxed, he stared after her, realising how foolish his hope had been to think she could look at him with any romantic notion at all when she practically sprinted off at the mention of Lord Reuben Lyle's name. Perhaps there is no hope at all. Chapter 8 Elizabeth Where in God's name have you been? Miranda's words made Elizabeth skid to a halt in a back hallway. Nowhere, Elizabeth lied then strode forward again, eager for her mother not to look back out of the window and see Sebastian in the stable courtyard. It is as if he is a forbidden connection for me now. Why would my mother not even let me see my friend? She was reminded of her mother's words the night before, of how Sebastian was too young to consider marriage, and she should not waste her time with him. The mere thought of Sebastian disappearing off to the continent and not returning for many years had Elizabeth wringing her hands together, finding they were strangely clammy. But Miranda looked to the window. Fearing Sebastian would be discovered, Elizabeth took her mother's arm and pulled her forward. I needed some fresh air, that is all, she assured her mother with a false smile. I am better now and ready to return to my suitors. Excellent. Lord Lysel is waiting for you. Miranda pushed her to the doorway by the parlour. Remember, stand up straight, smile, and be charming. Shall I perform a jig and make a fool of myself whilst I'm at it? Elizabeth teased, and tush now. Miranda didn't even laugh as she left through a different corridor. Sighing deeply, Elizabeth glanced over her shoulder, in the direction of the courtyard, thinking of the meeting she'd just had with Sebastian. There was something about him that was different to the other men she had met all morning. She was always at ease in his company. They were free with one another. And most of all, there was a spark in his conversation that had her constantly smiling. Then her thoughts returned to Lord Lysel and the handsome face that awaited her on the other side of the door. Oh, I do not know who to think of any more. She pushed open the door and stepped inside, finding Lord Lysel and her father waiting for her, laughing together about something. There you are, Elizabeth, her father declared with a smile, then glanced her way. His eyes subtly narrowed, showing her that he disapproved of her running off, but didn't want to reveal such a thing to Lord Lyle. Lord Lyle has been waiting to see you. 
Good day, my lord. Elizabeth bobbed a curtsy as Lord Lysel stood from a rococo settee and bowed to her. It is my pleasure to see you again. He crossed the room toward her and picked up something he'd laid down on the top of the piano nearby. Here, this is for you. They are beautiful, thank you. Elizabeth took the white lilies in her hand and raised them high to hide her temptation to wrinkle her nose. The funeral flower. It was what she always associated the lily as, made for funerals and mourning. But plainly, Lord Lyle did not know of their association to gift them to her. She couldn't help comparing them to the golden hues of the yellow roses that were given to her by Sebastian, and were still in her chamber upstairs flowering beautifully. You are very kind, Elizabeth said, and turned in the room to find Sarah was there, lurking in a corner, ready to be useful. Sarah took the flowers and whispered a promise to put them in water. Did you enjoy the assembly, my lady? Lord Lysel asked as Elizabeth took a seat. Far from returning to the Rococo settee closest to her father, he chose the seat beside her instead. Yes, very much, though all this attention I am received afterward is rather like being caught in a whirlwind, she said, waving at the door and thinking of all the men that were queuing up outside. Quite so. Lord Lysel didn't laugh at her jest, leaving her wrong-footed. She wriggled in her seat, staring at him and wondering who was supposed to make conversation and reach for a new subject now. She glanced at her father, who widened his eyes, silently telling her that she should be the one to speak. How is your family, my lord? she asked rather desperately, seeking for any new subject with franticness. They are well. Lord Lysel said no more, leaving her just as uncomfortable as before. Are they all at home, at present? She pushed him further. At last, Lord Lyle spoke more freely. He told her of his parents, who were indeed at home, and his younger siblings, some of whom were at university. As he spoke, a sharp realisation came into focus for Elizabeth. As handsome as Lord Lyle was, and as kind as he was toward her, there was something missing. There was a numbness around him that she couldn't quite put her finger on and there was a lack of excitement in his conversation. He's not at all like Sebastian. Sebastian walked into her thoughts again. She half imagined he was there in that room with her. If he sat behind Lord Lysel, he would have pulled a face or made some jest to lighten the air and make her laugh. What I would give for that jollity right now. She hadn't listened to a word Lord Lyle had said and soon realised what a difficulty it had put her in, for both her father and Lord Lyle stared at her, waiting for her to say something. Forgive me, my lord. I fear I lost myself in my own thoughts then. What did you say? she asked, aware out of the corner of her eye that she saw her father pinching the bridge of his nose in something akin to despair. Would you play for me, Lady Elizabeth? Lord Lyle gestured to the grand piano. I understand from your father there is none so skilled in the county as you. Did he say that? Elizabeth glowered at her father across the room. You should not believe everything my father says. He is kind and simply wishes to sing my praises when they are not deserved. You are modest, I am sure. Elizabeth could see that despite the fact she had played the piano all morning and was tired of it, she wasn't going to escape the matter now. Very well. She forced a smile and stood, moving towards the piano. To her amazement, Lord Lyle followed her and came to stand behind her. He selected the music for her. What of this piece? It is quite my favourite. He placed down a piece by Vivaldi, leaving her tongue tied. She wasn't sure which had irked her more, his presumption to choose what she should play, or the fact he had challenged her by choosing such a hard piece. Very well, you'll have to forgive my errors. It may sound at times like a frog is jumping across the keys. Once more she paused, waiting for him to laugh, but Lord Lysel didn't appear to understand the jest. He waved at the music and waited for her to begin. Slowly Elizabeth turned her attention to the piano and struck the notes, playing the piece with vigour. 
Lord Lysel stayed behind her the whole time and turned the pages when it was needed, moving so close that she was quite wrapped up in his scent. Any hope she'd had of being further entranced by him paled. His scent was off-putting to her and far too musty for her liking. When she finished, Lord Lyle applauded her warmly and was so bold as to sit on the stool beside her. You are very talented indeed, he said appraisingly. You are kind. She sighed, looking away from him, feeling more confused than ever before. She couldn't understand why a man this kind and so handsome did nothing for her. Her heart thudded at its normal rate, and her palms were only clammy from her playing. It had nothing to do with his proximity. I'd be glad to come and visit you again. If, of course, you would permit me to come, he asked, raising his dark eyebrows with clear hope. Well, I am looking for love, am I not? Perhaps love is no strike of lightning, but something that grows softly like a blooming flower in spring. I'd like that too, my lord. Will you continue to pace all night? Sarah called from the cupboard where she was struggling to put away all the gowns that Miranda had laid out across the bed that morning. Goodness when your mother wishes you to impress. She really will appraise every single dress in your cupboard. Yes, she's like that, Elizabeth said distractedly, still pacing up and down in her nightgown with a shawl over her shoulders. Ah! Sarah exclaimed, falling into the wardrobe. Sarah! Elizabeth hurried to her maid's help, pulling her out again. Thank goodness, Sarah said, disentangling herself from one persistent gown that had wrapped itself around her elbow. I thought I was to be drowned in chiffon. Ha! Elizabeth laughed warmly with her friend. But as Sarah returned to turning down the bed, Elizabeth paced once again. Will you tell me why you pace so much? Sarah asked. I am thinking, Elizabeth explained, I am thinking of Lord Lysel and of others too. Sebastian cropped up into her mind. In particular, she thought of the way he had come to her rescue the night before, offering her a dance when dancing with Lord Wetherington was the last thing in the world she had wanted to do. I do not know what to think of men, love or anything. Maybe my mother is right. She flung herself back on the bed, tiredly. Maybe I am too young to know what love is, for I do not know what it is I should be feeling. Perhaps you should do as your friend suggests. Sarah moved to the vanity table and opened a drawer, revealing a sheet of paper, a quill and a bottle of ink that she had plainly hidden there earlier. When Elizabeth had returned from the assembly the night before, she had told Sarah of the rumours about the healer known as Bonadea, and asked Sarah if she knew anything of the lady. All Sarah had said was that she'd heard of a local healer once, but that was some time ago, and she did not recognise the name. If this Bonadea is everything Lady Catherine says she is, then maybe she could offer you some advice. Sarah placed the quill down on the paper with the ink. I'll leave you to your own thoughts, my lady. Thank you. Elizabeth sat up, smiling at Sarah as she left. The moment the door was closed, Elizabeth's eyes rested on the paper and the quill. Could I do it? There seemed something mad and wild about the tale Catherine had told her, as if a child had come up with some grand fairy tale of a motherly witch that lived in a crooked cottage and liked to help people. I do not believe in fairy tales any more. Elizabeth muttered and stood moving back to the vanity table. Pushing away the made ideas in her mind, she reasoned that maybe there could be some truth in what Catherine believed. If there was even a woman out there who had some experience of love, then maybe that was enough for this woman to advise Elizabeth on what it was she should be searching for. Elizabeth picked up the quill, resolved to write a letter to Bonadea. Dear Bonadea, I realise I do not truly know if you exist, or if you are a mad idea invented by the ladies in the town, who all hope naively for someone to turn to. What I do know is that I am such a desperate lady. So, 
I am writing to you to take this chance, in the wild hope that you do exist and can help me. Bonadea, my mother and father are determined that I should marry. They think only of the connection I should be able to make, and little more. But I have always been an idealist at heart, something I am not afraid to own. Is it so foolish to hope to marry for love rather than advantage or connection? It is what I long for. Yet I have never been in love, and I do not know how to recognise a man who truly loves me, compared to one who is simply good at charming. I am inexperienced in this area, I know it. For fear of making a wrong decision, I beg of your advice. Is there a way to be certain of a man that truly cares for me and not my dowry? Or is it something that is simply left to my own judgment? Slowly I begin to see that I live in fear of the day I will wake up in a marriage to discover my husband has no interest in me at all and only ever wanted my dowry. I would be grateful for any advice you can give. Yours, etc., Elizabeth. She hesitated, wondering whether to sign her full name or not, but decided if any foolish lad found the letter in a tree, rather than this supposed Bonadea, then she did not want it to lead back to her. By using her Christian name alone, there were other Elizabeths in town with whom it could be confused. Sealing the letter up, she melted a stick of red wax in a candle and dripped it onto the back of the envelope. Rather than stamping her family seal, as she normally would have done, she left it blank, then lifted the letter and held it in the air, smiling at the ornate and excessively swirly way she had written Bonadea on the letter. I hope this works, Elizabeth whispered aloud. Chapter 9 Sebastian Seb! Seb! Where are you? Catherine's excited voice echoed across the garden. Sebastian crept out from the walled garden where he'd been walking, admiring the collection of herbs and flowers his mother had made over the years between these walls. Out of the corner of his eye, he saw Catherine arriving on her horse, her hair wild as it always was when she'd been riding. Coming to a hasty halt on her horse, she swung herself out of the saddle, so eager to be down that when she caught her foot in the stirrup, she fell face first. Catherine! Sebastian called and ran to her. He was not the only one to see. The stable master ran out to her aid and caught the reins of the horse before it could stumble away in surprise. Sebastian freed his cousin's foot from the stirrup, then reached down toward her. She rolled over on the ground, giggling loudly with her hands pressed to her stomach. Well, not everyone would react like that to falling off a horse, Sebastian said, joining in her laughter. I take it you are not hurt. Not in the slightest, she continued to laugh, struggling to speak. My father said, when I left this morning, I have a habit of riding so madly I am likely to fall. I arrogantly told him I have not fallen in months. Ha! Pride comes before a fall, as they say. Quite literally in this instance, Sebastian offered his hand to her. Ha! Indeed. Rather than giving him her hand so he could help her up, she thrust a letter into his grasp instead. It seems acting as Cupid's wings this morning is a dangerous affair. What do you mean? Read that, Seb. Catherine scrambled to stand as the stable master led her horse away. Distracted, Sebastian placed a hand on his cousin's arm, wanting to make sure she was well first. Are you sure you're well? My mother could take a look at you if anything hurts, he said, gesturing to the house. Your mother would place all sorts of richly scented salves on my skin, I do not doubt it. She laughed once more and waved off the idea as she adjusted her gown. Yet I need nothing. I will only have a few bruises and grazes. She held up her palms, then grimaced. It seemed she had broken the fall with her hands, and they were now covered in dotted white lines. Come, you're seeing my mother. Sebastian took one of those hands and attempted to drag her into the house. But Catherine pulled tightly and swung him back around. God's wounds, when did you get so strong for such a little thing? Have you not heard mighty things come in small packages? 
She pulled him in the other direction, back toward the walled garden he had come from. Come, you must read that letter. What is this? Sebastian asked, looking down at the letter in his grasp. He tried to discern the handwriting at first, then he read the words on the envelope and the top of the letter. Bonadea. Catherine, what is this? he hissed, pulling on her hand so they came harshly to a halt between the lavender and rosemary bushes. It seems Elizabeth was quite taken with the tale I told her. Catherine released him and clasped her hands together, adopting a wistful gaze. She's a romantic at heart, see? No one without a romantic heart would write to Bonadea in this way. Seb, you need to read it. It's fascinating what she asks. I cannot read a personal confession in this way. It's an invasion. Sebastian thrust the letter back into Catherine's hand, but she didn't catch it. The result was it drifting between them, dropping like a leaf in autumn. In the end, at risk of it falling on the ground, both of them attempted to catch it and ended up butting hands. This is your doing. Me? she asked innocently as she caught the letter. You opened it, Sebastian said, folding his arms. Yes. It is addressed to Bonadea. Yes, but Bonadea retired, did she not? Catherine asked, glancing at the clouds above them as if pleading for help from God to bear with Sebastian. His stomach tightened at the sight of Elizabeth's handwriting on the letter. He was both curious and fearful of betraying her privacy. The real Bonadea hung up her quill and recipe book long ago, hence why we found it tucked so far away. Now you must read this. I will not, Sebastian pushed Catherine's hand away again. Fine, as you wish. Catherine turned away and walked through the walled garden. So I hold the secret to capturing your lady love's heart in my hand, and you do not want to know it, do you? She fluttered the letter in front of her face, as if it was a fan. Catherine. Sebastian groaned aloud. Of course, he wanted a way to know what was in Elizabeth's heart, but this felt like a betrayal. Come off it, Seb, what's wrong? She asked, stopping on the other side of a row of lavender bushes. This is what you've been looking for. If she'd told you a confession herself, I could understand it. But she has written to Bonadea. She has been hoping to confide in someone she does not know, someone she hopes will keep her secrets. It feels wrong, Sebastian said simply, shaking his head. Can you not feel that? Ah, I see. Catherine looked down at the letter and fidgeted with it. If this was any great confession of something incredibly private, I could understand your reticence. As it is, I can tell you categorically that there is nothing so private in here that you should be concerned. She stepped over the bushes, getting the hem of her gown caught on the twigs. She tugged hard to release herself. Yet this letter is a window into what Elizabeth wants. She is asking for advice, not revealing some great secret. Trust me, Seb, you should read it. She held the letter out in front of him. Tempted, Sebastian's eyes darted to the letter. As much as an invasion as it was, his heart ached at the thought Elizabeth had written a letter to Bonadea. She hoped for help with something in her life, and the truth was that the real Bonadea was never going to write back. The only people who could write back were Sebastian and Catherine. Slowly, he took the letter from his cousin's grasp pinching the very corner between his forefinger and thumb, as if that was somehow better. She giggled and clapped her hands together excitedly. He tutted at her in mock disapproval, then looked down at the letter and read it. At Elizabeth's heartfelt words, feeling lost and wanting to know what was truly in a man's heart, Sebastian felt weak. He sat down on a bench in the corner of the walled garden and leaned forward, resting his elbows on his knees as he clutched at her letter. Poor Elizabeth, he said softly, as his cousin picked some of the lavender leaves and brushed them between her fingers, 
making the scent leap into the air. She feels like a pawn in this marriage game, does she not? Precisely, Catherine said, wrinkling her nose as she pressed the leaves too close to her nose. You should write back to her as Bonadea. You and I can invent a way for her to discover her true love. Then lo and behold, that path will lead straight to you. Catherine, Sebastian said rather too loudly. What? She offered an innocent look and reached for the chamomile bushes and picked up the drying flowers, pressing them between her fingers as she had done with the lavender. You do not think that is deception? Replying to her is one thing, but advising her to do something that would lead her straight to me. He broke off, feeling a tightening in his chest. He shook his head. I will not trick her so. How is it tricking her? Catherine asked with sudden fervour and seriousness, dropping all the leaves and flowers she had picked. Remind me, who is it you love, Seb? Elizabeth. He didn't need to say it aloud, to know it was the truth. He may have suspected when he saw her again in the market after so many years that he could fall in love with her, so struck as he was. But their last couple of meetings had proved something to him. I do love her. I care for her more than any other woman I have ever known. You do not need to answer for me to know it, Catherine remarked smartly. So, this deception, as you call it, would not really be a deception of any kind, would it? All we'd be doing is helping Elizabeth to see the truth, that you care for her. When Catherine said such a thing, it all seemed so simple. There seemed to be no trickery involved at all, no deceit. Yes, I take your point. He sighed heavily and folded up the letter, hiding it in the breast pocket of his tailcoat. It would hardly be a malicious thing to do, would it? Catherine asked, rolling her eyes as she walked across the garden and joined him on the bench, plopping down heavily. No, he agreed, his voice deep and quiet. Marriage in the ton is all a game anyway, as Elizabeth says here, and as you have just described, by calling her a pawn in her father's games. Catherine continued on, and Sebastian was hooked on her words now, listening attentively. If you are to succeed in this game, then what is the harm in toying with it a bit? It's no different to choosing what order you play your cards in a card game. Is it not? I think I'd call it stacking the deck. Cheating, Catherine. Then cheat. At least that way you'd win at this game, she said with a giggle. You do it all for the right reasons. She laid an arm across his shoulders. When she is surrounded by gentlemen callers, as you have described, you must stand out as a man who does care for her, must you not? Why do I feel like a little devil is on my shoulder, whispering in my ear? Sebastian playfully narrowed his eyes at his cousin. Little me, a devil? Pah! She laughed raucously and tipped her head back. You flatter me, but you cannot seriously think this is a cruel thing to do, can you? It's a white lie, Sebastian. It is hardly the deception or con of the century, is it? She stood and walked away, humming a tune to herself and returning to the bushes that she plucked the leaves from. Sebastian didn't answer for a while but took out Elizabeth's letter again and read the contents. There was something in Elizabeth's words that made him ache. She was desperate for help, and the thought that the real Bona Dea would not reply to her made him hurt all the more. She deserves an answer to her letter, Sebastian said slowly, that she does. Catherine nodded from her place by the bushes. She knelt down and plucked the leaves from a thyme bush, then wrinkled her nose so far that her entire brow crinkled. I do not have to push her so entirely toward choosing me, but advise her to do something that may just make her notice me a little more. So that she could see what she means to me, that I care for her, Sebastian said, talking himself around. Exactly, Catherine declared with vigour, pressing the thyme leaves between her fingers. Something tells me you now think it a good idea, cousin. I didn't say that. 
Sebastian folded up the letter again, his eyes on his cousin. She hummed and plucked leaves from a bush he didn't recognise. Sometimes you are inventive, more so than I give you credit for. Inventive? Is that praise? she asked, waggling her eyebrows. Or censure? Neither. More suspicious, he said, playfully frowning at her again. You make me wonder what you will do if you ever find a man you care about. You suspect me of more art than I am capable of. She was a couple of years younger than him, and that immaturity was plain in the way she shook her head and hung it forward for a minute. The smallest of blushes coloured her cheeks, something that was rare for her and was testament to what was going on in her heart. In truth, Seb, I have not had my head turned by any gentleman. Not yet, he said simply. Yet, if I am ever so fortunate to experience such a thing, I certainly would realise that love is not something that comes along every day. She looked up from the leaves she was toying with. So many people we walk past in this world day to day, and we disregard them as potential love matches. At balls, we're persuaded to dance with anyone remotely eligible, in the hope that we will discover someone to love. Pah, love is rare. It is not nearly as easy to find as Shakespeare or any other great poet would have us think of. You are a romantic, Catherine, Sebastian observed. On the contrary, she sat taller. I see myself as a realist. It is because I am a realist that I do not think you should waste this opportunity to show your lady love what it is that you feel. She smiled and stood straight. So, I ask you, Seb, what are you going to do? Are you going to leave poor Elizabeth's letter unanswered, so that she is doomed to wonder for a long time yet if there is a man out there that truly loves her? Or will you answer her and give her hope of the dreams she has of being fulfilled? Sebastian paused before answering. He folded up Elizabeth's letter once more, returning it to his pocket. Then he stood and walked across the garden, moving to his cousin. I will reply to her, he said eventually, his voice just a whisper. Wonderful, Catherine declared, clasping her hands together. Though you better watch over my shoulder as I write this letter. Goodness knows how one sounds like a woman when they write a letter. Do you think we sound so different in letters? Foolish man. She stepped around the bushes and took his arm. Fear not. I shall help you as much as I can. I will be your adviser, your own Bonadea. Ha, you, the wise one, he spluttered with laughter as she pulled him through the garden and headed to the house. You do not need to laugh so loudly at that idea. Chapter 10 Elizabeth Surely this is mad. Elizabeth paced up and down in front of the oak tree. The sun was strong today and she pulled her bonnet close around her ears, trying to hide from its strong rays. That morning her mother had urged her not to go for a walk to town, fearing burn. Yet Elizabeth had been determined, and came with Sarah, who currently kept guard on the village bridge, keeping an eye out for anyone else walking by. I have to see if she has answered. If there is no letter here, then I know it is a foolish idea of some naive ladies. Oh, I have to try, she muttered to herself, and glanced up and down the river, one last time. She could see no one, except for Sarah on the bridge, who craned her neck back and forth, looking for anyone who could disturb her. Reaching toward the oak tree, Elizabeth stood on her toes and delved a hand into the open knot of the trunk. At first, her fingers found nothing but bark. When she found something furry that wriggled, she yelped and jumped back. A large spider wriggled out of the trunk. Ah, God's mercy, she murmured to herself waiting until the spider ran away before she tried again. Reaching inside, she grappled about, then found a letter, its pages crisp. She grasped it tight and pulled it free of the tree. 
noting in an elegant hand her Christian name was written across the surface. Elizabeth. Glancing over her shoulder, to check no one else had approached, she tore open the letter and hurried to read its contents. Dear Elizabeth, thank you for your letter. It saddens me to see this is not a unique fear among young women. Many fear that they may someday be forced into marriages that they do not want, but it is not mad to want to marry a man you care for, someone you can love. If there is one piece of advice I can give you for the best, it would be this. Do not give your heart and faithfulness to a man unless you are certain of his own heart and his loyalty to you. There are many men in this world who can charm and make a beautiful girl feel special when they really are after her money alone. So I urge you, do not give your promises to any man until you are certain of a return of your affection. There is a way to reveal a good match in this world. It is an old wives' tale, something that for a long time I will admit seemed preposterous to my own ears, but having witnessed it again and again, I can now say for certain that it works. I have enclosed a recipe for cupcakes. It's a charming recipe for cakes, but also has a special power that I pray you will believe and not dismiss as preposterous. It holds no love spell inside it, no trickery, no chemical that can deceive the mind. But there is something altogether more mystical in its power. Make this recipe exactly according to these instructions, and the man that loves you will confess his affection for you after taking a single bite. I pray you will try it. I only wish to help you see what man could be out there for you. Your friend, Bonadea. Elizabeth put down the letter, breathless for a second. Suddenly, the idea that the cupcake recipe could be preposterous didn't matter to her. Bonadea existed. If this lady was truly out there, then it was possible that the old wives' tale she spoke of could also be true. There was something in the advice that she had given as well that captured Elizabeth's heart. She's right, Elizabeth whispered, hurrying down the river. I should not give my heart away easily. I need to be certain first. Sarah, she called to her maid as she got close to the bridge. Sarah turned to greet her and read the letter that Elizabeth thrusted into her hands. They wandered back through the town together, poring over the letter arm in arm. What do you think? Elizabeth asked, eager for an answer. Curious indeed, Sarah whispered. Well, the lady speaks good advice, sound words, and clearly has experience of love, but I'm not certain about this cupcake thing. Elizabeth's gut twisted, nervous that perhaps she was falling for a complete lie. Why would Bonadea fabricate such a thing? she asked, lowering her voice as they entered the market in the town square, nervous about anyone overhearing her. She wouldn't. That's just it. She has no motive to make something up of this ilk. No, it must be true. Sarah spoke with vigour and passed the letter back into Elizabeth's hands. At the very least, it is only cupcakes. What is the harm in making cupcakes? Yes, I suppose you're right. Elizabeth was nervous now, nevertheless. She toyed with the letter in her hands as they walked through the market, fearing her own gullibility. Every few seconds she seemed to veer back and forth, between wanting to believe it and throwing everything at this cupcake idea, and debating tossing the recipe away and calling it utter nonsense. I don't know any more, Sarah, she said with a heavy sigh as they stopped by a stall, and Sarah picked out a loaf of bread for them to take home. Maybe my own foolish heart makes me hope for things that are not true. So your flaw is optimism? Not a bad flaw to have, is it? Sarah laughed at the idea. As I said, my lady, it is only making cupcakes. Where is the harm in that? And if it works? Elizabeth trailed off, chewing her lip as she thought hard about the gentleman that would eat her cakes. There was Lord Lyle, who seemed extremely attentive and was clearly one of her parents' favourites for a suitor. He is certainly handsome. He could be a man to consider. There was Lord Wetherington too, but the thought of him confessing a sudden love for Elizabeth made her laugh under her breath, suspecting he loved money more than any other person in this world. As Sarah put the loaf of bread in a basket, 
distracted as she talked to the seller. Elizabeth thought of another. The image of him struck strongly across her mind, the image bold. She thought of Sebastian eating one of the cupcakes. She could picture him now with his usual laugh and winking at her as he said some mischievous jest only for her to hear. Well, maybe there is no harm, Elizabeth whispered to herself with sudden excitement taking over. What was that, my lady? Sarah asked, turning to face her. Nothing I was simply thinking of, oh Lord Lysel. Elizabeth broke off as a gentleman walked up to her in the market. He'd appeared suddenly from behind another of the stall, with a bag of red apples in his hand. He bowed hurriedly to her, a great smile on his lips. So startled by his appearance, Elizabeth found it difficult to shake her mind from her previous thoughts. She imagined Sebastian was in the market again rather than Lord Lyle. She saw him with the yellow roses he had gifted to her, their fingers brushing on the bouquet as he passed them to her. What is wrong with me? There is already a handsome man before me. Lord Lysel, how good to see you. She curtsied hurriedly to him. Lady Elizabeth, what a pleasure this is. He bowed with a great smile on his lips. This is... Elizabeth turned to introduce her maid, but with her moving hand he snatched it from the air. Oh, goodness, she murmured as he raised it to his lips. Forgive my boldness, he whispered to her, stepping forward. I've been eager to see you again since our meeting at your house. He kissed the back of her hand. Some excitement filled her, but it wasn't as great as she thought it would be. Uncertain what to think or feel, she paid attention to her body's reaction. She was sweating a little and gazing at him openly. She put down the clamminess of her palm to excitement rather than nerves. Maybe Lord Lyle could be something more to me. Thank you, she retrieved her hand. You are very kind. You have come shopping, my lord. I always enjoy a wander through Wareham Market. It's striking, with everyone from all walks of life here. He smiled and gestured to the market. Elizabeth turned once more, ready to introduce Sarah, though her maid hung her head and stepped back a little, clearly not expecting such an introduction. Speaking of walks of life, do you not find it a wonder, Lady Elizabeth? he asked, and offered his arm to her, quite turning his back on Sarah. Slowly Elizabeth took his arm, startled by what he was doing. He escorted her through the market, his charming smile in place as Sarah followed behind as a chaperone. She was quite taken by that charming smile. He was indeed a handsome man. The market, she said distractedly. I always enjoy it. Does he think himself above Sarah, so much so that he will not talk to her? Or is he just distracted by talking to me? A little thrill passed through her, thinking that he was just taken up by her company. She glanced repeatedly back at her maid who waved a hand at her, urging her on. Would you care for one, my lady? Lord Lysel offered up the bag of apples in his grasp. They are grown locally in an orchard just outside of Wareham. What delicious apples they are. No, but thank you for the offer, she said. They walked on in a minute's silence and she struggled, racking her brains for some conversation. Perhaps conversation did not flow between them yet, but that could have been down to them not knowing one another well. Lord Lysel was attentive, kind and handsome, everything she had been hoping for. She decided she just needed to try more. Alighting on another stall, an idea blossomed before her. Ah, the flower stall, my favourite, my lord. Of course, what finer stall is there? he said with a chuckle. She released his arm and moved to the stall, reaching for the yellow roses at once. She lifted a single bloom to her lips and inhaled the scent. The soft rose scent lingering under her nose conjured the image of Sebastian once again. Why can I not stop thinking about him? No, my lady, you do not want one of those. Lord Lysel took the rose from her. Do I not? she asked. 
startled as the rose was taken away and returned to a bucket before her. Now these are the ones you want. He reached for another bucket full of flowers and picked up red roses. The flower of love, are they not? Or lust, Elizabeth muttered quietly. What was that? he asked, clearly not having heard her. Nothing. She lied and pressed the rose to her nose. She should have been delighted by the rose, she knew that, yet her eyes lingered on the yellow roses instead. They were golden like the sun, as opposed to the rich crimson petals of the rose in her grasp. There is something I am not certain of about red roses. Do you not think they are the colour of the devil, my lord? Ha! Ah, what a thought that is. Lord Lysel laughed deeply and handed over some money for the red roses before she could say any more. Her lips parted in wonder and disappointment at his choice, though she knew she should be thankful for his gift. Red roses are a declaration of something that is quite intimate, my lady, he whispered in her ear and walked around her. Captured by his words, her eyes followed him. Intimate? He said intimate. Now she looked at the red roses in a new light. He saw them as a declaration of intimacy. Her fingers ran over the petals with some excitement as she persuaded herself to like them. It was possible she was being blinded. All this favouritism of yellow roses and the difficulty and awkwardness in his conversation could be a distraction. Here was a man who clearly liked her, enough to buy her red roses. The more he smiled at her, the more captivated she was by his charm too. I should pay much more attention to him than I have done. Perhaps Lord Lysel is the man I seek, and I am so much a fool that I have not given him my full attention. He offered his arm to her, again, and she took it, holding the red roses as they walked together through the market, with Sarah following behind. Now she pressed the roses to her nose readily, inhaling their scent. Thank you. It is a kind gift, she said softly, holding the flowers down by her chest. It is the least I can do. Now it is my greatest sadness I must part from you, for I have business to attend to. In the middle of the market he released her and bowed. I hope we shall see one another soon, my lady. He smiled softly, then lifted one of the apples from his bag and took a bite. There was something in the bite that captivated Elizabeth. It was the movement of his lips, almost something sensual that had her heart racing. Oh, I was not expecting that feeling. They shared another smile before he walked off through the market. He glanced back at her more than once. My lady, Sarah said, moving to her side. Are you well? You're quite stuck to a single spot in this cobbled square. Yes, I am staring. Sighing heavily, Elizabeth looked between the roses and the retreating figure of Lord Lyle. I cannot help but think those apples were a sign. A sign of what? Sarah asked, wrinkling her nose. About the letter, Elizabeth whispered, turning to her friend. I shall try this cupcake recipe. Lord Lysel has been so attentive. If he says anything after eating these cakes, then I will know for certain. There will be no doubt about it then. It seems you have a plan, Sarah said approvingly and offered to take the roses from her. Elizabeth quite gladly handed over the roses, still uncertain about the colour. Let us go home, Sarah. I shall have to find a way to make these cakes. I have not done any baking before so I fear I shall be dreadful. They walked back through the market, heading toward the other end of the square. As they passed the stall with the flowers, Elizabeth's gaze lingered on the yellow roses. She thought of stopping and buying herself one of the sprigs, but refrained and reached back for one of the red roses and took it from Sarah's grasp. You like them after all? Sarah asked softly. I cannot decide yet, Elizabeth said with honesty. She pressed the rose to her nose, inhaling the scent and turned away from the yellow rose. 
There was something to be said about the red rose, despite her earlier reticence. There was a beauty to them, and something almost mysterious. Maybe my mother and father are right. I should consider Lord Lysel as a serious suitor. Chapter 11 Elizabeth Elizabeth, what are you doing here? Catherine called, licking some cream from her fingers as she stood from the table where tea was set out by an open window. This is a lovely surprise. You find me all a sticky mess with cakes. Elizabeth hurried across the room, eager to see her friend. Well, you look as if you're enjoying yourself, she laughed and sat down in the seat gestured to by her friend. Come, you must join me in this mess, or I fear I will eat all these cakes myself. Catherine pushed some ice buns forward. My mother is such a good baker, so you must try these. The misshapen ones are my own attempt, though she says I will get better. Realising that Catherine was an experienced baker, well, at least had more experience than Elizabeth, she sat taller, knowing now that she had chosen the right person to come to and confide in. She glanced around the front parlour of Baron Aldington's house, checking that no one was nearby, before she reached into her reticule and pulled out her letter from Bonadea. What's this? Catherine said, taking a final bite of an iced bun and wiping her fingers on a napkin before she took the letter. I have come to thank you for telling me of Bonadea, Elizabeth said excitedly in a rushed whisper. I wrote to her for advice, and this is her reply. Quick, you must read it. I'd be glad to hear your thoughts. How fascinating! Catherine opened the letter and read it. By the time she had finished, Elizabeth had only just poured out her tea and put a cake on her plate. She'd not yet lifted her cake to her lips before Catherine put the letter down. This is wondrous. You read fast, Elizabeth observed. I am used to reading. Catherine laughed off the idea with a chuckle. I am a keen reader, indeed. She pushed the letter back toward Elizabeth. I am so sorry to hear you're so worried about the future and who you will marry. But this is good news, is it not? She asked eagerly. At least now you have a way to discover if a gentleman out there truly loves you. Indeed I do. Elizabeth sighed and sat back in the chair, overwhelmed by the possibility that these cakes might just work. You think it a good idea then? I think it an excellent one. Catherine smiled widely. Believe me, if I had any plans to marry any time soon, I would be stealing the recipe from you, she said playfully, and Elizabeth laughed with her. That is one of the reasons I have come to you. I am afraid I am a shocking baker. How so? Catherine asked, pausing with her cake. Well, I have never baked before. My mother is always so keen for me to be a lady that she has never let me in the kitchen. She is fond of the rules of propriety. Then last night, after receiving this letter, I went into our kitchens and watched our cooks work. Just being in there, I managed to knock over two bowls and ruin our dinner. Elizabeth sighed heavily. Oh, well, if these cakes don't work and I am the reason for them failing. You need someone with skill then, Catherine said with a giggle, then gestured toward the iced buns. Miss Happen Cake? It is not that bad. You simply want to believe you have come to the right person for help, Catherine said quietly. It is a good job I ate one before you arrived, for it looked rather rude. Did it? How so? Elizabeth asked, leaning forward and looking at the remainder of the buns. Pa, I shall not be saying exactly what it did look like. Catherine laughed loudly. Especially not now that someone else is here to overhear me. Seb, you have crept up on us today. Seb, Sebastian. Elizabeth whipped around in her seat so fast that she knocked her cake fork off her plate. Sebastian stood beside her and reached out a hand to grab it. He caught it in the air and returned it to the table. Thank you, Elizabeth managed then found herself tongue-tied as she stared up at Sebastian. 
She had thought of him so often as of late. She did not know what to say to him now. Surely it was not wise for her thoughts to dwell on him as much as they did, especially at night. When going to bed the night before, she had attempted to think of Lord Lyle, yet every time she closed her eyes she thought of Sebastian instead. He is too young to marry. My mother said as much. He will surely not be interested in marrying me. What have I walked in on then? Sebastian asked, resting a hand on the back of Elizabeth's chair as he stood at ease looking at the table. What cakes are you speaking of? Elizabeth reached across the table and snatched up the letter she had shown to Catherine, moving as swiftly as she could. The mere thought that Sebastian of all people might see such a letter had her blushing bright red, so strongly so that she could feel the heat as it emanated off her cheeks. My cakes, Catherine said simply, sitting forward and placing her elbow across the table as she expertly hid Elizabeth's hurried retrieval of the letter. Thank goodness for you, Catherine. They are misshapen once again, Catherine said with a heavy sigh. The burden of being only a half-talented baker, unlike my mother. I see what you mean. Sebastian peered over Elizabeth's shoulder, down at the cake on her plate. When he came so close, so she could practically feel him near her ear, she held her breath, startled at the prickling sensation that erupted across her skin. Only when he leaned back again did she see the goosebump spreading fast over her arms. How did he do that? Catherine, you should practice more. You'll make people talk with these. Sebastian said, a mischievous smile on his face. They are not that bad. I ate the worst one before you got here. Catherine stood hurriedly. Where are you going? Elizabeth asked with sudden nervousness. She had never worried about being alone with Sebastian before, but now she felt an abrupt anticipation and the hairs on the back of her neck rose up. I shall go to my mother and ask if we can use her kitchen in three days' time. You and I can, um, do some baking together, Catherine said hurriedly, pointedly avoiding her cousin's gaze. That way these cakes you wish to make can be completed before the garden party here. What do you say? That's perfect. Thank you. Elizabeth smiled at her friend, touched by her kindness. Catherine stepped away, then waved a hand in front of her cousin. Don't eat all the cakes, Seb. I can't eat those, he said with a chuckle. You'll laugh at me with the shape they are. Elizabeth roared with laughter as Catherine hurried off, rolling her eyes at her cousin. Sebastian took a seat on Elizabeth's other side, a twinkle in his eye as Elizabeth tried to contain her laughter. She reached forward and poured out tea for him. You will be at the garden party, will you not? she asked, as Sebastian picked up one of Baroness Aldington's cakes instead of Catherine's. I will, he assured her with an easy smile, eager to have my company, my lady. Well, you are good company, she said, her cheeks warming once again at his flirtatious words. Yet I hear from my mother that we may not have the fortune of your company for very long. What do you mean? Sebastian asked, offering another of the cakes to her. I mean, Elizabeth paused, startled that her gut twisted at the mere thought of him leaving the county again. She talked of you going on your grand tour. There is much excitement at the idea. My father spoke of it too, over dinner one evening, saying you will follow in your father's footsteps. He went on a grand tour, did he not? He did, when he was my age. Sebastian nodded slowly. He was a great traveller for a while, though he has not travelled as much as he would have liked to as he's grown older. He's not old, Elizabeth corrected him with a mock glare. Older, he said simply with a smile. My father would not mind me saying it. He has a problem with his lungs that can sometimes make the humidity hard, so he has not travelled as much as he would have wished to. May I tell you a secret, Ellen, my lady? Still struggling with this new formality between us, she teased him, leaning toward him. 
You have no idea how much. He mirrored her stance, leaning toward her too out of his chair. When he came so near, she grew distracted, not only thinking of his handsome face and those deep hazel eyes, but the way he smiled at her and talked so freely. Is not this how falling for a man should feel? As if I'm standing from a precipice and cannot help toppling forward. I believe my father wishes for me what he could not have, Sebastian whispered quietly. Elizabeth leaned even closer to him, rather glad to have the excuse to come so near. He could not travel as much as he wished to, so he wishes me to take advantage of the opportunities before me. And is that what you long for too? In truth, he paused and grimaced, no. I do not mean to suggest that the continent doesn't have a lure, nor that there aren't beauties to see, of course there are, yet my determination to see them is somewhat lacking. Truly? she queried, so captivated that she'd quite forgotten her cake and her tea. I think I'm someone you might call a home bird, he explained, resting an elbow on the table. She matched him, placing her elbow down too. Their hands moved so close toward one another that they could have touched. There was a mere hair's breadth between them. Maybe I'll see such beauties someday, but for any length of time. Well, that holds no interest for me. I'd rather be in a place I love. He nodded beyond the windows. With people that matter to me. Rather than strangers. He looked at her. Oh. Her breath hitched her thoughts captured by the idea that she could be one such person that mattered to him so much. You think of your family and your friends, she whispered. Just so. It is a necessary tragedy of life that we only have so long with family and friends. One never knows what will come with the rising of the next sun, he said quite poetically. I would not want to waste time and not see my family. God forbid I should miss the chance to spend time with them whilst I can. Elizabeth felt her heart flutter. There was something in Sebastian's words that let her glimpse something more to him. It suggested a fear, perhaps a worry associated with his father's illness, that he could lose his father someday, sooner than thought. You have a good heart, my lord, Elizabeth murmured, reminding herself to use his title. You think of family, you put them first in all regards. That is a rare thing to find indeed. Is it? He laughed at the idea, shaking his head. You feel much the same, do you not? You care for those around you. I do. But I guess I have heard of so many gentlemen who are eager to leave their families behind, to carve their own lives. What is my own life worth without those that matter to me in it? He asked his strong words cutting through. She stared, blinking at him, in a sort of wonder. You're an impressive gentleman, my lord. More so than you know. The words escaped her, then she blushed, realising what she had done. You flatter me, he said softly, his hand moving toward hers on the table. Their fingers brushed and excitement shot through Elizabeth. Well, she has agreed. Catherine's sudden voice in the room made Elizabeth leap back, her fingers leaving Sebastian's. He leaned back too, his chair creaking under the sudden shifting of weight. Catherine returned to her seat and sat down heavily, evidently not realising what she had walked in on. We stared at each other for too long. Elizabeth chewed her lip, wondering what her mother would have thought of such a look and the brush of their hands. Would she chastise Elizabeth, point out the scandal of it, had it been witnessed by anyone else in the town? My mother has said we can use her kitchen before the garden party, so we shall make your cakes then, Catherine said hurriedly. Thank you. Elizabeth smiled, forcing it, though her eyes kept glancing back towards Sebastian. He no longer looked at her, but down at his teacup. When their tea finished, Sebastian watched Elizabeth go with some reluctance. It had been thrilling to spend this tea with her, accompanied by his cousin, 
though in truth for one so talkative, Catherine had not said much. She'd left most of the conversation to Sebastian and Elizabeth. They talked of his university days and of Elizabeth's travels around the county. Her favourite place was Swanage and the seaside, and he eagerly talked of it, loving the way her eyes lit up. I must go, Elizabeth said, standing. Sebastian stood too and bowed to her, rather suffocated by the formality he imposed on himself. I shall see you at the garden party in a few days' time. His voice was soft. She looked at him for a rather long time. Yes, until then. She seemed to wake herself into activity and curtsied, then wished Catherine a goodbye and sped from the room moving fast. When the front door shut in the distance and echoed through the house, Sebastian sat down again, staring at the empty seat she had left behind. Well, I might as well not have been here, Catherine chuckled, lifting her teacup to her lips. I must say, this gives hope, Seb. Dear Elizabeth looked at you as if you were the one thing that muttered in the room. She's an attentive friend. Sebastian rubbed his hands together, startled by their clamminess from when he and Elizabeth had leaned toward one another, their fingers touching. Did she mean something more by that? She pulled away very sharply when Catherine walked in. All is in place. Catherine leaned forward with her tone excited. Elizabeth intends to make the cakes for the garden party, so you must ensure you are the first man to eat them. Then you shall declare your love. What? You wish me to get down on one knee and propose there and then? Pah! That would look nonsensical indeed. Sebastian scoffed at the idea. If this plan of yours is to work, it must at least be some subtle declaration of love. No cake in this world could make a man propose outright. Then think carefully of what you will say, Catherine pleaded with him. She is willing to believe it, Seb. I can see it in her. She's excited by the prospect. Sebastian laughed at his cousin once more, a part of him thinking this was all a mad idea. Yet at the mere possibility it could work, he started to rehearse what to say in his head. Chapter 12 Elizabeth Have no fear, everything will be fine, Catherine declared, then whipped around, her elbow colliding with a bag of sugar. Watch out. Elizabeth hurried to catch the sugar, but ended up with most of it tipping over her chest and down the neckline of her gown. Ah, that's sugar in some strange places. It's beneath my corset now. They laughed raucously together as Catherine took the large bag of sugar from her and set it straight on the worktop again. Elizabeth looked around the kitchen, worried exactly how badly her cakes might turn out. They had been given the kitchen by the staff of the house, though the cook had left, glancing back with more than one worried look. Elizabeth could hardly blame her for it. Catherine was proving herself just as clumsy here as she was elsewhere, and Elizabeth's lack of knowledge of baking was only hindering matters further. So, next we cream it together, Catherine declared, holding up the recipe that had been gifted by Bonadea on a sheet of paper and knocking off some of the spilt sugar. Cream? Elizabeth looked around, hunting for the pantry door. I shall find some. No, cream doesn't mean cow's cream in this case. It talks of creaming the butter and sugar together. Here, I shall show you. Catherine took the mixing bowl and a wooden spoon, stirred the sugar into the butter that was slowly softening. Gradually, she worked the sugar into the butter, pressing it against the wall of the bowl. You must keep going until the sugar is no longer distinct from the butter and it almost resembles cream. You try. Elizabeth took the bowl and proceeded to follow Catherine's instructions. She was so ill-adept with the spoon that she flicked up some of the batter mixture and it landed on both of their cheeks. Ha! Catherine laughed loudly. Well, you are proving yourself to be as clumsy as me in here. I wish I could deny you, but I cannot. Elizabeth wiped the butter mixture from her cheeks. When it was done, she passed it back to Catherine, who nodded approvingly. Now, we need the flour, in that bag over there. 
Elizabeth moved to the side of the pantry, where a giant bag of flour sat on the floor and was as tall as her knees. Elizabeth couldn't deny her excitement. The thought of knowing at last what Lord Lyle truly thought of her was enough to make her tremulous, with her hands grasping uncertainly at the flour sack. As much as she told herself that it was Lord Lyle's thoughts she wished to discover, another kept coming to her mind. Sebastian. She thought of him eating those iced buns and how he had leaned toward her when they had shared tea. There had been something there, had there not. He must have felt something. She chewed her lip as she picked up the flower bag, fearing that Sebastian was merely acting on an excitement, a matter of attraction. Her mother's warning persisted in the back of her mind that Sebastian was still too young to think seriously about marrying. Lifting the bag, Elizabeth struggled under the heavy weight. Oomph! She huffed, in danger of dropping it as she dragged it across the room. Your cooks must be strong indeed. They are, Catherine said with a giggle. Once when I was little, I saw the cook strike a delivery boy with a wooden spoon, for he'd knocked over her stew pot. It looked like it hurt. Catherine went to help her. They dragged the bag the last distance, then heaved it together, trying to lift it onto the worktop. This way, Catherine muttered. My hands are slipping. Nonsense, we have it. Just a little more this way. Oh! Catherine yelped as Elizabeth dropped the bag. It tipped toward her and landed against her, the top opening and the flower spilling out. It landed all over Elizabeth's face and chest. She shut her eyes, feeling the graininess around the edges of her eyelids and on her lips. Something tells me, she spluttered, spitting out some of the flower, that this wasn't in the recipe. You could say that. Catherine hurried to write what remained in the flower bag onto the worktop and proffered up a cloth to Elizabeth. They laughed loudly together, then Elizabeth grew sombre. Maybe this is a bad idea, Catherine. I'm not very good, as you can see. Nonsense! We just need an expert to help us. Catherine took the cloth from Elizabeth's hands and used it to wipe Elizabeth's eyes. There, now you can see again. I shall ask my mother for assistance. I'll be back shortly. Try not to spill any more flour. I've lost most of it as it is. Elizabeth gestured down to her appearance, fearing she looked more like she was made of flour than of flesh at all. As the door to the stairwell closed behind Catherine, Elizabeth returned to the recipe. Brushing her cheeks hastily to get rid of the flour, she followed the recipe as faithfully as she could, adding the flour and currants along with a spoon of cocoa powder, then mixing it all together. She was so lost in her work that she didn't notice there were footsteps on the stairwell, marking someone's entry to the kitchen until they called out. Catherine! No, it is only I down here. Then Elizabeth realised who had spoken and broke off from stirring the bowl, looking up to see who stood in the doorway. Well, well, Sebastian declared, leaning on the doorframe and folding his arms with an amused grin. What a predicament you're in. He wasn't wearing a tailcoat, and his shirt sleeves were rolled up to his elbows. Stunned at the flash of skin on show, Elizabeth didn't reply at first, but stood dumbstruck, staring at him. Has the flower rendered you speechless? She picked up a handful of flour from where it had landed on the worktop beside her, then tossed it across the room. Sebastian laughed loudly and hid through the door, back on the stairwell, so the flour dropped to the floor. I'm guessing this is not the time for jests. Look at me, Sebastian, she said, quite forgetting to use his title. She stepped back and turned around, seeing what a mess the gown she'd put on to wear for the garden party had now become. Quite a sight, is it not? A sight indeed. A rather sweet one, Sebastian said, entering the room again. Sweet. I look like I'm made of flour, or as if the heavens have dumped it on my head. She wiped her cheeks again and around her eyes, doing her best to see. It is not so bad. Sebastian walked forward, stopping on the other end of the worktop. We'll just have to introduce you to everyone at the garden party as Lady Elizabeth Flower. How about it?
he asked in a teasing tone. She took hold of another handful of flour and tossed it at him again. This time he couldn't escape so fast. The flour landed on his face. There, now you shall have to accompany me at this garden party, in looking ridiculous, she said with triumph. I'll get you back for that. He reached into the sack on the worktop and took a handful. No, she yelped and ran around the kitchen, just as he followed her with the handful. He succeeded, though it made her look no worse than she already did. To get him back, she took hold of the flower bag and tossed it toward him. It landed against his back, breaking and casting flour all over him. He laughed loudly, then coughed on the flower, waving a hand in the air. Well, you have accomplished your aim. He smiled and stood straight. How do I look? As absurd as you do. He jokingly paraded in a circle and curtsied to her. Unable to stop her fits of laughter, she moved back to the cake bowl, rather glad they had somehow miraculously avoided getting more flour in the mixture. Quite absurd. At least I'm not alone now. You can keep me company at this party, she said, as he moved to her side and leaned on the counter. I'll happily stay at your side if you wish me to. The obvious flirtation made her look at him, smiling as he raised his eyebrows, the mischievous smirk in place. You can stay there if you like, she said, continuing the teasing tone. Lifting a cupcake tray that Catherine had prepared for them, she started to decant the mixture into the little moulds. I would not mind if you did. Even when I look like this, he sniffed his arm now covered in flour, and smell like this too. Perhaps it's an improvement, she jested. He slowly lowered his arm and looked at her with a mock glare. I shall have to find more flour to throw at you now. You wouldn't dare. She jested and moved back from him all the same. He sidled forward again, and she had no wish to escape, so stayed still. What is this feeling? Her heart raced in her chest to be so close to him, and her fingers shook. She busied herself with the mixture, hoping that if she concentrated on her task enough, then maybe that trembling would stop. Ask me and I'll stay by your side all day, he assured her, his voice deep. Her eyes darted up from the tray, looking at him. Tempting indeed, she whispered. You can rather have an effect on a lady when you wish to. You mean with flour? He nodded at the mess she was now in. Perhaps so, she giggled and flattened the mixture in the tray in front of her. Well, my lord, what do you think? My lord, are we back to that? He asked, his voice lifting in mock outrage. No, I will not have it. He stood off the worktop and folded his arms, that flash of skin on show again. Elizabeth worked hard to draw her eyes away from his forearms. There was something about that glimpse beneath the fine suit that had her heart thudding against her ribcage. She reminded herself at once of all the things she had reiterated in her mind before. Sebastian was a friend, but too young for marriage, as her mother had said. I should not be looking at him in this way. I have to look elsewhere and be reasonable not foolhardy. You are a lord, she reminded him. It is how I should address you. And when I threw flour at you just now, you called me by name. It is my name, Elizabeth. He leaned toward her, his voice lowering. Please, you can always call me Sebastian. I wouldn't wish there to be a needless formality between us. Nor I, but you are quite expertly avoiding the question, which can only lead me to think that you do not want to answer. She held up the tray. Do they look so bad then? What was the original question? He asked, frowning in clear distraction. You are still delaying an answer. She put the tray down again. I was asking what you thought of them. How do they look? They look fine, but the proof of these things is in the tasting, surely? He asked. She delved a finger into the bowl and wiped out some of the mixture, lifting it to her lips. Well, he said, waiting for her answer. 
Startled at the creaminess and the sweet taste, she smiled, indulging. They're not bad, she said after a minute. Now it is your turn. Very well. He copied her movements, pressing a finger into the bowl and pulling some of the mixture out. When he licked his finger too, a shot of excitement travelled through Elizabeth. Stunned at the sudden heat inside of her, she froze, watching Sebastian. Hmm. I think I need a second taste to be sure. He reached for the bowl again. He took a bigger taste this time, lingering with his finger beyond his lips. At the sight, such excitement coiled inside of Elizabeth that she stared at him. Her lips parted. She felt heat rushing into her cheeks. The blush must have surely been obvious, though he didn't comment on it. He looked at her as he finished his taste. Quite delicious, he said, his voice deepening. He moved toward her, his elbow resting on the counter beside them. Elizabeth, he whispered. Yes. Her voice was breathy, for she was so distracted by the alluring sight of him and how close he had come. For all this, playfulness, after what has passed, there is something I must tell you. He paused. It has worked. It must have done. Elizabeth realised at once that Bonadea's recipe must indeed have done the trick. Sebastian had had a taste and here he was, moving toward her. Was it possible to mistake his intent after such flirtatiousness? Surely not. He liked her. He had to. Perhaps now he was going to confess his care for her. I will know at last. Perhaps Sebastian is the man I should love after all. Yes, she prompted him on, longing to hear the words from him. When she leaned toward him, their arms brushed together. They both flinched, looking down at that touch, then Sebastian shifted toward her. Elizabeth's eyes fluttered closed as she held her breath, for she was so certain he was going to kiss her. She waited with bated breath for the feeling of his lips against hers. Elizabeth, he whispered, his lips hovering over hers. She didn't dare move away or make a sound in case it ruined the moment, and she woke from this spell, as if waking from a dream. This way, Mama, a voice called from the staircase, interrupting the two of them. The voice was followed by quick footsteps that belonged to two different people. We are discovered. Chapter 13 Sebastian Sebastian was forced to step away, moving so fast his boots slipped in the flower, and he somehow managed to stay standing by gripping to the worktop beside him. Elizabeth moved the tray of cakes to the side so he avoided destroying them with his sudden movements. They inadvertently moved close together again, and both froze, their eyes wide. So close. Sebastian could have cursed for the want of her. One kiss. That would have been all it took to show Elizabeth how much he cared for her. She had wanted it too, he could read it, in the way she had flirted with him, her nearness, the way she'd closed her eyes and waited for him to kiss her. Brought together, they had both fallen silent. Then he looked at her lips again, as she did his own. Not now, she hissed, just as Catherine's voice was heard on the staircase again. Here we are, Mama. Sebastian stepped away, turning his back, his body thrumming with the excitement that had passed between him and Elizabeth. I shan't lose hope. Not now. As he turned back, he watched Catherine and her mother Clara stepping into the room. Catherine was deliriously happy as she looked between Elizabeth and Sebastian, a great smile on her cheeks and her body finding it impossible to stay still. In contrast, Clara was very still. Her only movements were the sharp darting of her eyes as she looked between the pair of them. Look at you two, Clara said, her voice tight. What on earth happened? Have you been wrestling in my flower? Catherine sniggered and hurried to plant her hands over her mouth to silence the sound. Sebastian looked at Elizabeth, raising just one eyebrow in mischief. She coloured such a shade of crimson, trying to hide her smile, 
that he knew this new intimacy between them was not something either of them could turn the back on now. Racing with Elizabeth in flower, eh? It made him move to stand behind the counter again, shifting so he could hide his lower body and any resulting affects that could happen thanks to heated thoughts of Elizabeth. Forgive me, Lady Aldington, Elizabeth said in a rush. It was my doing. I had an accident with the flower when Catherine and I attempted to lift it onto the bench. I got it all over myself. Clara's eyebrows raised as she looked at Sebastian, her hands moving to her hips. Aunt Clara, he began, but she cut him off, her voice much sharper than his own tone had been. Your next words better be an explanation of why you were covered in flour too, Seb. We got into a flower fight. That is all. Sebastian shrugged, trying to play up the childish element of the idea rather than the mischief. His best hope now was for Clara to make a comment about them being young. So she did not observe the heated blush on Elizabeth's cheeks. With a little luck, if Catherine had blocked the doorway, Clara would not have seen their close proximity and how near they were to kissing one another. Hmm. Clara did not sound convinced. Here, dear, take this. She produced a handkerchief and passed it to Elizabeth. For your face. Elizabeth moved to a bucket of water at the side of the room and dipped the handkerchief in the water to dab at her cheeks. With the distraction, Clara moved to Sebastian's side. I was young once too, Seb, she whispered in his ear. Don't think I don't know that look in your eye. What look? he said innocently. She rolled her eyes in answer, not commenting any more. Another minute more, that's all I needed. As Clara stepped away to inspect the cakes, Sebastian looked at Elizabeth across the room. With the wet handkerchief, she had made water run down from her cheeks, across her neck, and down to her bosom. The escaping water droplets that followed her curves made him look away again. Maybe I am incorrigible. Well, no matter how this happened, we must clear it up. Clara checked the cakes and nodded. Lady Elizabeth, you have done a fine job with these cakes, despite the evident distraction. She glared at Sebastian another time, as beside her, Catherine beamed, seeming delighted with all that had passed. I shall put the cakes in the oven for you, and in the meantime, oh dear. Clara trialled off as she looked at Elizabeth across the room. Your dress will not suit a garden party now. Elizabeth looked down at the gown, pulling at it and trying to knock off some of the flower. I think she looks very well indeed, Sebastian said, finding he couldn't end his mischief. Once more, Catherine flattened a hand over her lips, stopping a laugh escaping, just as Clara glared at him. I'm hardly surprised. His aunt moved to his side and tapped him around the arm, a not-so-subtle sign to be silent. Lady Elizabeth, I shall have a bath prepared for you at once. Oh, thank you. Yes, a bath is probably a wise idea. Elizabeth pulled at her hair. The golden tendrils that were usually fixed into an updo fell down past her shoulders. Ah, oh, Elizabeth, what are you doing to me? Sebastian was so distracted looking at the way those curls brushed her skin that he didn't notice for a minute Clara handing him the tray of cakes to do something with. In the end, his aunt stood on his toe. Ow, he muttered quietly. At least it got your attention, dear, Clara declared with a false smile. I can lend Elizabeth a gown, Mama, Catherine said as she walked toward Elizabeth and stood by her side, measuring up their shoulders. I would not want her to miss the garden party. Yes, an excellent idea. Please, go and find her one, Catherine. Clara gestured to the staircase. Catherine stepped forward, heading right through the worst of the flour that had been spilt on the floor. Look out for the... She broke off as Catherine slipped. Unlike Sebastian, who had managed to catch himself and stay standing, Catherine was not so lucky. She fell on the flour and lashed out with a hand as she slipped, trying to steady herself. The only thing she caught was Elizabeth's hand and managed to drag her down with her. 
Oomph! One of them exclaimed loudly in pain as the other one groaned. They ended up entangled on the floor together. Sebastian and Elizabeth exchanged amused glances. Well, I'll think twice before letting you two loose in my kitchen again. Clara went to assist in pulling Catherine to her feet as Sebastian moved to Elizabeth. He offered both his hands, and she took them, standing. When she was in danger of slipping in the flower again, her hands tightened on his own. He squeezed back and smiled, showing he had no intention of letting her slip. Seb! Seb! Where did you put those cakes? Clara called to him. Hmm, he said distractedly, slowly releasing Elizabeth's hands. Clara must have found where he'd put the tray down on the worktop, for she carried it toward the oven, then flicked her fingers at Catherine, urging her to action. Come, Elizabeth, let's get you that bath and a new gown. Catherine took Elizabeth's hand and drew her toward the staircase. They disappeared fast, with Elizabeth hesitating on the first step just long enough to look back at Sebastian. Her face blushed bright red again, and she smiled, such a sweet smile that it gave Sebastian hope. Everything was going according to plan. This had been a perfect meeting with the cake mixture. Now, all he had to make sure was that he was near her again once the cooked cakes were presented. Then he'd tell her how he really felt. Sebastian! Clara hissed in his ear the moment the door closed behind Elizabeth and Catherine. What? Sebastian asked innocently as his aunt pushed the now nearly empty flower bag into his hands. What exactly do you think you are doing? Clara asked, her large eyes so wide that it seemed almost impossible for Sebastian to look anywhere else. Helping a friend with cakes. Quit it with the innocent act, Clara said mockingly, and returned her attention to the clay oven in the wall, arranging the tray of cakes on a shelf inside. Your uncle and I were not averse to quiet moments alone when we were young. I beg your pardon, Sebastian said, whipping around so fast that he nearly dropped the flower bag. Neither were your parents, she said pointedly. I do not need to hear about that. He shook his head firmly. Good, then you know exactly what I'm talking about. She closed the door on the clay oven and moved back toward him. What are you up to, Sebastian? She crossed her arms and stood very still in front of him. Clara was shorter than him these days, but despite the height difference, she had a strength to her that reminded Sebastian of times when she had told him and Catherine off for their mischief as children. Nothing. I simply came to help a friend and we were enjoying one another's company. Is there anything so awful in that? Sebastian's challenging question made the fierceness leave his aunt's expression. She sighed deeply and shook her head. There's nothing wrong in that. Not at all. She stepped away and beckoned for him to follow with the flower bag as she tidied the room. You must have seen how inappropriate this was all the same. Aunt, please. I know you and Lady Elizabeth have known each other for years, but you are a gentleman and a lady now, she reminded him, pointing at him for where he should leave the bag on a shelf. You two should be chaperoned in company together, not getting into flower fights and ending up so close to one another that... that... that what? he prompted his aunt, rather entertained by the way she fumbled over the words. She offered him another dark glare and clearly decided not to finish her own sentence. Aunt, it was all innocent, I assure you. Of course it was, she said distractedly, handing him a cloth to help her as they tidied away all the spilt flour. That was why she was as red as a tomato, and you leapt back from her as if you had been burnt. Aunt, oh, fear not. I shall not say anything, but I will make this warning to you. She reached up and took his shoulder, pinning him to the spot. Some people may say that you are too young to marry, Sebastian. But the truth is, you are not. I know that. Sebastian stayed quiet, fearful his aunt would see straight into his heart. Many a person has been married when they are even younger than you. 
If you and Lady Elizabeth were ever caught in a compromising position together, then you would be forced to marry, she said pointedly. Forced? Sebastian spluttered. He would hardly mind marrying Elizabeth, but he would not want her forced into anything. If the two of them ever did marry, he wanted her walking down that aisle with as great a smile on her face as he would no doubt have on his own. Exactly. Clara sighed dramatically and handed him bowls to take to the bucket of water, ready for the maids to finish the cleaning up. Baron Grey would certainly not be happy about his daughter's reputation being compromised, and your father would expect you to do the right thing. I would always do the right thing, aunt. I am no cad. The strength in his voice softened her own expression. I know you are not, Seb. You are a good man. Yet you need to be aware that any... Closeness. She seemed to choose the word after some deliberation. Between you and Lady Elizabeth could be construed in the wrong way. Or not, Sebastian muttered as he moved to the bucket of water. What was that? Nothing, he lied and put down the pots. I thank you for your concern, aunt, but please let me assure you in this. He held Clara's gaze as she joined him by the bucket. Any conversation, any meeting between Elizabeth and I will always be an honourable one. I could never endanger her happiness or her reputation. He spoke with such feeling that his aunt instantly smiled. I'm glad to hear it, she said with a heavy sigh. Now what are we going to do about you? She gestured at his suit. Sebastian looked down and realised for the first time what a state he was also in. He might not have been as covered as Elizabeth was, but the suit was dappled in white specks, and he could feel the graininess on his cheeks and around his eyes. You need to knock it off your hair, your face, and you must change. I know. You can borrow one of your uncle's suits. You're tall enough anyway these days. She moved to stand beside him and took his shoulders. And you have broadened out. She smiled at the sight of him. Quite the man and no longer the boy. Mind telling my own parents that? Sebastian asked. I'm certain father sometimes looks at me like I'm still the boy that used to run around his ankles. Ha! He loves you, that's all. She patted his cheek lovingly. Come, I'll arrange for a suit to be prepared for you. As Clara called one of the footmen down to the kitchen so she could talk to him, Sebastian cleared up the flour as much as he could and brushed it off his suit. Then he followed the footman toward a spare guest chamber where the suit was to be laid out for him. As he wandered the corridors of the guest wing, he realised that somewhere in this house, Elizabeth was bathing. The thought struck him so suddenly, and with such heat, that he pulled at the cravat around his neck, not just loosening it, but practically tearing it off. He imagined the water droplets he'd seen running down her neck and her chest in the kitchen, now running across other parts of her body. Desist. Sebastian got control of his mind just as he stepped into the guest chamber. Is everything well, my lord? The footman asked, taking a second glance at Sebastian's face. Sebastian presumed his face was red after the heated thoughts of Elizabeth. Just fine, thank you. He stepped into the room where a bowl of hot water had been prepared for him to wash his face. He braced his hands either side of the bowl and cursed into the water. Ah, what are you doing to me, Elizabeth? Chapter 14 Elizabeth Oh, God! Elizabeth plunged her head under the warm water in the copper bath, hiding her face from the world. Her hair danced in the water momentarily before she broke back through the surface and brushed the dripping water from her eyes. I need to get control of myself. Yet she couldn't. Elizabeth was now alone in a guest chamber, bathing and getting rid of all of the flour from her body and her hair, but what couldn't be washed away with the water was the memory of all that had passed between her and Sebastian. The playfulness, the flirtation, the closeness, and that near kiss. Not to mention the way they had looked at one another afterwards, 
their eyes flicking down to one another's lips. The attraction had been obvious, as if the air had sparked between them like flint wool catching light in a tinderbox. This wasn't supposed to happen, Elizabeth muttered, then pushed her lips under the water, peering out across the surface. Sure, from the moment Sebastian had returned from university and they'd bumped into one another in that market, there was an attraction on Elizabeth's part. Yet she'd settled herself with the argument that her mother had made. Sebastian was too young to marry and would certainly not consider marrying her. Today that argument had changed. Sebastian had to feel the attraction too. Elizabeth couldn't deny it or ignore it. Something else was happening between them. She closed her eyes and thought back to the moment he had licked that cake mixture. The heated thoughts that had shot through her at his tasting the dough was one thing, but his reaction was something else. Clearly, Bonadea's recipe had worked, for he'd moved toward her, ready to kiss her. She pushed herself above the water, dabbing her body with soap, ready to wash off. Each time she tried to push Sebastian from her thoughts, it was hopeless. He returned again as if he was in the room there with her. Imagining Sebastian standing by her bath was not helping. She saw things in her mind she should not be seeing. Stop it, Elizabeth, she reprimanded herself and plunged under the water again, closing her eyes. She couldn't deny it. This attraction was strong, beyond anything that she had read about in her books, or even heard maids whispering to one another about. This was something else. Perhaps it is everything I've been waiting for. With this in mind, she washed off the last of the soap and climbed out of the bath, reaching for a towel that one of the maids had left on a clothes horse nearby. She dried the water from her skin with the towel, then imagined it was someone else's hands behind that towel, someone else that was drying her. She closed her eyes, indulging in the imagining. Sebastian was there with her. He moved the towel down her shoulders, caressing it across her arms, the whole time holding her gaze. Then he drew the towel softly around her waist and to her hips, his fingers stealing a butterfly soft touch to her bare skin. So soft, it brought goosebumps of excitement blooming across her hips and thighs. Oh, stop it, she muttered to herself and wrapped the towel around her body. Moving toward the fire that had been lit, she dropped to her knees and let her hair loose by the flames, encouraging it to dry in the heat. Her whole being was in argument. Her heart wanted nothing more than to find Sebastian again, to forget her fears of the past and talk about what had passed between them in that kitchen. Yet there was still a voice in her head that argued against it. He's too young to marry. With some frustration, Elizabeth realised it was her mother's voice in her mind. I know what I must do, Elizabeth declared the words aloud, somehow feeling that hearing the words would make her more resolute. I must give him one of the cakes once they are cooked. Then I shall know for certain. She couldn't afford to be confused or distracted in her aim. She needed to know for sure whether the attraction she felt for Sebastian could be something more. Once her hair was mostly dry, she dressed in the gown that Catherine had left behind for her. It was a pale silk blue gown with a white chiffon overlay that hung down from just beneath the bust, with the hem finishing in soft lace. It suited her well, and just about fit though she and Catherine were slightly different sizes. She called for the maid who came to put her hair into an updo. When everything was complete, Elizabeth stared at herself in the mirror on top of a dresser for some time. There was a pleasant blush on her cheeks from the heat of the room and such a smile on her face that she didn't seem able to remove it. She feared someone asking her just why she was so happy for she knew exactly what the cause of it was. She saw in her mind's eye again the moment she'd come so close to kissing Sebastian. Another minute alone, before discovery from Lady Aldington and Catherine, 
and Elizabeth would know what it was like to be kissed. When the maid turned away to gather her shoes for her, Elizabeth brushed her fingers to her lips, imagining what it could be like. She pictured herself with Sebastian in that kitchen, and this time she thought what could have happened if they had kissed one another. She imagined something chaste at first, the mere press of his lips on hers, then the thoughts grew heated with his hands moving to her hips and her own clinging to the edges of his waistcoat. Your shoes, my lady. The maid proffered the shoes forward. Shaken from her thoughts, Elizabeth took the shoes. Thank you. She smiled and pulled the shoes on again. With everything in place, she left the room and headed down the corridor. At the top of the stairs stood Catherine, restlessly moving back and forth with her hands fidgeting in front of her. There you are, she said loudly and turned toward Elizabeth. Well, you suit that gown better than I ever did. You might have to keep it after this. I wouldn't dream of stealing it from you, Elizabeth assured her, making a conscious effort to flatten the creases she had made in the skirt. How are the cakes? Mama says they are about ready to come out of the oven so they shall be ready for the party. Catherine smiled gleefully. I do hope this works. If it does, I shall be trying it myself sometime, she winked. Ha! I hope it works too. Elizabeth grew fidgety herself, bouncing on her toes and wringing her hands together. For some reason, she didn't tell Catherine that the mixture might have already had an effect on Sebastian. For some reason, it felt wrong to betray the secret of all that had passed between the two of them, even if part of it had been witnessed by Catherine already. We shall simply have to ensure that all the gentlemen you are considering taste one of the cakes at the party, Catherine whispered hurriedly. So, who do you wish to try them? I suppose Lord Lysel must be one of them, Elizabeth said, recalling the way she had seen him eating the apple in the market. She had been so sure that was a sign, but now she was not so certain. She had not felt anything like what she had experienced with Sebastian in the company of Lord Lysel. He is a nice enough man, but there is no spark yet. Maybe some day there could be. Lord Lysel? Catherine seemed disappointed, her nose wrinkling. Do you not like him? Elizabeth asked. Oh, well. Catherine delayed an answer, waving a hand in the air. What I think is not important. This is about you, my friend, she said sweetly. Do you like him? He is handsome, certainly, but there seems to be something missing in his character, Elizabeth confessed. Sometimes I am uncertain if I am just blinded to his true virtues, or if he is a little dull, like a bowl of custard, the accompaniment, rather than the actual delicious pudding, Catherine said with mischief. Ha! What a wonderful way to compare gentlemen. To delicious desserts? Catherine licked her lips pointedly. I see nothing wrong with the comparison. They laughed raucously together. When a maid scurried past them, carrying towels, they both tempered their laughter. So let us return to our conversation at hand. The dull custard will try one of your cakes. Lord Lysel, Elizabeth whispered. That is what I said. Catherine smiled with her words. Who else? Oh, I... Elizabeth was still wary of saying Sebastian's name. She longed to, for there to be no secrets. But what would Catherine say when he was her cousin? There are other gentlemen who have been most attentive. I supposed Lord Warrington will have to try one, though I sincerely hope the cakes have no reaction on him. Hmm. The dessert that lays untouched at the end of the table for no one wishes to try him, Catherine said, continuing their jest. Elizabeth laughed once more. Any other man? Well, of course, I'm happy to give a cake to any young man. I should keep my mind open to possibilities, should I not? Elizabeth's mouth turned dry. She looked up and down the corridor, wary of the man she thought so much of appearing and overhearing the two of them together but he was nowhere to be seen. There is, of course, Lord Wareham, too. 
She was careful to use his title, not wanting to give away the familiarity that had occurred between them in the kitchen by using his Christian name. Seb, Catherine whispered in delight, then appeared to do a little dance on the spot. That made you happy! Elizabeth smiled, her voice pitching higher. Well, I love you both, dearly. Catherine laid her hands to her heart. I may be biased, but I think you'd make a fine couple indeed. She winked good-naturedly. I shall endeavour to help in any way I can, and be certain to push the tray of cakes under every gentleman's nose, especially these three men. The custard, the unwanted dessert, and, well, what cake shall we use to talk of Sebastian without his knowledge? Let me think. Elizabeth tapped her chin in thought. How about a trifle? A trifle? Catherine wrinkled her nose again. Is that a good comparison? Yes. It's my... Elizabeth trailed off, stopping just short of saying it was her favourite. Very well, then we have our plan. Catherine clasped her hands together excitedly. I'll be sure to steer clear of all the fruitcakes, those gentlemen who are perhaps just a little mad. Elizabeth laughed with her, glad of the distraction Catherine could cause. For a few minutes, Elizabeth had forgotten all her heated thoughts of Sebastian and the attraction in the kitchen. I shall run down now. See you in a few minutes at the garden party. Catherine waved at Elizabeth and hurried down the stairs, leaving her alone. There were footsteps behind Elizabeth, but she was so distracted by her plan, she did not turn to see who was walking her way at first. Only when the steps halted beside her did she turn around to face the men approaching. It was Sebastian, wearing a suit she had not seen him in before. It was a true gentleman's suit, made of rich navy blue fabric, with a waistcoat that was both subtle and expertly designed, midnight blue and dappled with stars. Slim fitting, both the tailcoat and the waistcoat flattered the broadness of Sebastian's shoulders down to the narrowness of his waist. Oh my! Elizabeth didn't say anything as she stared at him. Something wrong, Elizabeth? he asked. She noted the way he didn't bother saying Lady Elizabeth at all these days. She loved that change. Cat got your tongue? he teased her as she struggled to move her tongue at all. It seemed Catherine's distraction had only worked for a few minutes. At once Elizabeth's thoughts had returned to all the heated and forbidden thoughts of Sebastian that she knew she should not be having. He's truly handsome indeed. Chapter 15 Sebastian Turning back and forth in front of the mirror a few times, Sebastian examined himself in the suit. He didn't seem so young wearing this suit. He could remember admiring this particular suit more than once in his youth. And now, it fitted him perfectly. Smiling at his reflection and adjusting the cuffs of the suit, Sebastian's thoughts wandered. He ended up thinking of what Aunt Clara had said to him about how he wasn't too young to marry and plenty had married younger than him. The words had had quite the opposite effect on him than she probably intended. Where she had hoped it would be a warning, it was in fact a source of hope. Adjusting the navy blue suit one last time, he stepped away from the mirror and fussed with his hair, the few loose locks drying after he had dampened them with water to get rid of some of the flecks of flour. Stepping out into the hallway, he caught sight of Elizabeth and approached her slowly admiring the way she looked in the blue silk gown. It suited her perfectly, flattering her figure and complementing the golden hue of her hair. He stopped beside her and smiled, noting the way she stood staring, as if dumbstruck by his approach. Something wrong, Elizabeth, he asked, his mischievous side returning. It felt as if a barrier had been brought down between them in that kitchen and he had no intention of putting it back up again. Cat got your tongue, he teased her. The words seemed to break her out of her stupor. She shook her head, laughed and looked away down the stairs. You startled me, that is all. 
here or in the kitchen, he whispered to her. She laughed once again and returned her eyes to him. There seemed to be a twinkle in those dark eyes now, an excitement he had not read in her before. You know we should not talk of what passed there, she whispered with as much secrecy, looking up and down the corridor. Which part? he asked in pretend innocence. The flower fight, or the moment that you and I... Yes, thank you. She cut him off hurriedly, still smiling, though she bit her lip, clearly in the effort to stop herself. Well, if it helps, you are not the only one to be thinking of it. He winked with the words. Once more, a mad blush took up place on her cheeks. This new, easy excitement between them was everything. Sebastian offered his arm to her, thinking how mad he had been before to even go ahead with Catherine's plan of writing to Elizabeth as Bonadea. Yes, he had done it, and the ruse with the cakes was what had led them to being alone in the kitchen. But perhaps that was all they needed in the end. No tricks, only to be alone. Slowly, she took his arm, her hand sliding into the crook of his elbow. When her breath hitched, he stepped forward, escorting her down the stairs. There was silence between them as they walked, but no less tension than before. Every few steps, they kept looking at one another, the attraction in the air palpable between them. Ah, there you two are, Clara's voice sounded across the hallway. Sebastian turned to look at his aunt and noted the way her brows furrowed together when she saw them arm in arm together. She sharply elbowed her husband at her side. Horatio rubbed the sore spot and turned around to face them as well. The pair had been stood by the open door to the garden, overseeing what the maids were carrying outside on silver trays ready for the tea party. What was that for? Horatio asked, destroying any chance Clara had of being subtle. Ah, well... From what I hear of your two's escapade with flour in the kitchen, you both are now a significant improvement. No flour in sight. Clara stepped forward and somehow managed to get between the pair of them, parting Elizabeth's arm from Sebastian's. Aunt, Sebastian said in a low tone, though Clara didn't appear to hear him. Thank you for watching. Before we continue into the story, do us a favor. Hit the subscribe button this way we will be able to create more audiobooks for free for you. Thank you again. Now, back to our story. She took Elizabeth's arm instead and drew her outside. Is it not a beautiful day? Come see, Elizabeth. You look very fine in Catherine's gown. As Clara led Elizabeth outside, Sebastian slowly followed, with his uncle moving alongside him. Finding your aunt a little interfering? Horatio asked in his usual perceptive way. A little, Sebastian said in a low tone. Ha, huh, do not worry, Horatio assured him. Soon enough, she'll be distracted with watching over Catherine like a mother hen. Watch. He nudged Sebastian's arm as they stepped outside, and Sebastian turned to look where Horatio was pointing. Catherine was adjusting some of the cakey displays ready for their arrivals. But a few of the guests had arrived early and one particular gentleman seemed most attentive at Catherine's arm, eagerly trying to get her attention. Catherine was oblivious to his obvious intent, her attention much more on the cakes. In fact, she was so distracted that she tripped on one of the chair legs and fell forward. Sebastian and Horatio winced together, waiting for the impact on the floor that they could not stop from so great a distance across the terrace. Fortunately, the impact never happened. The gentleman in question that had been most attentive to Catherine was now the one close enough to catch her. He helped her steady herself. He's a bit handsy, is he not? Horatio said tightly. Who's the mother hen now? Sebastian teased his uncle. Yet just as Horatio had warned him, Clara was at once at Catherine's side, appearing as if from nowhere. She crossed the terrace fast. She stepped between Catherine and the gentleman, separating them just as she had done with Sebastian and Elizabeth before. 
Now's your chance. Horatio nudged Sebastian's shoulder, urging him in the direction of where Elizabeth stood, adjusting the cakes she had made on a platter set on a table. Wide-eyed, Sebastian stared at his uncle in shock. Clearly Clara had told him what she suspected was happening in the kitchen, but rather than worry about it as Clara clearly did, Horatio seemed to be encouraging it. What? Sebastian trailed off, uncertain how to ask his question. Young love and flights of fancy, eh? Horatio chuckled in a deep tone. You're a man, Seb. Don't let Clara stop you from who you wish to talk to. Believe me, he whispered, his eyes flitting back to his wife. I held back from talking to the woman I wished to speak to once. I was infinitely happier once I realised what it was that I wanted. Curious at the words, Sebastian realised he had not heard much about Horatio's and Clara's courting days. Seizing upon the opportunity, he nodded his thanks at his uncle and crossed back toward Elizabeth, who was still fussing with her cakes. Your aunt is becoming most attentive, she whispered to him as he stopped by her side. I had noticed. They laughed together. Well, the offer still stands, Elizabeth. What offer? The one I made in the kitchen, he said softly. Her eyes widened as she turned to face him, nearly knocking off one of the cakes. The verbal offer, he whispered, wondering if she was thinking of that near kiss again. I'll be glad to keep you company at this garden party. You know I like your company, always, she said softly, even before you returned from university. You probably forgot about me whilst I was gone, did you not? He said challengingly and folded his arms, finding he couldn't resist teasing her. I did not, she protested, putting on a look of mock affront. How could I forget you, Seymour, was it? She pretended to get his name wrong as she walked around the table, adjusting a few more of the cakes. Hmm, you toy with me, he said playfully, staying close to her. I never forgot you, not once she assured him plainly, glancing back toward him. I wondered if you were the one who would forget all of us back here. You were off enjoying the life at a grand university. I imagine it is rather different from the quaint life here. I know which I prefer, Sebastian said pointedly, his eyes lingering on Elizabeth. She must have taken the hint, for she looked up from the cakes, their eyes connecting over the display. I was happier than I can tell you to see you again that day in the market. She smiled sweetly and completed her circle of the table, moving back to stand at his other side. Reaching toward the table and a teapot, he offered to pour out two cups for the two of them, even though it was early, and all of the guests hadn't yet arrived. She nodded, clearly needing the drink too. When did my mouth get so dry, he wondered as he poured the tea. I was happy too, she whispered, and those yellow roses you gave me, how beautiful they are. They lasted a long time. Your favourite? he asked in wonder. Absolutely! She nodded with vigour. Nothing so glorious, nor as happy as a yellow rose, as if a drop of sunshiny has fallen from the heavens. Poetic indeed, he admired. My mother would call it naive and childlike to say such things. She looked down, clearly taking the censure to heart as she lifted the teacup to her lips and took a sip. Why is it childlike to observe the beauty in this world? he asked, his voice tightening. My mother would say I fail to see that a rose also has thorns, Elizabeth explained, raising her eyes again. Perhaps, but that makes the bloom no less beautiful, does it not? he asked, aware now that she gazed at him rather openly, not even blinking. Do not let your mother persuade you to look at the world through a miserable lens, Elizabeth. If you are fortunate enough to be blessed with looking at the world with happiness, hope, even optimism, that is something to treasure indeed. I do not think I have ever heard anyone talk of the world the way you do, she whispered, her voice softening. He moved toward her, the better to hear her, so close that their arms brushed together. 
It was there again, the sudden heat. She looked at him as he looked at her, neither one of them making a move to step apart. We are in public. Others can see us. Even with this thought, Sebastian could not step away. All he could think of was this moment between him and Elizabeth. You seem to know me so well, she murmured. Better than most. Almost intimately, he said, his voice deepening. The flirtation must have struck a chord, for her cheeks blushed once more. What are we talking of over here, then? Clara's voice suddenly sounded at the side of them. Sebastian looked away to see his aunt approaching. Behind her, Horatio and Catherine were talking and pointing their way, smiling together. Clara did not seem so happy. She stepped between Sebastian and Elizabeth again, quite pointedly stepping on his toe for a second time that day. Ow! he muttered, covering it up as he hobbled back and turned to look at his uncle and cousin pleadingly. They both shrugged, looking rather helpless. Lady Elizabeth, Clara said, fixing her attention on Elizabeth. Some of our other guests are arriving. Would you help me in greeting them, my dear? I can see one of them is a friend of yours. Is that not Lord Lysel? Sebastian whipped his head around so fast that he cricked his neck. The envy shot through him at once. Yes, that is Lord Lysel. Of course I will come too. Elizabeth put down her teacup on the table beside where Sebastian stood, then hurried off with Clara. The two of them moved to the edge of the terrace, where many of the guests were now arriving around the side of the house on the garden path. At the front of the group was Lord Lyle, who strode forward with confidence, as if this was his own home. He even greeted Elizabeth first, before his hostess, Clara, a plain and obvious affront to his hostess, but also a declaration of whom he wished truly to talk to. Sebastian watched from afar as Lord Lysel took Elizabeth's hand and kissed the back. He seemed to linger there, a beat too long, and to Sebastian's horror, Elizabeth didn't pull away. All the flirtation that passed between them, all the excitement seemed to dwindle, to the point that Sebastian wondered if he had imagined it all. With Elizabeth's back turned to him, he could not read her expression, and at no point did she turn to glance back at him. She merely gazed at Lord Lysel as he offered his arm to her and escorted her toward the tables on the terrace. Seb? Catherine appeared at his side. She tried to take the teacup from his hand that he hadn't realised he'd been holding on so tightly to. Out of fear of your destroying my mother's crockery, let it go. He released it suddenly, and she hastened to put it down on the table beside him. What happened? You and Elizabeth seem to be very close. Again, I might add. Do not think my mother has not told my father exactly what state you two were found in in our kitchen. Yes, I had noticed. Sebastian's eyes flicked to his uncle, but Horatio had gone to assist his wife in greeting their guests. Meanwhile, Lord Lyle and Elizabeth were walking through the tables. Elizabeth glanced at Sebastian once. Then Lord Lyle said something to her, and her gaze was drawn away again. I thought... Sebastian trailed off, uncertain what to say to his cousin. He could not believe that Elizabeth was fickle enough to transfer affection so suddenly from him to Lord Lyle. But the meeting did bring something into perspective. It was possible that though Elizabeth was attracted to him, it went no deeper than that. Where Sebastian had fallen in love, she could simply be attracted, and there would be nothing more to it than that. Lord Lysel is still seen by her parents as a potential husband for her. Is he not? Yes, Catherine said without hesitation, you knew that. Yet it was easy to forget in the kitchen, and just now. Whatever Lord Lysel said to Elizabeth, he made her laugh. The pair laughed together, and Sebastian looked on enviously before drawing his eyes away and returning his focus to his cousin. Jealousy is an ugly feeling, he confessed to her. 
Catherine raised a hand and patted his arm, such a sympathetic look in her eyes that it made him feel even more out of sorts than before. Today is not over yet, Sebastian. Remember, you must try one of her cakes first and say what you have rehearsed. Perhaps then, everything will fall into place. Chapter 16 Sebastian Don't be blind, Seb. Surely you can see what I can see too, Catherine hissed as they wandered around the garden party. People hadn't yet taken their seats but wandered and socialised with everyone there. Across the terrace, Sebastian saw his parents had arrived and talked eagerly to his aunt and uncle, the four of them laughing together about something. Such raucous laughter was spread between all the groups that had gathered together, even Lord Lyle and Elizabeth, who Sebastian kept watching together. See what? Sebastian said distractedly. The way she looks at you, Catherine whispered, elbowing him for good measure, to make sure she had his attention. Sebastian looked once again across the tables and between the groups standing together, seeking out Elizabeth's gaze. It was true that she was looking at him a lot, even as Lord Lysel spoke to her. She seemed equally distracted, then would turn away and return to her conversation. What is going on? Sebastian was confused, as quickly as he decided that Elizabeth was only attracted to him, that she felt nothing deeper, he caught her looking again. I do not know what is going on, Sebastian whispered to his cousin. Neither do I, Catherine said and coughed, clearing her throat. Yet I have an idea. Another, Sebastian asked. Your last idea hasn't come to fruition yet. He nodded at the platter full of cupcakes no one had yet tried. Though people had taken the occasional cup of tea, no one had sat down properly to take part in the tea party yet. People were preferring to talk and play some of the games that had been set up on the long lawn behind them. Young ladies and gentlemen played shuttlecock, while some of the older groups played skittles, with the even older, who walked with canes, watching on and shouting about how the youngsters couldn't play the game as well as them. Come with me, Catherine said in Sebastian's ear, pulling him through the crowds. Where are we going? To enact my second plan. Catherine dragged him across the terrace toward the lawn. She picked up a croquet set and thrust it into Sebastian's hands. He oomphed as she inadvertently winded him, driving the box into his stomach. Wait there. I'll be lucky to walk now, he wheezed and caught his breath, watching as Catherine went over to Elizabeth and Lord Lysel. She plainly made an invitation to Elizabeth, who nodded and parted from Lord Lysel's side. Sebastian put down the croquet set, realising Catherine might have succeeded in dividing the pair, when Lord Lysel suddenly called to them, hurrying after them. Wait, I shall join you. I do like a game of croquet. He rubbed his hands together excitedly and came to join them. Sebastian suppressed a groan as he looked at his cousin. Subtly, Catherine shrugged. At least she had attempted to part the pair. What pairs shall we play in? Sebastian tried to be at ease as he passed around the mallets, aware of the way Elizabeth's fingers brushed his own as he passed her the mallet. It made a jolt travel up his arm. Lord Lysel, would you partner me? Catherine quite expertly stood between Elizabeth and Lord Lysel. I've heard much of your skill in the game, but I'm afraid you'd have to put up with my lack of it. Sebastian bit the inside of his mouth to stop himself from laughing, he knew from experience that Catherine was quite extraordinarily good at the game. For all her clumsiness, when it came to such things as this, she had a knack few others had. It's just that she also had the habit of falling over the hoops in the ground or dropping the mallet on Sebastian's foot when they partnered one another. Yes, of course, if you insist, Lord Lysel said with politeness, though he clearly looked at Elizabeth with some discomfort as he accepted the offer. Catherine dragged him forward so they could play together first, and Sebastian took up his place beside Elizabeth. He was careful to keep a short distance between them, his nervousness now returning after she had spent so long at Lord Lyle's side. Here I thought you were going to spend the party at my side, Elizabeth whispered playfully, angling her head to look at him with that twinkle in her eye. 
Her mischief made him soften. I would have done if I could have elbowed my way in. He nodded pointedly at Lord Lysel. I think I need stronger elbows. She giggled pleasingly. Oh dear, look what I have done. Catherine struck one of the balls and sent it far away from the hoop. It seems we shall have to play over here now, my lord. She encouraged Lord Lyle to follow her, having plainly, intentionally hit the ball far away indeed. Lord Lyle looked at Elizabeth, clearly with impatience to be dragged away, then followed Catherine. It left Sebastian and Elizabeth free to step forward and take their turns. Elizabeth struck first, then Sebastian, and they made it through the hoop. Do you remember when we played this game as children? Sebastian asked. How could I forget? Elizabeth asked. I remember once I was so upset about an argument I'd had with my mother before I came, that you quite fell on your own sword, figuratively speaking. You lost spectacularly, on purpose, and let me win. I didn't realise you'd noticed that he said with a chuckle, standing and looking to the others as he waited for them to take their go from a distance. Of course I did. Elizabeth moved to stand beside him, and this time she was the one to make their arms brush. It gave Sebastian hope once again. It was kindness indeed. Why did you do it? To give me some satisfaction from the day. To see you smile, that was all, he whispered to her, his voice deep. I'd go a long way to see that smile, Elizabeth. She blinked, not saying anything more but staring up at him. It was a true confession indeed, one so heartfelt that ordinarily he would have been far too nervous to declare it. Yet after what happened in that kitchen, there was a door open between them now. It may have just been a jar, but that gap was enough to allow him to say the words. I... She seemed to struggle, unsure what to say. Yes? He prompted her on. Whoa! Look out! Lord Lysel abruptly called. A ball shot between them across the ground. Sebastian and Elizabeth were forced to scuttle apart, out of the way before the ball could hit either of their legs. Sebastian whipped around with an accusing glare to see Lord Lysel laughing, as if nothing had happened at all the way Catherine held the mallet in her hand behind his back, looking tempted to use it on something else other than Ball. It was plain she had seen the truth. Lord Lysel had done it intentionally. Well, at least we are back with the others again, Lord Lyle exclaimed as he hurried forward. What are we talking of? He offered an easy smile, but the way his eyes looked between the two of them showed Sebastian the truth. He had seen that look between Lord Lysel and Elizabeth, and he feared it. Playing croquet as children together? Elizabeth explained and avoided Sebastian's gaze once more as she took up her place to play her next turn. The next few turns passed easily enough with light conversation between them. Catherine tried more than once to sabotage her teammate and send him off around the garden, giving Sebastian a few minutes to snatch alone with Elizabeth, before they were forced back into Lord Lyle's company. Once the game came to an end, Lord Lyle shot repeated dark glares at Catherine. I apologise, my lord, Catherine said, pretending to wipe sweat from her brow. I really am so awful at this game. It is not winning that counts. Despite Lord Lyle's words, he returned the croquet mallet rather harshly to the box and turned away. Sebastian looked at his cousin with a knowing smile. I think you upset him, he whispered to her. It was worth it. She smiled. As Lord Lyle's back was turned, she lined up one last shot and fired the ball perfectly through the final hoop. It seems I suddenly know how to play the game. Sebastian laughed warmly with her. He turned to face Elizabeth, who had collected the balls together. He reached out to take them from her, thinking of the moment their fingers would brush together, when suddenly someone was between them. Sebastian stood woodenly, watching as Lord Lyle took the balls from Elizabeth and returned them to the box. 
Why is that man always in the way? Sebastian whispered as Catherine came to take his mallet from him. The path of true love never did run smooth. Who said that? Was it Shelley? Catherine asked, scrunching her nose. I believe it was Shakespeare, Sebastian answered her. Midsummer Night's Dream, where that interfering fairy runs around and tricks everyone to fall in love with the wrong people. Hmm, sounds familiar, Catherine said, pointing at Lord Lyle's back with the mallet. They shared a humoured smile, then returned to the terrace of tables, just as Clara was encouraging everyone to choose a table and take a seat, ready to eat their cakes. Sebastian and Elizabeth went to the same table, sharing a smile together. Sebastian pulled out a chair for her, eager to help her. She sat down, smiling with her thanks. Sebastian went to take the seat beside her, yet found another, standing in his way. Lord Lysel moved toward the chair, blocking Sebastian's access. Whoops, clumsy me. Catherine tripped up, apparently on nothing, and fell onto the same chair before Lord Lyle could sit down. Oh dear, I think I injured my ankle with that trip. As Elizabeth leaned forward with concern, asking how she was, Sebastian smiled, thinking his cousin was quite brilliant for orchestrating such a thing by emphasising her own clumsiness. Sebastian was able to move to the chair on Elizabeth's other side with alacrity and take it before Lord Lysel could. Plainly frustrated, Lord Lysel sat down in the last chair at the table, huffing under his breath and adjusting his tailcoat. Catherine took charge of hosting and poured tea out for them all as they discussed the game. Elizabeth was thrilled with winning, but Lord Lysel clearly was not a good loser. He glared repeatedly at Catherine. I am sorry, my lord. Catherine said, plainly noticing his dark looks, though she was unaffected by them and put on an expression of guilt. I am so shockingly bad at the game. You stood little chance. Curious, I thought you were good at the game when we were young, Elizabeth said, clearly none the wiser to the truth. The skill has abandoned me, Catherine explained as she reached for one of the maid's cakes on the table. So we saw, Lord Lyle muttered darkly. What cakes do we have here, then? Sebastian saw his chance, sat beside Elizabeth, and with her cakes before them, he had the chance to eat the cake and make his declaration, though he would have to do it in a more subtle way than previously planned, as Lord Lyle was also at the table. Unless Catherine can think of a way to distract Lord Lysel again. He looked at her with hope, but she didn't appear to notice and was distracted by eating a different cake from the selection, with chocolate crumbs on her lips and fingers. These are your Aunt Clara's, Elizabeth said, pointing to some finely made shoe pastry buns in a central platter. These are from the cook's fair hands, she gestured to a lemon cake that had been divided into tiny cubes. And these are my own attempts at baking. Well, you saw how poor I was at the attempt earlier. Having tasted the dough already, I'm sure they'll be magnificent. Sebastian winked so only she could see. There was that blush again and she leaned forward a little toward him. It was almost imperceptible and may have gone unnoticed by anyone who was not watching her as keenly as Sebastian was doing. Here, I'd be eager to hear your thoughts now they are cooked. She picked up the platter and proffered it to him. Sebastian reached for the cake, but another took it before he could. Lord Lysel snatched it away and lifted it to his own lips. For a second, everything seemed to slow down for Sebastian. He could take the second cake off the platter, but what he was all too aware of was the way that Elizabeth gazed at Lord Lyle, once more leaning forward in her chair, so far forward this time that she was in danger of falling out of it. Hmm. Lord Lysel exclaimed in delight as he took a bite. I have to say, my lady, these are exquisite. In fact, he paused and leaned forward too, resting his elbows on the table and fixing his gaze upon her. They are magnificent. I could imagine easily tasting such things forever in the pleasing company of their maker for the rest of my life. Always. Bold indeed. Sebastian stiffened, his spine feeling as if it had been replaced with a plank of wood. Always, 
Elizabeth spluttered, repeating his words. Always. Lord Lysel offered a great smile with these words and took another bite. My heart is quite taken. Sebastian looked at Catherine, who had paused with the chocolate cake still partly in her mouth. Her eyes were wide too, not just in the shock at the audacity of the words, but plainly with the same feeling that was coursing through Sebastian. Our plan is ruined. With Lord Lyle making such a declaration, after directly eating one of Elizabeth's cakes, she would think that the cakes really had worked according to Bonadea's instructions. Yet instead of Sebastian declaring himself, Lord Lysel had done so. Before Sebastian could even take one of the cakes, Elizabeth put the tray down again on the table. Her eyes were completely fixed on Lord Lyle, and she smiled at him, in the same way she had smiled at Sebastian in the kitchen. I cannot tell you what those words mean to me, my lord, she said softly across the table, as if neither Sebastian nor Catherine were there any more. Sebastian sat back, his spine rigid against the chair as he watched on with envy. Our own plan has worked against us now. She stares at Lord Lyle only, and I have become nothing but another face in this crowd. Chapter 17 Elizabeth Elizabeth was dumbstruck, staring across the table with her lips parted and her hands very still on the surface. This wasn't what she had expected, not at all. She had been convinced that when she proffered forward the cakes, Sebastian would be the one to respond. Was he not the one she had felt heated with all morning? Was he not the man who had consumed her thoughts all morning? Yet Lord Lysel had been swift in taking a cake, and now he had made such a declaration she couldn't possibly ignore it. What if I was just distracted by attraction before? Maybe that was all I felt for Sebastian, and now, now I have a chance at something more. Lord Lizzle was, after all, a very suitable, a match for her. He was older, he was well-educated indeed and extremely attentive. Yes, she should be considering him much more and abandoning any foolish fancy she had that was related to attraction. It might not be easy at times, but it had to be done. Her eyes flicked away from Lord Lyle momentarily. She looked at Sebastian, who had fallen silent, and was staring at Lord Lyle. With his head turned away, she could only see a slither of his expression, and it was impossible to read it. Attraction, maybe. Yes. That was all it was. She returned her focus to Lord Lysel, knowing now she couldn't ignore what had happened. Lord Lysel had been pointed out to her as her perfect match. She had prayed for a miracle, and Bonadea had given it to her. Before her, a man that could love her had made himself known. He was older, after all, in a good position to marry, and had been so attentive the entire morning and before this event. Well, Catherine cleared her throat. Perhaps you should have a cake too, Seb. She pushed the platter toward him, but Sebastian didn't take one from the tray. He was too busy staring at Lord Lysel, frozen to the spot. You really enjoyed the cake, my lord. Elizabeth leaned forward and addressed Lord Lysel once again. He sat back with an easy smile on his lips and nodded with a wink. Quite striking, my lady. In fact, very striking indeed. He was no longer looking at the cake, but his eyes stared at her in such a way that she understood his double meaning. Blushing, she looked down at her plate. Why do I feel more confused now? She tried to push that puzzlement away. After all, the cakes had worked. They had done what they were supposed to. Sebastian, a voice called to their table. May I borrow you for a moment? The Duke of Gordon appeared and placed a hand on his son's shoulder, standing behind him at the table. Sebastian jumped, as if he had been in a world of his own and had forgotten everything else around him. Are you well, son? Perfectly. Sebastian said tightly. 
May I talk to you? Sebastian put his napkin on the table and stood. Uncertain where to look, Elizabeth tried to fix her gaze on Lord Lyle, but her own attraction betrayed her, and more than once did she look at Sebastian as he walked away with his father. Only after he slipped out of view completely did she return her focus to Lord Lyle, who was reaching for another one of her cakes off the platter. What good fortune it was to meet you, my lady, Lord Lyle said, leaning forward and resting his elbows on the table. He took another bite. I feel our last few meetings have quite changed me. They continue to have an effect. Elizabeth smiled in such a giddy way that beside her, Catherine waved a subtle hand, trying to calm her down. Well, I... Determined to draw Lord Lysle into conversation, she ignored her friend's gesture, but she did not get far. Lord Lysle's mother approached and begged his presence. Forgive me, ladies, she said in a hurry. I must speak to my son about something. Of course. Elizabeth smiled and watched Lord Lyle stand. Before he left, he passed straight by her and brushed her arm with the back of his hand. I shall return momentarily, he promised in a husky voice. After he left, Elizabeth spun back around in her chair, facing Catherine with a sudden smile. In contrast, her friend stared at the cakes in the middle of the table, a heavy frown settling over her features. Is this not wondrous? Elizabeth asked as a giggle escaped her lips. I must confess, a part of me doubted that Bonadea's trick could work, yet I never expected it to be so conclusive. Ha! Huh. Could such a declaration be mistaken for anything else? Yes, it could. Catherine shifted in her chair and moved her focus to Elizabeth. Dropping her voice, she urged Elizabeth to lean forward so they could whisper together. Elizabeth, you must see that there is a duality in the words Lord Lysel has just uttered. You cannot be certain that he... that he... loves me? He did not say those words, Catherine's voice was tight. Yet he meant them, did he not? Elizabeth giggled again. At last I shall be free of all confusion. What of... Catherine trailed off, then gestured at the table opposite to her own at the table, the one where Sebastian had sat. He has not yet tried a cake. I know. Elizabeth paused and chewed her lip. Yet... Attraction and love are two different things, as my mother reminds me. Attraction, but Catherine looked ready to argue, but words failed her again. I cannot ignore this sign, can I? Elizabeth felt lightheaded with her excitement. She sat back in her chair and raised her tea to her lips, drinking hurriedly. It is what I have been looking for. And what do you feel for him? Catherine's voice was rather sharp. When Elizabeth looked at her, her friend's face softened. I just do not want you to be misled by an error. So what do you think of Lord Lyle? She considered the idea with thought. He was a handsome man and had good manners. In fact, there were many things that were endearing about him. He was certainly charming too with all of his compliments and kindnesses. I can learn to have an affection for him, Elizabeth said decidedly. Learn? Catherine spluttered under her breath. I do not believe love is something that has to be learned. My mother has told me often that love grows with time. Elizabeth shrugged her shoulders, seeing now that it may be no great matter. Lord Lizzle has already made himself known as a serious suitor. He intends to offer marriage, and he is in a position to do so, unlike others. Elizabeth looked at Sebastian's empty chair at the table, feeling disappointment tinging her words. She pushed it away and cleared her throat. Perhaps I was just blindsided before to the true offer that Lord Lyle is making, so concerned with other things, other people. In general, she muttered, finding it hard to look away from Sebastian's chair. My friend, please let me issue caution. 
Catherine rested her hand over Elizabeth's wrist on the table. It was a soft touch, one of a considerate friend. Let me not see you run away with idle thoughts of your heart because of this one declaration. Lord Lysel might not have meant what he said. How could he be doubted? Elizabeth pointed out, shaking her head. I thank you for your concern, and it does you credit as my friend to issue me a warning, but I'm afraid nothing could dissuade me now. I have heard it all, and I saw it with my own eyes. Lord Lysel has the capacity to be something to me no other man can, a true and devoted husband. She imagined herself walking down the aisle to meet Lord Lysel at the altar. He was certainly handsome, and that fair smile greeting her would be a wondrous thing indeed. She could be happy. The niggle in the back of her mind that urged her to look around at the pews and search out Sebastian's face bothered her, though. She was forced to push the imagining away and turn back to her friend. Bonadea has helped me, Catherine, just as I wished she could do. I cannot ignore that assistance. Oh. The sound escaped Catherine's lips, but she said no more, seeming truly speechless, which was a rarity for Catherine. What's all this? a lady asked as she walked by. It was a familiar face to Elizabeth Lady Yates, a friend from their younger days. Lady Elizabeth, who is this Bonadea? Lady Yates sat down in Sebastian's vacant seat. Forgive my nosiness, but you know me, I cannot resist an ounce of good gossip. She giggled, making the fair brown curls around her cheeks dance as she reached for a cake off the table. What a party this is, another lady declared as she sat in Lord Lyle's seat. Miss Catherine, your mother has quite excelled herself. Miss Mirabel Myers also reached for another cake. Thank you. I shall pass on your compliments, Catherine said with surprising woodenness. Elizabeth glanced at her friend, wondering what had made her so out of sorts. Quiet, Mirabel, Lady Yates said. I was just asking Lady Elizabeth for some gossip. Who is this Bonadea you spoke of? Elizabeth saw no harm in speaking of it. This lady had helped her, had given her sound advice, and now a chance at true happiness, something she had been holding out for. Bonadea is a healer and advisor, Elizabeth explained, sitting forward. Catherine abruptly dropped her cake fork. It clattered onto the side of the plate, then to the table, and bounced off onto the terrace floor. Oh, my heart! Mirabel clutched her chest, shocked by the sound. My apologies! Catherine didn't bother to retrieve the fork right away. Elizabeth, maybe it is unwise to talk of this. I do not see why. Elizabeth shrugged as Catherine picked up the fork. This lady has helped me, and I should like others to know there is someone to turn to when all seems lost. Cryptic indeed. Lady Yates wriggled in her seat as she ate a cake. You have me intrigued, Lady Elizabeth. Please go on. Elizabeth sat forward, whispering conspiratorially, as all the ladies leaned forward too in order to hear her words, all except Catherine, who deposited her cake fork on the table with a hefty thud. Catherine told me of a local healer. Her name is Bonadea, but her specialties are not just affairs of the body, but also the mind and the heart, Elizabeth said hurriedly in a quiet tone. She is someone ladies can go to talk to if they're ever in need of help. Truly? Mirabel seemed most excited by the idea. I could certainly do with some advice. My beau seems more interested in my sister at present. She rolled her eyes. I am certain that is not a good thing. Do you need another's advice to tell you it is not a good thing? Catherine asked with something of a wry smile. You know what I mean, Mirabel said hurriedly. One wishes to be certain before making such decisions. I do not think Bonadea, Catherine began, but Elizabeth cut her off. You should write to her, yes, you should. Elizabeth spoke with eagerness. After all, she had been through such turmoil for a while now. If all that confusion was about to come to an end, now she knew Lord Lyle was the gentleman for her after all, 
She wanted others to have such certainty. I shall simply have to set aside other feelings, other attractions. With the thought, she glanced across the terrace and caught sight of Sebastian talking to his father off to the side of the terrace. They seemed to be having a rather heated discussion about something. Elizabeth felt that same lurch in her stomach that she'd felt all morning in Sebastian's presence. He is not for me. She had to remind herself and returned her focus to the table. Lord knows I could do with some advice too, Lady Yates said, drawing Elizabeth's attention. My father is pushing two gentlemen toward me and I am unsure which one I should consider for a suitor. Then yes, you both must write to her, Elizabeth said eagerly. I am sure Bonadea is quite busy, Catherine explained in a rush, reaching for another cake fork and rather stabbing at the cake on her plate. We wouldn't wish to inundate her with correspondence. Nonsense. She's there to be spoken to. She was so kind in her letter to me. Encouraging, Elizabeth continued on. I'm sure she'd be happy to help. What you must do is write a letter, asking her advice, then place it in the notch of the oak tree just outside of town. She described the position of the tree exactly, where it sat on the river beyond the bridge, hidden from view by the other trees. This is wondrous, Lady Yates said hurriedly. I can think of many others who would be glad of Bonadea's help too. Catherine abruptly choked on her cake. Elizabeth looked sharply toward her, then reached forward, clapping her hand on Catherine's back to assist her as she spluttered and coughed up the cake into a napkin. Forgive me, she said with a strained voice and teary eyes. You said many others. How many? Well, Mrs Isaacs for one, would you not agree? Lady Yates appealed to Mirabel, who nodded. Yes. The poor dear is a newlywed and is feeling quite lost in many ways. I'm sure she could do with some advice, Mirabel said eagerly. There's Miss Petra Jarvis, too. Oh, yes, Petra. Lady Yates went on with even more enthusiasm than before. She has been longing for someone to talk to about her own predicament. She is suffering great heartache. She has no mother, you see. No elder sister or cousin to turn to. Friends are one thing but she closes herself off before telling us all. Someone like Bona Dea to talk to might be a blessing for her. Then yes, encourage her to write, Elizabeth said, reaching for one of her cakes with a happy smile taking up its place on her cheeks. If the lady can do half as much for others as she has done for me, then it shall be a happy result indeed. This is wonderful news, Lady Yates declared and leapt to her feet. If you would excuse me, I really must tell the other ladies. Surely there is no rush, Catherine appealed to her, but she was too late. Lady Yates hurried off with Mirabel behind her, hastening to the other tables that were surrounded by ladies. Happily, Elizabeth scraped up the cream from her cake, heartened that Bonadea could now help other ladies as much as she had helped Elizabeth. Oh, God. Catherine murmured as her shoulders slumped forward, no longer interested in her own cake, but stabbing at it repeatedly, as if it was alive and she was trying to kill it. Is all well, Catherine? Elizabeth asked. Yes, perfectly. Despite the fact she could see her friend had lied, Elizabeth could not concentrate. She looked away across the garden, and instead of searching out Sebastian's face as she had done all morning, she looked for Lord Lysel instead. He smiled at her, across the breadth of the terrace. At last I know what that smile truly means. He cares for me, more so than I ever could have realised alone. Chapter 18 Sebastian What did you say? Sebastian said with sudden rage as he followed Catherine down the streets of Wareham toward the market. When his sharp voice made a lady jump nearby, he smiled an apology, bowed his head, then hurried on. Catherine! I could not stop it, Catherine explained in a rush. It all happened so fast. One second at the garden party yesterday, Elizabeth was talking happily of how Bonadea's trick had worked. The next thing I know, she's telling all and sundry Bonadea's name and how to contact her. 
Are you mad? Sebastian caught up to his cousin and took her arm, pulling her back an inch so he at last had his cousin's focus. All night he had been lost to his anger and frustration that their plan had gone so awry. Now Elizabeth was convinced that Lord Lyle's heart belonged to her. Sebastian could see he stood little chance. Elizabeth barely looked at me for the rest of the party. It didn't seem to matter what had passed between them before that moment. The near kiss in the kitchen, all the flirtation, it had been brushed under the carpet as if it hadn't happened at all. Seb, please calm yourself, Catherine said in a rush and tore her arm out of his grasp. This is very easy to control. We must maintain the ruse if Elizabeth is not to catch wind of the trick we have pulled. So, she breathed deeply and tapped the reticle and basked in her clutches. We simply must buy some bottles for more tonics, etc., and more paper with ink for our replies to these ladies. She turned and walked on, heading to the market. Catherine, Sebastian hissed, hurrying after her again. Surely you must hear how wild this sounds. You wish me to write back to every lady in town uh, and offer advice when I am so ill-placed to do so. Why not? You responded to Elizabeth with a good heart. You are your mother's son, Seb. Maybe you are well-placed to help these ladies. You really have lost your mind. Sebastian pulled on the tendrils of his hair in frustration as he caught up with his cousin's fast pace again, heading into the town square where the market was already set up. Do stop insulting me, Seb, she said tiredly and cast a pleading look at the heavens. I'm not quite as mad as you think. Truly? Sebastian cut her off, stopping her before she could reach a stall where there were fresh inks and quills. Surely you see this is a mad thing to do. I'm in no place to help these ladies, not when I've messed up affairs of my own heart so badly that the woman I love is now about to throw herself at another man's feet. Oh yes, I'm the perfect candidate indeed for an advisor. Your wryness isn't helping. Catherine shook her head and walked around him. You forget yourself, Seb. You know heartache. That's certainly good experience for someone to write to these ladies and you know love. I'd say you are more than qualified. I am not my mother, Sebastian reminded Catherine, whispering in her ear as she purchased more ink and quills. She hastily put the items into her basket. You're her son. Catherine, Sebastian hissed as they walked on, and he struggled to stay by her side in the busy market. More than once he was forced to concede a path to a lady or gentleman walking in the other direction, before he hurriedly caught up to his cousin again. We cannot continue this. Why not? Catherine asked, looking sharply at him with a sort of innocence in her eyes. Our plan could still work. As Bonadea, you have a line of communication with Elizabeth, a way to persuade her not to marry Lord Lysel. You think I have any chance now? Sebastian stopped in the middle of the market. Catherine halted too, turning back to look at him. I conned her, Catherine and I have conned her into the arms of a man who I know is worthless. Such a man who would only ever think of her dowry. What chance do I have left? You must not give up hope, she declared and smiled broadly. Faint heart never won fair lady, and all that nonsense. Come on, we have more we need to buy. She flicked her fingers at him and walked on. And all that nonsense? He repeated her words as he trailed behind her. Yes, we're perfectly well suited to give ladies advice, aren't we? His wryness earned him another heavy glare from his cousin as she paused by a stall and purchased some glass vials for tonics. I'm beginning to wonder, Catherine, why you are going to such lengths, supposedly for me. What do you mean? she asked distractedly, picking up some of the vials and passing some money to the seller with a kindly smile. I mean that maybe this is extreme lengths for you to go to for a pair of earrings. He reminded her why she had agreed to help him in the first place. For all her childish admiration of those earrings, and the promise to borrow them, even he had to admit she was going very far in order to get them. She froze at his words and turned a heavy glare toward him. 
Oh, yes. For I am as shallow as that, am I not? She asked tartly. What? Do you think I have truly done all this for a pair of earrings? Pah! Cousin, you do not know me at all. She turned back to the cellar, purchased the glass vials, then put them in the basket and walked on with Sebastian following behind her. As strange as it may seem to you, Seb, but you are my greatest friend in all the world. I know no better man, nor a man with as good a heart as you have. So, when you believe I have done all of this to borrow your mother's earrings, think again. She hesitated and glanced back at him. I have done it for you, though little thanks I get. She walked on, leaving Sebastian to stumble in the middle of the market, his guilt raging within his chest. Catherine, I'm sorry. He hurried to chase after her to apologise properly. No time for that now. She hurriedly reached back to him. No, you're right. In all my frustration and anger, I have taken it out on you, and that was unfair. I truly am sorry. Yet he was cut off by her words. What do you not understand about keeping your lips closed, cousin? She said wildly, gesturing for him to be quiet this once. Look who is coming this way. She motioned through the market toward two ladies. Sebastian followed her gesture to see it was Elizabeth and her maid, Sarah. Stunned, he merely stared for a second, his jaw slack. Elizabeth had seen them and was walking toward them with an eager smile. It was a great contrast to the garden party the day before. By the end of it, Elizabeth seemed to have forgotten he existed. If she sees, Sebastian trailed off and nodded down at the basket. Catherine's own eyes widened as she looked into the basket full of glass vials, paper and ink. Well, it would hardly be a great leap of the imagination for her to put two and two together once she hears Bonadea is writing to every lady in town, would it? A curse escaped Catherine's lips as she tried to hide the basket behind her back. Catherine! Sebastian hissed in warning. Since when do you use such language? Since we have been tying ourselves up in knots with this ploy of ours. Quick, you talk to her and distract her. Catherine pushed him in the small of his back so he stumbled forward. Me? Sebastian asked, looking back at his cousin. It shouldn't be difficult. You are the one who claims to love her after all. Shh! Would you be quiet? Sebastian asked, looking around the market in fear that she had been overheard, but no one appeared to be looking their way. Hurry. Distract her whilst I run and hide. Catherine offered a wave to Elizabeth, then darted off between the stalls, taking her basket with her. Sebastian strode forward, purposefully blocking the view of where Catherine had gone. When Elizabeth reached him, he bowed to her in greeting, remembering formality. She smiled to see him too. It was warm, but her cheeks did not colour in a blush, as they had done when they were in the kitchen together. There is a barrier between us once again. Sebastian, how are you? she asked. Where is Catherine running off to? She has gotten herself into a pickle, Sebastian said hurriedly, uncertain where he was going with this lie. She's hurrying to find a privy. Oh, poor dear. Elizabeth exchanged an uncertain look with her maid beside her. Sebastian bowed to the maid too and greeted her with a smile. How are you, Miss Sarah? he asked. I am well, thank you, my lord. She seemed startled to have been remembered at all. I must pick up some supplies, if you would excuse me. She curtsied and walked off to the nearest stall with her own basket. Sebastian stared at Elizabeth for a second, desirous to talk to her, but uncertain what to say after the mess of the day before. Should he talk of their near kiss, all the flirtation? Or maybe Lord Lyle? The latter thought merely darkened his mood further. I was sorry to miss your company so much yesterday at the garden party, Sebastian said and gestured forward, silently motioning for them to explore the market together. She fell into step easily beside him, 
her head turned toward him in such a way that wasn't helping his attraction to her. It felt greater than before, frustratingly so. He pulled at his cravat, trying to loosen the sudden heat he felt around his neck. I would have liked to have spent more time beside you. He attempted to flirt with her again, as he had done the day before, but to his shock, she laughed. He froze, pretending interest in a stall beside them that served freshly made loaves of bread. Perhaps I am no good at this flirting thing. A dark thought entered his mind, that maybe his attempts were childlike in comparison to the smooth flirtations of an older man like Lord Lyle. Well, it was an eventful party, Elizabeth said, stopping at his side as her laughter faded. So much seemed to happen. Yes, it did, Sebastian's voice was tight. You seemed very concerned with Lord Lyle's company. Oh. Elizabeth's smile flattened a little as Sebastian looked at her. I take it that you are very concerned with his attention now, Sebastian said, his voice soft as he looked at her, trying to show he meant no harm by breaching this subject with her. Well, he is very attentive, Elizabeth pointed out, though her thoughts escaped her in a rush, as if there was a nervousness behind them. He has made it plain to me that he is a serious suitor, that he would consider marriage, and that he cares for me truly. She smiled, so fully that the guilt swelled in Sebastian's breast. I have led her to this misapprehension. What a fool I am. Has he declared a love for you? Sebastian, that is bold indeed to ask. She laughed off his words once more, but glanced around as if seeking out her maid. The time in the kitchen felt like a dream to Sebastian now. She wasn't looking at him, but elsewhere. I wonder what it meant to her. Did she like me at all in those moments, or was she merely caught up in the excitement? I ask because I am your friend. Sebastian struggled to say that word alone, but the depth of his voice must have captured her attention for she turned back to look at him. Her smile had faltered, and for the first time that day he felt as if she was truly looking at him, truly hanging on to his words. I would not wish to see you hurt, Elizabeth. Not by any man. I can He broke off, fearful of confessing how he felt. He cleared his throat and managed to say something in the end, though the meaning was not the same. I am concerned for you. You need not be. She smiled again, then stepped forward and laid a hand on his arm. That touch meant everything, and made his stomach lurch in excitement, but it was plain now that she did not mean to flirt with him. It was a comforting gesture on her part. You are a good friend indeed, Sebastian, but do not worry yourself on my account. I know now, with certainty after yesterday, that Lord Liesel considers me with seriousness. He is not a man who is shallow or purely interested in my dowry. No, he is something else entirely. That is what I have been hoping for. My lady, Sarah called from across the market and tapped a small pocket watch she carried. I must go, Elizabeth said, and lowered her hand from Sebastian's arm. With that touch leaving him, a coldness returned to his being, consuming him. Fear not for me, Sebastian. All will be well now. I am certain of it. Even though she smiled and waved in parting, he could not summon the same happiness. He nodded instead and thought back to the moment he had seen Lord Liesel striding into her house with her mother hastening at his side, like a lapdog eager for attention. Lord Liesel had stridden in with confidence and, quite frankly, demanded attention. He was not humble nor kind in his suit of Elizabeth, but expectant. It led Sebastian in every way to believe that Lord Liesel did not care for Elizabeth as he did, but that Lord Liesel thought of Elizabeth's position and her dowry. Well a voice asked, making him jump in surprise. It was Catherine's voice who had quietly crept up on him again and stopped beside him. How did your conversation go? Ill, ill indeed, Sebastian whispered, for her ears only. You have your wish, Catherine. I cannot give up now. Truly? 
Catherine looked at him, a smile tugging at her lips. I'll be damned if I'm going to see Elizabeth marry a man that does not love her. Chapter 19 Elizabeth He's here, dear. He's here. Miranda fussed around Elizabeth as she darted away from the window of the house. She fluffed the loose curls that hung down from Elizabeth's updo, making them sit perfectly beside her chin. Then she squeezed Elizabeth's cheeks, bringing more colour to them. Mother, I am a lady, not a child, Elizabeth pleaded, trying to bat her mother away. You need more colour, dear. I'm perfectly fine. Elizabeth sat back in an armchair far away from her mother. If Lord Lyle is here to see me and intends to court me, then I dare say he will like me even if I am a little pale. She knew exactly why she was pale, though she had no wish to talk of it, for she had barely slept the last few nights. Each time she fell asleep she suffered confusing dreams, both of Lord Lyle and of Sebastian. Uncertain what to make of them, she told no one about them, not even Sarah. You know what I mean, dear. Miranda still leaned down and pinched Sarah's cheeks again. Capturing a man's interest is one thing, but persuading him to court you, even marry you, well, that's another. One must be fair to the eye as well as his mind. Come on, now do this. Miranda pressed her lips together, making them redder. Reluctantly, Elizabeth copied her actions, though her mother's words dwelled on her mind. Miranda crossed the room and picked up some embroidery, pretending to be interested in it as they heard doors closing in the distant regions of the house as Lord Lyle was shown in. Elizabeth thought of what her mother had said, how capturing a man's interest and marrying were two separate things entirely. It made it sound as if talking with a man was all a game, as if there was nothing natural in it at all, but deception and full of trickery. Her spine slumped with the thought, until the door opened and Lord Lysel stepped into the room accompanied by her father. He is my perfect match. Bonadea showed me that. Eagerly she smiled at Lord Lyle and curtsied, warmed as he turned to her and smiled too, offering a deep bow. Is it not good of Lord Lyle to come and see us again? Her father said with eagerness. I have arranged for tea to be brought for us all. How lovely, Miranda said, and spoke to her husband, pulling him to the side of the room for their own conversation. It left Elizabeth quite alone beside Lord Lysel, something she suspected was her mother's aim. Though strangely she did not mind today. She took advantage of the situation and gestured for Lord Lysel to sit beside her. If he is my perfect match, then it is time I threw myself into this attachment. Maybe if I just give him more of my focus I could find in Lord Lysel's heart what I have not seen before. I am glad to see you again, my lord. Elizabeth said, sitting beside him. As I am you. The garden party was one thing, he explained, leaning toward her, but there I must share you with a crowd. Forgive me for being bold, but I rather like having you to myself. She giggled at his words, and they were forced to sit back from one another as tea was brought into the room. Lord Lysel's leg brushed hers as he moved back, and she expected there to be some jolt of excitement to feel some of the attraction that she had felt when she had leaned towards Sebastian in the kitchen before the garden party. Abruptly she was back there in that kitchen, talking and laughing with Sebastian. She felt that excitement twirling in her stomach, the flutter of her heart as he had leaned toward her and she'd closed her eyes, waiting for that kiss. Are any of these cakes yours today, my lady? Lord Lysel asked. Startled, remembering where she was, Elizabeth cleared her throat and shifted her focus to Lord Lyle. Not today, she said softly, gesturing to the cakes on the silver tray between them. Her parents wandered over to make their tea, but then retreated to the other side of the room again, leaving Elizabeth alone but chaperoned from a distance with Lord Lyle. She poured tea for the two of them, smiling at him, holding on to the hope that at some point there would be a breakthrough and she would feel that excitement she had known with Sebastian again, but here. Yet, 
I can vouch for my cook's excellent skills. Please help yourself. Thank you. He took one of the cakes and ate hungrily but said nothing more. Elizabeth stared at him as she lifted her teacup to her lips, realising that she had little to say to him. Determined to change things, she leaned forward, searching for a subject matter. How are you enjoying the season, my lord? she asked. Very well, he nodded. It is an entertaining season indeed, especially as I've been blessed with such fortunate company. The way his eyes lingered on her gave her hope. She supposed her cheeks should have heated with a blush, but they did not. My father was very eager for me to make the most of this season, so I have endeavoured to do so. So far there is not an event I have not attended. Ah, do you feel pressure from your father too? she asked playfully, leaning toward him and suspecting that this was something they could share in common. I feel the expectations of my father weigh heavily on my shoulders. Yes, fathers can have that habit of reminding you to a great extent of their expectations, but my father is a good man just as your own is. He gestured toward her father across the room, who clearly had no knowledge he was being spoken of, as he talked with Miranda. He sings your praises a lot, my lady. Yes, that is also what fathers do, she said with mischief, even if those praises are not always deserved. I'm sure in your case they are. You are very kind. They seem to have run their course with this particular conversation. Elizabeth raised her teacup to her lips and took a big gulp, noting that Lord Lyle did the same thing. She wondered if, like her, he was doing it to buy time as they tried to think of something to say to one another. Do you like reading, my lord? Elizabeth asked, alighting on another subject matter. I read, he smiled with the words, yet I read mostly the business accounts and such forth. I do not have much time for these great novels that pretend to be something magnanimous adding something more to the world. He laughed as if he found the idea quite preposterous. Oh, you are not fond of fiction. She shifted in her seat, startled by the words. What of the theatre? She had been only a few times to the local theatre in town and had loved each one, laughing loudly at the farces and weeping at the old Shakespeare tragedies. It was certainly an enjoyment she did not wish to be without in her life. I prefer shooting. Lord Lysel said succinctly, and sat back in his chair, looking completely at ease, as if this was his house. Nothing quite like the kill. Oh, I see. Elizabeth looked down at her teacup, stunned by his words. It was hardly unusual for a gentleman to enjoy shooting, but to articulate the reason why he enjoyed it so plainly made her ill at ease. Once more... She lifted the teacup to her lips and took a rather long and heavy gulp, delaying before she had to speak again. Deciding it was his turn to come up with a topic of conversation, she waited with her teacup returned to the saucer in her lap. Yet even as she looked at him expectantly, he said nothing. He merely just sat there, smiling back at her. I am sure it is not supposed to feel like this. Surely conversation between me and my perfect match should be easier than this. Well, do you have any news, my lord? Anything to share? She said, trying to hide a note of desperation in her voice as she topped up her teacup, for she had nearly finished it completely already. Not a lot. He shrugged, his evasiveness frustrating her further. Yet I must confess the thrill of being by your side again. Had there been a storm this morning, I would have ridden to see you anyway. Oh, well. She struggled to know what to say. His flirtation was charming, but it seemed to be the only conversation he could make with her. Was he able to choose any other subject with great alacrity? You are too kind, my lord. As always. When they fell silent again, they both lifted their teacups to their lips and drank in unison. Elizabeth had a feeling that the teapot would not have much left in it for long. After some time, Lord Lysel stood to take his leave. He retrieved Elizabeth's hand from her empty teacup 
and kissed the back, lingering there for a second. Yet the lips felt cracked against her skin, despite his handsome countenance. And the whole time he kissed her hand, she pictured another. She imagined Sebastian was there. She thought of him picking up her hand and kissing the back, then his hazel eyes meeting hers over the top of his hand. Sebastian. She was breathless at the picture in her mind, even more so when that picture changed and she thought of Sebastian and her together in that kitchen, though this time in her imagining they were not interrupted. She thought of what it could have been like to kiss Sebastian, to feel his lips against her own. I wish you a good day. Lord Lysel released her hand. And you. She hurried to curtsy and turned her back on him, hoping he would not see her blush and wonder why it was so sudden, when in truth it had had nothing to do with him at all. She sought refuge by the window, choosing to look out across the grounds in an effort to distract herself. What is wrong with me? If Lord Lyle is the man for me, why can I not stop thinking of Sebastian? Elizabeth, is something wrong? Miranda asked, coming to stand beside her. No. Nothing is wrong. Elizabeth's attention was caught by Lord Lysel and her father as they said goodbye to one another. When it comes to the dowry, Lord Lyle whispered in a quiet voice, though Elizabeth heard it nevertheless. Ah, yes. Let us discuss the details. Her father put a hand around Lord Lyle's shoulder and steered him out of the room. My dowry. Elizabeth muttered sharply, then turned her head toward her mother. That look must have been a harsh one, for Miranda was startled and reached for the pearl necklace around her throat. Something is indeed wrong. What is it? Miranda asked with concern. Lord Liesel asked after my dowry. Elizabeth gestured to the two retreating figures they could just see through the door, heading down the hallway. Yes, dear. Miranda sighed with plain exasperation and sat in the window seat in front of Elizabeth. It is quite normal when a gentleman is considering asking a lady to court. If I am not mistaken, he considers asking you to court before the next ball. Or perhaps he will wait and do it at the ball. Will that not be exciting? Yes, very exciting, Elizabeth said tightly, looking out to the garden over her mother's head. There was something about the way Lord Lysel had asked about the dowry that bothered her. Yes, she supposed it was natural, but surely it shouldn't have been important to Lord Lyle. I thought Lord Lyle was fond of me, not my dowry. Even if he is fond of you, dear, the dowry is important, Miranda said with a wave of her hand. If, Elizabeth spluttered, glancing down at her mother, you do not know. Only you can answer if he is fond of you, dear. Miranda seemed unperturbed by the idea. Has he not been attentive? Yes, very. He said such things that should make a lady swoon. She chewed her lip, considering the declarations he had made at the garden party. Then what is it that concerns you so? Miranda asked, leaning forward. He is just discussing the particulars with your father if he wishes to court you. He's being practical, that is all. Yes, I suppose so. Yet Elizabeth backed up from the window, so out of sorts that she suddenly found it impossible to stand still. If you would excuse me, I have a sudden headache. I think I need a lie down. Oh, I'm sorry to hear that, Miranda stood hurriedly. Do you need anything? No, thank you, Elizabeth called the words back over her shoulder as she practically ran from the room and hurried up the stairs. She caught sight of Lord Lyle and her father standing in the doorway, talking together, their heads bent rather conspiratorially. She feared what they talked of now, probably the details of her dowry, right down to the last penny and shilling. Escaping to her chamber, she flung herself inside, only to find Sarah was in the room. The poor maid leapt surprised as the door shut harshly. She dropped the bedsheets she had been changing. My goodness! Sarah clutched a hand to her heart. You did give me a fright. I'm so sorry, Sarah. I just had to get away. Elizabeth paced for a minute as Sarah collected the sheets. 
her heart would not settle as her mind darted between Lord Lyle and Sebastian. She should be confident by now, she knew that. She'd had the assurance from Bonadea's cakes that she needed. Then Sebastian kissing her hand entered her mind again, and she knew she could not be still. Oh, this is hopeless. She flung herself down into the nearest chair. What is wrong? Sarah dropped the sheets again, but this time willingly and hurried to her side. Would you be so kind as to bring me some paper, ink and a quill, please, Sarah? Elizabeth asked. I feel there is someone I must write to. Of course. Sarah hurried off to fetch the required things as Elizabeth drummed her fingers on the table, weighing up her options. Bonadea had offered sound advice before when she felt so lost. But now Elizabeth needed some new advice. Things had changed, that couldn't be denied, and though Bonadea's way might have worked, that didn't mean Elizabeth couldn't have misunderstood Lord Lyle's words. There has to be a reason for my crazed mind, she muttered to herself. There has to be a reason as to why I think of him. She trailed off as Sebastian entered her mind again. Chapter 20 Sebastian. Seb! Seb! Catherine's voice rang through the house. Yes, Sebastian said, not bothering to look up from the letter he was working on. You'll find me in the study, surrounded by letters. He broke off from his letter, the ink staining his fingertips, just as Catherine bustled through the door. She practically fell against the doorframe in her swiftness, so eager to find him. She still had her bonnet on, and a Spencer jacket was halfway down her arms. The poor butler had raced after her and was now doing his best to thread her out of the jacket. Oops, I'm so sorry. She got into a fumble with the jacket and ended up dropping the jacket to the floor where the butler hastened to pick it up for her. Oh, thank you. Forgive me. I seem to be all in a tither today. The butler smiled and gestured to the bonnet she had forgotten. She took it off her head and tossed it toward the butler. He caught it through the air, though he had to snatch it to stop it from colliding with a marble bust that stood atop a plinth in the corner of the room. Sebastian ended up dripping fresh ink onto one of his letters, for he had sat very still with his lips parted, waiting for the impending crash. Thank you, Sebastian said to the butler, who smiled and hurried off again, leaving them alone. Sebastian dropped his quill and pushed his sleeves up past his elbows. You do not look well, cousin, Catherine said, moving to stand beside him. Do I not? What a surprise. Sebastian threw his hands in the air. Look at me, Catherine. Look at the state I'm in. He'd caught a glimpse of himself in a mirror just a few minutes ago. His hair was standing on end from where he'd pulled on the tendrils that many times, and his shirt sleeves were ragged. He couldn't even remember where his tailcoat was, for he'd thrown it off and left it somewhere. It's all these letters. He gestured to the mound beside him. It's madness. I do not think I realise just how many ladies there were in this town, let alone how many needed help. Ah! Catherine began, fiddling with a satchel bag she had under her arm. What do you mean, ah? Sebastian asked, repeating the sound she had made. When Catherine looked down at the satchel under her arm, he pointed at it. Do not tell me you have more letters for Bonadea in there. Then I shall not tell you. I shall just show you instead. Catherine unbuckled the satchel and upended it. A myriad of letters fell onto the desk beside him. They landed in a perfect pile except one that dropped to the floor. Catherine picked it up and gingerly placed it on top of the pile where it balanced precariously. Catherine, I know. She threw her hands over her cheeks and backed off. This has rather gotten out of hand, has it not? Just a little, he gestured to the two piles of letters now on the desk. I'm expected to reply to all these ladies, and I'm telling you, Catherine, I'm certain I am a poor adviser. I am sure you are not. Though Catherine wrung her hands together as she plopped down into the nearest armchair, hardly convincing Sebastian that she disagreed with him. Listen to this. Sebastian snatched up one of the letters he'd been on working on a reply to. 
This is from a Miss Mirabelle. This seemed to get Catherine's attention, who leaned forward, practically falling out of her armchair. She talks of how the man that has been courting her this last year seems to have miraculously turned his attentions toward her sister. She asks for advice. And what have you said? Catherine asked with eagerness. At least there, the advice is obvious. Sebastian shook his head and dropped the letter, watching it drift down to the desk like a falling autumnal leaf. It's plain in the tone of her letter that she knows her suitor no longer cares for her. But rather than following her heart, she's listening to the expectations of her father who wishes her to marry before the end of the season. Sound familiar? Sebastian then pushed forward a number of letters that he had sorted into a separate pile. I cannot tell you the number of letters here that concern a lady's fears of what their parents expect in their match. It seems it's a common problem indeed, one I did not give much thought to before. He thrust a hand into his hair and pulled on the locks. Reading of everything these ladies have said, their fears, I feel I understand Elizabeth much more. No wonder she feels such stress at her father's plea for her to marry when so many other young ladies feel backed into a corner to marry the wrong man entirely. I'd say you are having a glimpse into ladies' hearts, cousin, Catherine said, her voice soft and wistful. It is a privileged position. Privileged? Or laden with responsibility? He snatched up another letter he had been reading that morning. This poor woman here, I hardly know what to say to her. Who is it from? A Mrs. Isaacs. Sebastian unfurled the letter and read it aloud, aware now that Catherine truly did fall out of her chair in her effort to hear every word. Dear Bonadea, I hardly know what to write, but I am in desperate need of advice. I am a newlywed, young indeed, and I confess I am not happy. I have married a man who is much older than me, and though he promised before we were wed to love me, it seemed the moment the ring was on my finger. Such promises have paled away. My husband spends little time in the house at all and less time with me. He is more interested in his fine collections that he builds in this great house than in talking to me. After spending so long being told that my marriage is everything, I do not know what to think or feel or how to be happy, now knowing that my husband doesn't love me as he once claimed to. Sebastian broke off his heart cracking for the poor writer of this letter. Goodness! Catherine looked rather tearful as she sat back in the armchair once more. I know Mrs Isaacs. She's a good woman. She is but a year younger than you. Is she? Sebastian found this news made his heart ache even more. What will you say to her? I have thought of that long and hard. He looked over the notes beside him that he'd made nervous that what he had to say might be unwise. He had little worldly experience when it came to such things. Taking on the role of Bona Dea to speak to these young ladies about their woes felt like a betrayal. Well, Catherine said with eager expectation, what will you say? I plan to say this. Sebastian picked up his notes and read from them. I wish to point out to her that happiness in life does not come from marriage alone, and indeed some people can lead very happy lives even when their marriage is one without love. If she has been taught that marriage is the point of her being, then I'm sorry indeed for it. Love can enrich one's life, but it is not the be-all and end-all. If her husband has such pastimes as these collections, then I will urge her to find her own passions to explore and throw herself into. What's more, I will urge her to dedicate her life to her friends, for those are the ones who will truly bring her smiles. There is no reason to believe Mrs Isaacs would be without love forever. Indeed, sometimes couples can grow to love one another, or at least have a companionship, a respect, and such things come with time. I hope to assure her that though she may not be happy now, tomorrow, and the day after that, and the day after that are all new days, you never know what will come up with the rising of the next sun. He put down the notes onto the table, staring at them for a few minutes as he considered how to put ink to paper.
to phrase such things. That's truly beautiful, Seb. Catherine's words snatched his attention away. Stunned, he sat back in his chair, seeing that Catherine was even more tearful than before. She sniffed and looked down at her lap, fiddling with the hem of her gown. I'm sorry, Catherine, I did not mean to make you sad, he said in a rush. On the contrary, you did not. She smiled and sniffed a final time, blinking away her tears that had made her eyes glisten. If you write such a letter to Mrs. Isaacs, then I can easily say, with my hand on my heart, you will give her hope for a better life. What more can any of us wish for than that? See? You truly are Bonadea's son. Do not remind me. He hung his head down on the desk and tapped it there in reprimand to himself. The true Bonadea, I do not doubt, would despair of what I am doing. What does she think you are doing right now? My mother and father are out for the day, which has made hiding all this. He waved a hand at the letters as he sat straight. So much easier. Thank goodness. Catherine wiped her eye where a tear threatened to fall and leaned back in her armchair. Well, you are doing a fine job, Seb. He was not so convinced and shook his head, staring at the fresh pile Catherine had delivered. I cannot keep up with this, he said eventually, his voice deep. Why ever not? Catherine abruptly moved to her feet and scampered across the room. She tripped on the edge of the study rug, in danger of falling over, but fortunately planted her hands on the side of the desk and stopped herself from falling, though she also incidentally knocked some of the letters off the desk. Sebastian hurried to collect them for her. You are doing good work here, Sebastian. It is not just that. It is all the lying, pretending to be someone I'm not. How do you think these poor women would feel if they knew who was really writing to them? The mere thought made him shudder. I am sure they do not mind that when the advice is so sound, she gestured to the letters as he dropped the last ones back onto the desk. This has gotten out of hand. He shook his head. This may have started as a ruse, but look at it now. It's a mess. He gestured to the letters. I am not helping Elizabeth either. No, Catherine, I must stop. Wait, I think I have something that will change your mind. She rummaged in the letters. Nothing will change my mind, especially not you making this study even more of a mess than it already was. He motioned to the way she knocked letters to the floor again, and he hurried to pick them up, flattening them, when he feared some lady's letters might be crumpled with Catherine's actions. Here, look. You see the handwriting? Catherine pushed a letter in front of him. It's from Elizabeth. Quickly, read it. Sebastian took it from Catherine's hands, feeling his heart ache and thud a little harder when he read Elizabeth's words. Dear Bonadea, I have to thank you for the help you gave me before, but I must confess to some confusion and a feeling of being lost now. The cakes worked as you intended. After a suitor tried one, he as good as confessed himself devoted to me, inferring that he wished to spend his life at my side. It was everything I could have hoped for, except perhaps the gentleman that said it. The gentleman has been most attentive and kind. He is a handsome man, older and ready to marry, and he has his own position and title that pleases my parents greatly. It's true that on paper everything seems right about this suitor, as if fate has brought us together and everything should be perfect, yet there is something wrong. When I am with him, there is no excitement. When we talk, it is stilted, and I sometimes struggle with conversation. I now know what it is like to feel excitement and attraction in a gentleman's company, to be on the brink of something more, so full of hope. Sebastian broke off from reading, feeling at once he knew what she was talking about. Elizabeth wrote of their moment together in the kitchen, when they had been so close to kissing. Yet it seems that hope is to go unanswered, for your cakes have pointed me toward a man who I feel none of this excitement with. My mother assures me that this suitor is a good fit for me, that I will be comfortable with him and happy. But is there a way to be certain? I know it is a lot to ask when I have already come to you for advice. But if there was something more I could do, 
another way to be absolutely certain that I have chosen the right gentleman. I'd be incredibly grateful to know it. I fear going to church someday and finding myself married to a man who I will never be able to speak easily with, who I will never be as attracted to as I am with another. Sebastian's hold tightened on the letter, hoping with everything in him that when she spoke of attraction, she spoke of him. Pray, write back when you can. I am in much need of your advice. Your friend, Elizabeth. Well, Catherine asked as he put down the letter. What did she say? She needs help. He reached for his quill on impulse, fiddling with it between his fingers. Ah, I cannot let her do this without saying something. What if I am right and Lord Lyle is only interested in her dowry? Then Elizabeth will wake up one day and be as sad as poor Mrs. Isaacs is now. I cannot sit by and let that happen. I cannot do it. Excellent. Catherine collected a chair and bustled with it across the room, planting it down heavily at Sebastian's side. What shall we write to her in reply? Let us make it a better idea this time, one that Lord Lysel cannot interfere with. Chapter 21 Elizabeth Elizabeth, Lord Lyle is here. Miranda reached over to Elizabeth and adjusted the curls that hung down by her cheeks. Elizabeth brushed her mother off, but it was rather like trying to waft away a fly as her mother just kept returning to her task. Mama, I am perfectly fine, Elizabeth insisted and stood moving away from her mother's attentions. Dearest, you seem quite out of sorts. Is everything well? Miranda's voice was level, suggesting a certain amount of disinterest despite her question. Elizabeth chose not to answer as she reached the window and peered out at the drive. Lord Lysel had indeed arrived. He descended from his carriage with ease and looked up at the building. He stayed there for at least a minute, gazing at the building as if examining it and taking in every detail. Why is he not hurrying to the door if he loves me? Why gaze at the house so much? Elizabeth chewed her lip as more and more questions entered her mind about Lord Lyle's behaviour. Without a reply from Bonadea as of yet, she did not know what to think. Lord Lysel entered the house at last, but still, Elizabeth did not move away from the window. She looked out to the horizon instead, finding her thoughts wandering. Sebastian's house was out there, beyond the hills, and she wondered what he was doing this evening. Was he with his father, planning the much-talked-of grand tour? Ah, Lady Elizabeth, Lord Lyle's voice reached her. Retreating from the window, Elizabeth turned around and moved towards Lord Lyle. His handsome smile struck her, and her heart fluttered, giving her hope that perhaps she had made the right choice. She hurried toward him, rather hoping he would take her hand, kiss it, do something to show some affection. Instead, he bowed to her, reminding her to curtsy. How are you this evening? he asked. Yet his eyes were elsewhere as he asked the question. He looked instead at her parents that were collecting drinks from a nearby cabinet full of carafes. I am well, and you. Elizabeth said the words rather woodenly, finding that fluttering sensation calming hurriedly. Yes, he said, plainly not having actually paid attention to what words she used. When her father returned, offering two glasses of wine to the pair of them, Lord Lysel moved to stand at her side, but addressed her father with questions. How fares your business, Lord Grey? I understand you are much engaged with the trade from the ports at present. Indeed I am. Her father was so delighted to be asked such a question that he launched into a story about his latest business deal. Elizabeth smiled and laughed at the appropriate moments, but when their discussion fell onto the details of the business arrangement, she felt quite lost. She listened attentively, but frequently looked at Lord Lyle beside her. He topped up her glass when it was needed and placed a hand to her arm at one point, an almost caring touch, but beyond that, he did not look her in the eye or engage. It is as if my father's conversation matters so much more. When they were called for dinner, 
Elizabeth's arm was taken by Lord Leal, and he escorted her to the dining room, even pulling out her chair for her as a true gentleman would. She smiled up at him, warmed by his attentions. But once more, he sat in his chair and did not look at her again, for he was captivated about the discussion of business. The whole dinner passed in much the same way, with Elizabeth barely making a mark on the conversation at all. When dinner finished, and it was time for Elizabeth and her mother to retire from the room, they left Lord Lysel behind with her father, the two of them leaning toward one another to speak eagerly of potential future business deals between them. Well, enough of this face, Miranda said, gesturing to Elizabeth's expression as soon as the door was closed behind them. I beg your pardon, Elizabeth muttered in surprise. Look at you. It is as if you have eaten a sour lemon. Miranda rushed to light candles from tinderboxes and encouraged Elizabeth to spread them around the room now that darkness had fallen. Once the parlour was flooded with small yellow flames, she sat down by the window, finding herself looking out at the horizon again. What is wrong? Miranda asked impatiently as she sat near to Miranda, nursing a pork glass between her hands. It is just... Elizabeth struggled to put it into words as she looked at the closed dining room door. She feared sounding selfish. After all, was it not demanding of her to wish her beau to come here and give all his attention to her? Yes, that would be mad to insist. Yet a little attention would not have been bad. I guess I fear that perhaps Lord Lyle's intentions to court me are not quite because of who I am. After all, what has he spoken of all night? Money, Elizabeth said simply. Her mother rolled her eyes. Mother, I pray you, do not roll your eyes at me as if I am a child. You are no child, but those childish fantasies are back. Miranda leaned forward and lowered her voice. Sometimes marriages happen because of reasons other than love, dearest. It is no bad thing, and Lord Lysel is a good match for you. I know, you have said it before. Elizabeth sipped her own port, finding she took little comfort in her mother's words. When the door to the dining room opened, she was resolved to try something, to discover truly what was in Lord Lyle's heart. As he entered the room, she caught his eye and subtly beckoned him to join her at the window. To her frustration, he dawdled by her father's side a little longer yet. They concluded their discussion of business before Lord Lysel eventually crossed the room toward her and sat in the window seat. When his leg brushed hers, she looked down at that touch. Should she not tremble at such a touch? Should her heart be fluttering? At least her cheeks had warmed. That was a good sign. I just wanted a chance to talk with you openly, my lord, she whispered, leaning toward him and checking her parents were now absorbed in their own conversation across the room. Of course. He smiled, that usual charming smile that could put her at ease. You have been so kind to me as of late, so complimentary. Forgive me, but... She swallowed, feeling sudden nerves as she fiddled with her port glass. I was wondering when these feelings first started on your part. If words be the fruits of love, to change the old phrase a little, then please, do speak of it. His lips parted a little, as if in surprise, then he smiled and leaned toward her. It was a charming look indeed, one so pleasant that she leaned toward him. I have been an admirer of yours since the first ball of the season, Elizabeth. Do not doubt that. He took her hand and lifted it to his lips, kissing it quickly. Then he released her hand, and it dropped down to her lap again. The movement was hurried, without much affection or time taken about it. He never said the word love. What if he doesn't? What if he does not love me at all? Let us ask Lord Lysel, he will know, her father suddenly declared across the room. Lord Lysel, what of your father's business as of late? 
Lord Lysel stood from beside Elizabeth and walked away. Once he'd gone, she felt strangely cold in the seat, despite the heat in the room. Rather than endeavouring to draw Lord Lysel into conversation again, she looked out of the window, chewing on her lip as her eyes danced across the horizon, and she thought of another in this county. One who up to the moment Lord Lyle had tasted her cakes, she had thought much about indeed. Sebastian. Elizabeth, it is time to say goodbye, dearest. Miranda's words drew her attention back to the moment. She smiled and stood, realising that in her mind's wanderings she had spent many minutes staring out of the window, her thoughts on Sebastian. She had thought of the yellow roses he had gifted her, their meeting again in the market, and of course those moments in the Aldington's kitchen with him when they had moved toward one another, so close to a kiss. Elizabeth brushed the thoughts from her mind and followed her mother and father to say goodbye to Lord Lissell. She stood in the doorway and let him kiss the back of her hand, though he did it as hurriedly as he'd done before, and offered one brief smile before walking to the carriage. As he left, Elizabeth hovered on the doorstep. Ah, young love, Miranda mused, staying by Elizabeth's side as a wind bristled up the drive and made them both shiver. Her father retreated into the house, calling to the butler to thank him for arranging a wonderful evening. Love, hmm, Elizabeth muttered, turning her head sharply to look at her mother. I see no proof of love, mother. None. Goodness, do you need proof? How demanding, Miranda said with plain scorn. No, I do not mean to sound so selfish. It is merely that I am concerned. Elizabeth fixed her focus on her mother. What if Lord Lyle's pursuit of me is more about money and business after all? Mother, even you must admit that a gentleman who was interested in courting me might have actually spoken to me at some point this evening. He did speak to you when I beckoned him to. Not before or after, Elizabeth reminded her mother. I am tired of such conversations. Her mother looked to the heavens as if pleading for help. Enough of this, Elizabeth. It must be accepted by you that love does not always come before marriage. It's only through companionship and time together that many couples fall in love or even develop a deep respect for one another. Desist with your wish for the ground to shake beneath you and lightning to strike. Life is not a romantic Shakespeare play. Believe me. Miranda muttered, looking suddenly uncomfortable as she glanced into the house, her eyes following the path her husband had just taken. Love is something different to what you think. She retreated fast, before Elizabeth could have a chance to complain or discuss the matter any further. Something is wrong, Elizabeth whispered to herself after her mother's retreat, knowing that despite everything Miranda had said, Lord Lyle's behaviour was not what she had been expecting. I pray you, Bonadea, reply to me soon. She sighed and tipped her head backward, looking up at the moon and stars above her. I'm in much need of some good advice. She tried to focus on Lord Lysel, smiling when she thought of his handsome smile. Then she imagined another standing beside her on the front step of the house. She imagined Sebastian was there, his arm brushing her own, and that smile grew greater still. Chapter 22 Elizabeth Elizabeth raised her wrist to her nose and inhaled. The orchid perfume had a sweet scent unlike anything she had ever worn before. With the scent surrounding her, she stepped into the ball, hurrying in rather eagerly. Well, I'm relieved to see whatever objections you had last night have since left you, Miranda said, hurrying to keep up with her. It seems you are impatient to see your suitor tonight. Perhaps I am, Elizabeth confessed, but said no more. She shrugged off her pelisse and fiddled with her dance card as she waited for entry to the ballroom. She was greeted by her hosts before she led the way into the grand room, with her mother following behind her. Do slow down. My old legs cannot work as fast as yours, Miranda pleaded, breathing deeply as she caught up with Elizabeth in the middle of the room. My apologies. 
Elizabeth said, looking around the room in search of two faces. The room had been dressed grandly in great swathes of cloth and silk. Coloured white and sky blue, the whole appearance was as if the ballroom danced in the clouds of a sunny day. With the myriad of candles flickering with yellow flames, it was as if rays of sunshine shone between the cloths. Some framed the tables full of towering crystal ware, and others surrounded the dance floor, making it seem as if the dancers were cocooned within their own clouds. Goodness, is it not beautiful? Miranda said, gushingly, lifting a fan to her face and fluttering to cool down in the heat. Yes, it is, Elizabeth said distractedly, still searching for two faces beneath those cloths. She'd had a reply from Bonadea at last earlier that day. It was a sweet letter indeed, truly kind, where Bonadea expressed worry for Elizabeth's hurt and confusion. Once more, she had urged Elizabeth to be confident in her heart and not to be led into agreeing to marriage without being certain of what it was she felt for the suitor. Bonadea provided the orchid perfume that Elizabeth now wore and assured her that the perfume had been made in such a way that a gentleman who truly loved her would be drawn toward her even more than before. I must test it, I must, before Lord Lysel decides if this will become an official courtship. Ah, here comes your bow now, Miranda said, continuing to flutter the fan. Elizabeth looked around, searching for one person in particular. Lord Lysel appeared through the crowds, moving toward her with ease and that usual charming smile. The moment he reached her, he bowed deeply and grasped for her hand, with a softer touch than he had managed in their last meeting. You look remarkably beautiful this evening, Lady Elizabeth, he whispered in her ear. Miranda left swiftly, giving them a minute alone together. Thank you. That is kind. Elizabeth waited with bated breath to see how Lord Lysel would respond to the orchid perfume. After moving so close to her, he seemed to linger. Then he smiled fully, as if indeed the perfume had affected him. Would you care to dance? he asked and nodded to the dance floor. I would love to. Thank you. Elizabeth offered her hand to him a second time, only too glad to be drawn away. Perhaps now things will feel different between us. My parents will not be here to cause distraction over money and business, so I shall see what is truly in his heart. They took their place on the dance floor with the other guests, with everyone's jewellery glittering in the candlelight. Lord Lyle's eyes never moved from her own as they waited for the violin music to begin. The moment it struck up, she curtsied deeply as he bowed, and the opening notes of a dark and dramatic quadrille began. Elizabeth performed the movements of the dance with eagerness, moving toward Lord Lyle and walking around him. Her eyes watched his face the entire time, trying to take in his reaction to her, the twitch of a cheek, and the way his eyes followed her. As she stopped in front of him again, he took her hand, and they circled one another. Have I ever told you what a fine dancer you are? he asked. She smiled, somewhat startled by the compliment. It was a nice thing indeed to say, but she had expected him to say something about the perfume. You are kind, my lord, she said softly as they released one another and continued their circling pattern without a touch between them. I find I quite miss your presence when I am not near you these days. Oh, thank you, she smiled. Yes. That is certainly a declaration of affection, surely. Yet he never quite said the words. The music abruptly changed, as did the choreography. The violins played deeper notes, their sounds staccato and sharp. Suddenly Lord Lyle turned away, as did Elizabeth, for they had to change partners. When another's hand took hers, Elizabeth stumbled, so shocked that she nearly forgot the choreography and tipped over. Someone's hand came up to her waist, breaking the choreography, but keeping her safe from falling. Sebastian, she whispered in surprise. He stood before her in the dance, an easy smile on his lips. You didn't think I was going to let you fall, did you? He asked, his voice deep. 
They circled around one another with him releasing her waist now she was steady on her feet. Elizabeth stared at him, so stunned by his approach that she supposed that was why her heart fluttered so much and her mouth had turned dry. Sebastian. Yes, he said, prompting her on as they released their hands and turned back the other way, circling each other once again. I do not think I have seen you since that garden party. To see you again now. She trailed off, finding herself longing to speak of the fact she had missed him. He wrapped an arm around her waist and drew her into his side, escorting her with a three-time step through the couples to take up a new position on the dance floor. I know. Sebastian moved closer, whispering in her ear so close that she felt a shudder of excitement pass over her body. I would be lying if I said I had not thought much of that day and our time together in the kitchen. He thinks of it too. As they came to release one another, their heads bent toward one another. Her gaze lingered on his smile. It was fuller than Lord Lyle's was, taking up his entire face. That's quite a scent you are wearing tonight, Elizabeth, he murmured to her. It suits you well. Then he was gone. As per the choreography, they were taken back by their previous partners. Struck by Sebastian's words, she kept looking in his direction, even as Lord Lysel took her back to the beginning of the dance, and they circled around one another. Have I mentioned what a fine perfume you're wearing this evening, Elizabeth? Lord Lysel asked. Abruptly, her gaze shifted back to him. What is going on? Does this perfume have the power to render every man attached to my side? Pah! She could have laughed at the idea, but chewed her lip, trying to keep a straight face. Thank you, my lord, she whispered to him as they continued to dance. They passed some minutes in silence, before they had to change partners again. When her hand was taken by Sebastian, Elizabeth felt jittery. One hand took her waist, the other her palm, and he led her around the floor, his gaze rather intense. You are a fine dancer, Elizabeth said, trying to find something to say so she no longer stared at him like a fool. It is a shame you and I have not danced more together. Keep your dance card free then, Elizabeth. He winked at her, showing his intentions. Now your previous partner has come to claim you again. He sighed rather dramatically, pulling a laugh from her. They were forced to release one another, their hands lingering together for perhaps a beat longer than the choreography dictated. Then her view of Sebastian was lost, as Lord Liesel swept her away again. When the music ended, and they bowed and curtsied to one another, Elizabeth hung about in the centre of the floor waiting to see what would happen next. Out of the corner of her eye, she saw Sebastian saying goodbye to his dance partner and moving toward her. She turned to him, smiling, certain now that this perfume had affected more than one gentleman tonight. Yet, before Sebastian could reach her side, Lord Lysel took her hand again. It is a waltz next, Lady Elizabeth. Come, let us dance. He threaded her arm through his own and swept her away before Sebastian could reach her. She looked back at him with an apologetic glance, but he didn't appear to notice. He'd stalled in the middle of the floor, his eyes on Lord Lysel. Sebastian. This is ridiculous. Sebastian reached for a brandy glass and downed the contents. Ridiculous? Yes, I agree. Catherine took the glass out of his hands. Though I believe you and I are talking of different things. Come off it, Catherine. Let's face it, you and I are poor excuses for matchmakers, Sebastian hissed, looking around themselves to make sure that no one was hiding behind the nearest swathes of cloth that hung from the ceiling, out of fear of their conversation being overheard. We have endeavoured twice now to show Elizabeth what I feel for her, and each time he gets in the way. He thrust a finger across the ballroom to where Lord Lysel was now dancing a waltz with Elizabeth. I will admit the gentleman is proving interfering, Catherine said, tapping the glass in her grasp. Interfering? Pah! I could use a stronger word. As could I, Catherine said and rolled her eyes. 
but I am sure my mother would say I was using unladylike language if I did. She tried to place the glass down on a nearby ledge, but she was so busy staring at Lord Lyle that it slipped from her fingers. Oops. Sebastian reached out wildly and barely caught it in time. Your clumsy ways, Sebastian whispered with a smile. It's a good job I follow you around and pick up after you. I'm not so bad, I was distracted. She was pointing behind him wildly like a bird flapping its wings. By what? Sebastian asked, lifting the glass to his lips again. I'm hardly being subtle as it is, am I? So let me try something else. She stood on his toe. Ow. Strand straight and look proper. Your rival is coming to speak to you, she hissed and walked off at a little distance. Sebastian did as she said, putting down the glass and standing straight. As he turned around, he found Lord Lyle much closer than he had expected. Lord Lyle stopped in front of him, with no trace of a smile on his lips. The dark brows were furrowed together until they formed one long line. My lord. Sebastian bowed his head, noting that Lord Lyle didn't deign to do the same, though technically Sebastian had the higher title of the two of them and was owed that much in greeting. How do you fare this evening? Enough. His voice was sharp. I beg your pardon, Sebastian said, purposefully lightening his voice. I saw you. Lord Lysel stepped closer still. You flutter around Elizabeth like a wasp on a flower, do you not? His lips curled, as if caught somewhere between amusement at the idea and sneering. She and I are old friends, Sebastian reminded Lord Lyle. Not to be cowed by such an arrogant man, he stood tall, meeting the gentleman's gaze. Did you expect me to ignore a friend all evening? That dance. Lord Lysel turned red in the face, his hands jittery at his sides, betraying his anger. Oh, you mean the quadrille that calls for partners to swap places? Sebastian reminded Lord Lysel. That was hardly of my choice, was it? You think I did not see the way you looked at her during it? Lord Lysel asked sharply. Sebastian reached for the glass behind him again so that he would have something to do. He lifted it to his lips and took a hefty gulp, feeling pinned to the spot by Lord Lysel's cold gaze. Do you also not think I saw the way you crossed toward her? Practically a boy running after a foolish fancy. That was what you were. Laughable, Lord Lysel hissed. Is that what you saw? Sebastian said with a smile of humour, the brandy making him more confident than usual. If I was just a boy with a foolish fancy, then why bother coming to talk to me at all? If I didn't know any better, I'd say you were concerned and had come to warn me off. Not concerned, no. Lord Lysel tipped his chin higher. After all, Elizabeth will soon be my bride. Sebastian nearly choked on the brandy. He thumped the centre of his chest, clearing his throat before he could cough. Ah, surprised you, did I? Lord Lyle's smirk grew further still, looking cruel in his self-satisfaction. Yes, she'll be my bride. You are not even officially courting yet, Sebastian hissed his voice matching Lord Lysel's in sharpness. We practically are. Lord Lyle shrugged, as if the technicality did not matter. Let me make myself plain, for I will not have some silly Marquis make a mess of this situation for me. He stepped closer to Sebastian, his voice lowering an octave. Elizabeth is the perfect pretty bride, with the same pretty dowry. And there it is. The truth. Sebastian breathed deeply, feeling his nostrils practically flaring in anger. You would talk of her in such a way, Sebastian asked, his voice growing wild. She's a woman, not a prize to have on your arm. Enough, Lord Lysel snapped with his voice low. I merely came to speak to you to make it clear that whatever liking you have for her, it is at an end. Instead of looking around and always seeing you hang by Elizabeth's side like her shadow, I will find you there no longer, you understand. It almost sounds as if you are threatening me, Lord Lyle. Sebastian made his voice buoyant, scoffing at the idea. Surely not. 
would a Viscount's son debase himself so low? Do not provoke me further. Lord Lysel backed up. This is your last warning, Lord Wareham. Stay away from Elizabeth, for she and I are to marry, and I don't need to see you in her shadow any longer. He stepped away and hurried across the room, evidently going to hunt Elizabeth out again. Sebastian watched Lord Lysel go and felt his hand shaking around his glass, but not with fear, with anger. It shook so much he was in danger of breaking the spindle off the bottom of the glass. Chapter 23 Sebastian This is outrageous, Sebastian muttered, standing from behind the desk as Catherine walked in. She left the door open and practically tiptoed into the room, looking like a nervous and chastised child as she fidgeted. How many more letters are there? Sebastian asked, nodding down at the satchel under her arm. I think it wise if we do not count. Do you wish to know the extent of this town's woes? She asked dramatically and crossed the room toward him, upending the bag on the desk once again. At the mountain of letters that fell out, Sebastian dropped back down into his seat, sighing loudly. Hmm, it's like a little hill, is it not? Catherine asked with a giggle. A little hill, Sebastian spluttered. She jumped and knocked some of the letters off the desk. It is not nearly so bad as you make it out to be. Catherine picked up the letters again, but one that she kept returning to the desk slipped off the edge and repeatedly fell down, plainly not wishing to stay on the desk. Are you and I looking at the same mess, cousin? Sebastian was wild, gesturing to the letters as he pushed his sleeves up past his shoulders. Oh, you should have heard everyone's whispers last night, Catherine said and dropped the letter onto the desk again. When it fell off another time, she cursed at the letter, as if it was alive and had a mind of its own. Best answer this one first. I cannot keep picking it up. Sebastian snatched it from her and thrust it down on the desk. The heavy thud made her jump. What has gotten into you? she asked. Seb, you agreed to this. Remember. I'm wondering why now. He'd been in a foul mood all morning. He wasn't sure which made things worse. Was it that he was unable to get close to Elizabeth again all evening after that one dance? Or was it Lord Lyle's plain threat? That snake of a man, he does not deserve her. Seb, listen to me. Catherine hurried around the desk, reaching for his shoulder. I heard the ladies whispering between themselves last night. They were praising Bona Day as wise words and good counsel. You are the hit of the town. You are doing well indeed. Sebastian highly doubted it. But even if it was true, there was one great flaw. Then perhaps I am helping everyone but Elizabeth, the one woman I endeavoured to help with this. You should have heard what Lord Lyle said to me last night. He disgusts me. Sebastian practically spat the words in his anger. He treats her as some kind of trophy, not a person at all. Then answer her again. What? Sebastian looked sharply at Catherine. She suddenly plunged her hands into the mountain of letters. I'm sure I saw her handwriting in here somewhere, Catherine muttered to herself, checking letters and discarding them over her shoulder. Are you trying to make this room into even more of a mess? Sebastian hissed and dropped to his knees to pick them all up. If my mother and father see this, hurry, close the door. Yet Catherine made no move to the door. Instead, she kept searching until she found a letter at last. Aha! She declared with triumph and took his seat, flicking her heels up onto the edge of the desk with splendour, as if she owned the room in her victory. Here it is. Another letter from your lady love. She is not my lady love, Sebastian reminded his cousin tightly. Though I could have sworn there was something there. Sebastian remembered all too easily the way Elizabeth had looked at him when they had danced together the night before. It was the touch of her hand in his, the intensity of her gaze, the blush on her cheeks. Everything. Why was it so easy to persuade himself that she cared for him when she plainly gave Lord Lyle so much of her time? Hurry, open it, Catherine said, waving a hand at him. 
She picked up the biscuits he'd brought in for himself and chewed hurriedly, casting crumbs around her lips. You'll have to read fast if you don't want me to eat all these biscuits before you are done. Sebastian tore open the letter, hurrying to read Elizabeth's words. Dear Bonadea, I cannot thank you enough for your last letter and the orchid perfume you sent to me. They have worked. At last my heart shall be settled. With no more confusion, nothing more to mistake, I know that when I give my heart to my suitor, it will be safe. You are a fair and wise adviser indeed. I wish you all the best, Bonadea. Your friend, Elizabeth. Dear God. Other curses erupted from Sebastian's lips so suddenly that Catherine jumped and dropped her heels from the desk. What is it? Look. He thrust the letter into his cousin's grasp. How can we have messed up to this degree? In our effort to show Elizabeth that Lord Lysel pursues her for the wrong reasons, we have somehow miraculously persuaded her that he loves her. This is mad. He threw his arms in the air and walked away from the desk full of letters, wanting little else to do with all these deceptions and ruses. I'm a fool indeed. Maybe I should have just queued with the rest of her suitors that day at her house, he muttered, then shook his head a minute later, knowing he couldn't have done. Baroness Grey had dismissed him like a stray dog from the house. Unwanted. Oh, Catherine murmured. Her gasp caught his attention and he looked toward her. She put the letter down slowly on the desk and wiped her lips with crumbs, such sadness taking over her features that he felt guilty for being sharp with her. She is going to marry him then. Her shoulders slumped. I fear it is so. This has gone on long enough. Sebastian shook his head, turning back to face his cousin. I heard it from Lord Lysel's own lips last night that he pursues Elizabeth for her pretty dowry. He mimicked Lord Lysel's voice mockingly. She must learn of this, or she will make a grave mistake indeed. He reached behind Catherine and pulled out his tailcoat from where he had slung it across the back of the chair. He nearly ended up dislodging Catherine from the chair who planted her hands on the desk to keep herself sitting. What will you say to her? Everything, Sebastian declared with fervour. I will reveal fully what I feel for her, that I love her, that I am a fool for not telling her sooner but hope to show her I could be a suitor for her. That was my error. In not being forthright, I have thrust her into the arms of the most odious man in the county. She must know. There will be no more secrets now. He turned, ready to march to the open door and leave the room when beyond in the hallway, he caught sight of the front door opening. Arabella? Arabella? It was his Aunt Clara. She marched into the house, flustered and red in the face with the ribbons of her bonnet flying behind her. Careful, Clara. Horatio followed behind her, catching the bonnet when it fell off her head entirely. They'll be here. She has to see this, she has to, Clara called loudly. Arabella! Catherine hurried to Sebastian's side, and they stood in the doorway to the study together, watching the scene unfold. What's happened? Sebastian whispered to her. I do not know. Good Lord, sister, are you intending to shout the whole house down? Daniel appeared in the parlour doorway with a deep, rumbling laugh. What has gotten you into such a state? It's the scandal sheets. Have you not seen it? Clara asked wildly, pulling out a sheet of paper she'd stuffed under her arm. Daniel, Daniel, look. He took the paper from her grasp, just as Arabella appeared beside him in the doorway. What is this? she asked. No, Daniel muttered sharply as he read the scandal sheet. How can this be? It's been years. How can someone know of it? I don't know, Clara answered swiftly, shaking her head. Horatio took her arm, trying to calm her down, but she could not be calmed and marched up and down. What is it? Arabella asked again. Daniel didn't let her read the papers, but folded them up tightly in his grasp. They talk of a local healer and adviser, he said, his voice soft and equally wary. They talk of a woman known as Bonadea. Sebastian felt Catherine's hand tighten around his arm, 
pinching him so tightly she was in danger of cutting of the blood into his hand. How can this have happened? Sebastian asked wildly as he walked through the garden marching away. Catherine raced after him. In her effort to keep up, she repeatedly slipped on the gravel path, then hurried to catch up with him again. I do not know. Catherine had a copy of the scandal sheet in her head and was hastening to read it as she followed him. They do not know who Bonadea is. They don't know your name or your mother's, so that is something, Lachgort. Something? Sebastian spluttered. He stopped walking and turned back sharply to face his cousin. Catherine came to such a halt that she skidded and nearly fell over. He caught her in a fumble and put his cousin back on her feet. Thank you. I would have had a face full of gravel then. She blew sharply, brushing the hair off her face. Catherine, this is serious, Sebastian pleaded with her. She nodded, her smile slipping away. If anyone discovers the truth, imagine what will happen. They will slate my whole family. I just do not understand why they say these things, Catherine muttered, waving the scandal sheet. When Clara and Horatio had appeared with the scandal sheet, Sebastian and Catherine had tried to take part in the conversation, but Daniel and Arabella ushered them outside. Evidently, they believed Sebastian and Catherine did not know the true identity of who this Bona Dea was. Catherine had snatched a copy of the scandal sheet before running outside, and the cousins had read it together to discover that whoever had written the article was out to cause mischief. They called the healer a practical witch, making spells and potions to trick young women into believing things they shouldn't. She preyed on the needy and young for money. It was a disgusting insinuation especially when most of what Sebastian had written in his letters was merely advice. What a mess! Sebastian cursed loudly as he walked on, with Catherine racing to catch up with him again. If anyone links this back to my mother, what will happen then? He scratched his face and thrust a hand into his hair, pulling on the tendrils in stress. My poor mother. All she ever did when she was young was help people, and look, we found scandal sheets back then that lambasted her name. Now it is happening all over again. This world cannot handle someone acting outside of the norm, that is the problem. I dare say you are right, Catherine muttered, chewing on her lip. But what do we do? If we are to protect your mother from discovery, we must stop people talking about Bonadea. Sebastian halted but this time he was not so quick to catch Catherine. She walked straight into him, and they nearly both fell over, struggling to stay standing on the drive. I know what must be done. He turned to face Catherine, his voice sombre. These whispers were started because Elizabeth told people of Bonadea. I must come clean to Elizabeth, explain all and beg her not to speak of Bonadea again. He turned away, striding through the garden. Tomorrow I shall go to her. I must beg for her forgiveness too. Chapter 24 Elizabeth This doesn't make sense, Elizabeth murmured as she pored over the scandal sheets in the back of the carriage. All night and morning had her mind been dwelling on what was said in these papers, baffled by the insinuations made by the writer. It seemed to Elizabeth's mind that the writer was out to cause trouble by suggesting that Bonadea was a witch rather than a woman at all. The person writing to me was no witch but a woman with a heart. I know it. Yet Elizabeth kept chewing her lip, thinking of the cupcake recipe and the orchid perfume. Was it possible there was something more to this than simply a wise old healer woman who knew how to advise a young woman on the nature of her heart? I have to find out more, Elizabeth muttered to herself. She put down the scandal sheet in her lap, determined not to read it again, yet despite her resolve she gave in to temptation and lifted it to read once more. Her mind dwelled on some of the crueler sentences, dumbstruck by their intent. Is it possible this Bonadea is hoping to ensnare all the minds of the young women in our town and village? 
Does she hope to manipulate them? For what reason, God only knows. Of course, we've all heard of witches before. They are the devil's lovers, his familiars, and perhaps her intent is merely to cause trouble and discord. May her identity be discovered soon so that we can protect all young women from her intentions. There was one thing in particular that Elizabeth's mind kept focusing on. It was a throwaway line in the middle of the article that baffled her. Of course, those old enough to remember the tales over twenty years ago now will recall that there were whispers about such a woman before. Is it possible this is one and the same woman back to cause trouble? At the time, it was known this healer made love potions, tonics and drugs that could control a man's mind. What if the witch is back to her old tricks? This is madness, Elizabeth said sharply as she folded up the scandal sheet and thrust it into her reticule. Desperate to talk to someone about what she had read, she had sent for the carriage at once. As the coach now jolted her from side to side, the carriage pulled up on the driveway of Baron Aldington's house. Catherine first mentioned Bonadea to me. She must know something about this. She must. The carriage halted on the driveway, and in her eagerness Elizabeth leapt down from the coach without waiting for the footman to open the door for her. Hurrying to the door of the house, she knocked, her impatience making her shift her weight between her feet. When the door opened, the butler smiled kindly, but raised voices behind him made both Elizabeth and the butler flinch. Goodness, is this a bad time to call? Elizabeth whispered to the butler. Baron and Baroness Aldington are in conference with the Duke and Duchess of Gordon, the butler explained in a low tone, nodding his head at a door in the hallway. I do not know what they discuss, my lady, but I fear they are all in such a state that it is not the time for visitors. I understand. I have come to see Miss Catherine. Is she available for a visit? Elizabeth asked, her eyes darting to the closed parlour door when she heard another raised voice. Was that a wail? Was one of the ladies crying? Perhaps Baroness Aldington or the Duchess of Gordon? The sound made Elizabeth's hands fidget together, fearing what could be the source of such pain. Yes, I am sure she would be glad to see you, my lady. The butler bowed and beckoned Elizabeth inside. Miss Catherine has been painting this morning. I shall show you to her studio. Thank you. Elizabeth glanced cautiously at the closed parlour door again. Whoever had been crying was being comforted by someone now, the sounds calming down a little, but she was still tremulous at the thought of such sadness. At the back of the house, the butler opened the door to a small room and beckoned Elizabeth inside. She smiled when she saw the number of easels and sketch pads that were splayed across the room. Art was clearly one of Catherine's most eager hobbies, and judging by the paint flecks on the wooden floorboards and the sheets strewn across furniture, Catherine got as much paint elsewhere as she did on the canvases. Ah, it seems Miss Catherine is not here. The butler's brows raised in surprise. If you would wait in here, Lady Elizabeth, I shall go searching for her. Thank you. Elizabeth stepped inside and put down her reticule. It had been some time since she had seen her friend's artwork, so she looked around the room as she waited. With tall windows that stretched to the ceiling overlooking the garden, it flooded the room with bright sunlight, the golden rays falling on the canvases. Elizabeth admired each painting in turn, finding that though Catherine had something of a wild style, she was an excellent painter. Each painting looked alive with movement, to the point that a picture of a horse felt so real Elizabeth wouldn't have been surprised if the horse bounded out of the painting. Elizabeth giggled at the idea and turned to another canvas, where a familiar face looked back at her. Sebastian. He was recreated quite perfectly on the canvas, his eyes staring out at her, captivatingly so. He sat back in a chair, his hands looped in front of him, and with that humoured smile in place as it so often was. Resting on the edge of his lap was a single yellow rose. Startled by the sight of it, Elizabeth stepped toward the painting, reaching toward it, 
as if she could reach Sebastian and touch him. She was so caught up in what she was doing that she didn't notice something was pressed under the easel. She kicked a hard box, then winced and looked down, wriggling her toes to dispel the pain. It was a tramp art box, heavily carved and ornate. Bending down to push it away so she did not kick it again, she found the box was open a crack. A slither of writing caught Elizabeth's attention, the black ink shining in the bright sunlight. It can't be, she whispered as she recognised the name written in black ink. Bonadea. Elizabeth pushed the lid of the box higher to find inside there were a myriad of letters. A number of them were written to Bonadea. No, Elizabeth muttered, reaching further into the box where she discovered many small glass vials, all bearing the same labels that read Orchid Perfume. In disbelief, Elizabeth dropped the letters and opened one of the vials, inhaling the scent. It was the exact same scent that Elizabeth had been sent by Bonadea to wear. Suddenly taken up by a fear, Elizabeth dropped to her knees and searched the letters, hunting for her own handwriting. With horror, she found her letters to Bonadea before her, gathered together in a bundle with a ribbon. This can't be, she muttered sharply. The door opened, whining loudly. Elizabeth? Catherine's voice sounded. Is everything all right? Elizabeth stopped what she was doing and slowly stood, turning around with the bound letters in her hand. In the doorway she saw Catherine was not alone, but Sebastian was there too. He stalled, his eyes flitting down to the letters in Elizabeth's grasp. Catherine flung her hands in front of her mouth, her eyes growing wide indeed when she saw what Elizabeth had found. Tell me this is not true, Elizabeth muttered, staring at the letters and looking away from Catherine. Are you the one they all talk of, Catherine? Are you... Bonadea? Catherine walked forward, but before she could say any more, Elizabeth dropped the letters and covered her face, thinking of all the personal things she had revealed to Bonadea. I cannot believe this. You lied to me. Lied. Elizabeth, please, this is not what you think. Catherine reached for her, but Elizabeth walked away, rounding the nearest easel that happened to be the painting of Sebastian. Her eyes danced between the painted face of Sebastian's and his own. He closed the door behind him, then walked forward. No more, Catherine. It's time for the truth, Sebastian said, turning and leaning against the door. Elizabeth, Catherine is not Bonadea. What? How can you say that? Elizabeth gestured to all the letters she had found. Some were still stuffed in the box, but others were now strewn across the floor. He brushed a hand over his face, a heavy sigh escaping him, then he moved around his cousin. Catherine shifted constantly, her hands fidgeting together. He laid a hand briefly to his cousin's shoulder a comforting touch, and he moved to stand in front of her, coming toward Elizabeth. In a way, I am Bonadea, Sebastian's simple declaration left her flawed. Elizabeth backed up, in danger of knocking over the easel that bore his picture. She knocked it, scrambled to hold it straight as he did too. They ended up standing close together, but the heat she had felt before in Sebastian's presence had been replaced with too much shock for her to feel anything else. You answered my letters. You. Embarrassment washed over her as if she had been struck by a wave of the ocean. Oh God! She turned away and covered her face with her hands. Elizabeth, please listen to me. Sebastian walked around her, gently taking her wrists and prizing them away from her face. There is much I need to tell you. How can you explain any of this? she asked wildly. Bonadea was the name my mother took years ago, he explained, his words escaping him so fast that they seemed to run together. She was a healer and advisor, but she laid down her pen. When we discovered this, it is my greatest error that I made use of her name. What? Why? Elizabeth pulled on her wrists, taking them out of his grasp, though she could no longer look away from him. 
because I did not know what else to do. He went on, his words still fast. I wanted a chance to talk to you, to advise you that Lord Lyle was not the man for you. Oh God, she backed up, her hands trembling as they now hung loosely at her side. The cupcakes. She saw it all at once. He'd persuaded her in that letter the cupcakes would reveal her true love. Then he had acted so strongly when trying the raw mixture, coming close to kissing her. It was the same with the orchid perfume. He had commented on it, just as he had said in his letters as Bonadea. The perfume, all of it. You did it all to what? To make me look at you? To ignore Lord Lysel? To see the truth. He matched her abruptly in volume and stepped toward her. Elizabeth, from the moment I returned, I knew things were different between us. Far from just being a friendship or a deep respect, I found myself quickly falling in love with you. In love. A few days ago, such a declaration would have been everything to Elizabeth, but now she didn't know what to make of it. How can a man who would be so deceiving confess to love me? You tried to manipulate me she whispered, backing up. No. His voice was loud once more. That was not what this was. God's wounds. Though I can see why you would see it that way. When she tried to escape around one of the canvases, in danger of knocking Catherine off her feet, who scurried to a corner of the room, she was cut off by Sebastian, who went the other way. I knew what your mother thought of me. I was ousted from your house fast when I came to call on you. It was plain I'd never be seen as anything more than your friend, certainly too young to be considered as a suitor. All I wanted to do was persuade you to see me as a serious suitor. That's all, Elizabeth. His words seemed in earnest, but Elizabeth couldn't get out of her mind all that she had discovered. The letters, the cupcakes, the perfume, all of it. It was all perfectly orchestrated. You tricked me, Elizabeth murmured. Please, Elizabeth. I have heard enough. She found a sharpness of tone she hadn't known she was capable of. It silenced Sebastian at once. He no longer smiled with ease and happiness, but stared at her, unblinking, his lips pressed firmly together. This betrayal, she murmured, her breath hitching. Even if what you say is true, do you think I could ever be persuaded to give myself to someone who would deceive me so? He didn't answer, but stared at her with his jaw slack, as if waiting for words that would not come. I have to go. She walked around him, heading for the door. Elizabeth, please, no more. I beg you, no more. Elizabeth flung herself from the house as fast as she could. On the driveway, she hurried into the carriage and gave instructions to head home. As they set off, Sebastian ran down the drive, calling to her through the window, but she purposefully didn't look at him and stared forward instead. Elizabeth! His shout of her name pulled at her heartstrings, but she still refused to look at him. As the carriage turned at the end of the drive and Sebastian was left far behind, the tears came at last. What a fool I am, she wailed as she did nothing to stop the tears but let them flow. It seemed her mother was right after all. Like a foolish child who believed in tall tales of love, she had written to Bonadea, to Sebastian, in the hope of an answer to her dreams. She'd believed his foolish tales of cupcakes and orchid perfume believing in some sort of magic that could not possibly exist. She had played into his manipulation, yet had mistakenly believed it was pointing her more toward Lord Lyle than Sebastian. Such tears flowed down her cheeks that when she raised her hands to dry them they ended up sodden, the tears pooling in the palms of her hands. When she arrived home, she managed to stop the tears, though she didn't doubt the evidence of those tears was obvious, for her eyes must have been bright red. She flung herself from the door of the carriage and hurried to the house, only to find someone leaving as she was arriving. 
Lord Lissell stepped out of the door. The moment he saw her, he smiled. Then that smile flattened. Elizabeth, what has happened? he asked with concern, taking her hand and drawing her to the bottom of the steps again. She stared at him, unable to speak for a minute, as she realised that the cupcakes and perfume had never had any effect on him at all. No, Lord Lysel had said kind things to her, because he had meant them. I am such a fool not to have seen it before. Forgive me, she managed after a minute of silence, her hand clutching to his. I have had some bad news, that is all. She couldn't organise her thoughts enough and decided to refrain from telling him just yet what an imbecile she'd been. Then, rather than press you to talk of the bad, let us talk of the good instead. He lifted her hand to his lips and kissed the back, but he held that kiss for longer than usual. It captured her attention. She held her breath, staring at him over her hand. She knew now that whatever she felt for Lord Lysel, she had persuaded herself to feel, believing that the cupcakes and perfume were proof of a connection between them. He was kind, respectful, yes, and she respected him. Yet any affection she imagined on her part was as much a creation as what was in Bonadea's letters. I have been to visit your father to ask him something very specific. In business? No. He laughed softly and stepped closer toward her. For his blessing for a courtship, Elizabeth. He has given his blessing, but I would never accept a father's permission without my loves, he said, his voice deep. Love? Elizabeth repeated, her voice breathy. Yes, indeed. He raised her hand and kissed it a second time. Would you consent to a courtship with me, Elizabeth? I promise you this. Whatever sadness is plaguing you right now, I shall endeavour to shift it and make you smile each day. The kindness of those words. Elizabeth was numb as she stared at Lord Lysel. He was kind indeed, loving, yet she felt no rush of heat or warmth. Forget love. Think of what mess the pursuit of love has gotten me into. Writing to women who turn out to be men in disguise, searching for help and believing in childish fairy tales. Y yes Elizabeth stammered out the word. Lord Lysel smiled at once and kissed her hand again. She stared at him, her body stiff and unresponsive to his kisses, though now she didn't seem to mind that much. Why should she care if Lord Lysel truly loved her or not? He cared for her, that much was true, and at least she would be safe with a gentleman like him. He would not do what Sebastian has done to me, never. Chapter 25 Sebastian Seb? Seb? What did she say? Catherine asked as Sebastian walked back into her art studio. He walked slowly, his body numb. When he looked at his cousin, no hint of joy on his face, she stalled. Oh, why did I even do this in the first place? He muttered and dropped into the nearest chair, flinging his body back and covering his face. No wonder she hates me. All at once, when looking into Elizabeth's eyes, he saw the hatred there, and he understood perfectly how, from her point of view, it did look as if he had been trying to manipulate her. What an awful man he was. All in the name of love. He tried to make her notice him, ended up thrusting her into the arms of another man, then made her despise him. He was sure the old playwrights that spoke of love never thought of a hero as hapless as he was. Such men never won the hearts of their loves. What is all this noise? Clara's voice sounded from the corridor. Sebastian was too caught up in his sadness to even fear discovery, but Catherine plainly did. She dropped to her knees and gathered the scattered letters as fast as she could, but she was too slow. The door opened and Clara and Arabella walked in. Arabella stumbled when she saw the tramp box, her eyes going wide. This is not possible. 
Then her eyes flicked to Sebastian as Catherine froze on her knees, clutching some of the letters to her chest as the others fell from her grasp and dropped around her, as if she'd been covered in fallen autumn leaves. Sebastian? Arabella moved toward him. What is all this? Clara asked and moved to her daughter. Mama, don't. Yet Catherine was too late. Clara picked up one of the discarded letters and read the name. Well, I think we are about to discover the mystery of why the tale of Bonadea has been revived. She thrust the letter back at her daughter. Catherine, explain. Catherine took the letter with a shaking hand, but managed to drop the rest of the letters again. Sebastian looked at his mother. She knew at once the truth, from the way she was looking at him. It could not be doubted. I'm so sorry, he murmured, and slowly stood from the chair, moving toward his mother. You did this? she asked, her voice breathy. I never told you of Bonadea. Never. We discovered it one day. We found the box. He nodded toward where it was discarded in the room, though he certainly had no intention of telling his mother they had been looking for her earrings when they had stumbled upon the box. To my shame, mother, I sought to bring the name of Bona Dea back to life. Why? Why would you do this? Arabella reached for his arm and gripped him hard. If you found that box, then you saw the tales in the scandal sheets the first time. People don't like local healers, women of old wives' tales, and wise words. They're suspicious of them, believing them to be witches. Why do you think I gave it up in the first place? It was my idea. Catherine stood dropping the last letter from her grasp. Clara looked sharply at her, such disapproval in her eyes that Catherine stumbled, nearly tripping on all the letters beneath her. No, it was my fault. Sebastian held out a hand to his cousin, refusing to let her take the blame for something that he had gone ahead with. Mother, please. He moved toward Arabella and took her hand. I'm so sorry. I didn't mean to put you in danger, the family, none of it. I had no idea that people would alight on the tale of Bonadea as much as they have done and start writing scandal stories. Please believe that. She nodded tightly and blinked, clearly trying to hold back tears, though he saw the signs. Her eyes glistened with those unshed tears. Bonadea is no longer here for a reason, she whispered. She effectively died long ago. She is you. Sebastian said simply. And no one wanted her, Arabella said with sudden volume. You read it in those scandal sheets today as much as years ago. She should never have been brought back. The heartbreak was plain. I'm so sorry. Sebastian knew he could not apologise enough times for what he had done. With one misguided idea, he had risked his family's reputation, broken his mother's heart, made Elizabeth hate him, and even sown discord between Clara and Catherine, for Clara was now standing beside her daughter with fury in her eyes. I will explain it all to you. You shall have to. Arabella released his hand and moved toward the box in the middle of the room, gathering the letters together. Mother, please, let me. Sebastian moved to her side to help, but she waved him away. This was my own foolish idea long ago, my stupid effort to do some good in this county. Her movements became flustered as she stuffed the letters into the box. No one ever wanted it. Not no one, Clara said simply, moving to Arabella's side and laying a hand to her shoulder. Arabella's flustered movements paused for a second. She looked up at Clara and nodded, the briefest of smiles passing her lips. If anyone discovers the truth now, she whispered, then broke off, clearly not daring to go on. We'll make sure no one does discover it. Agreed? Clara said sharply, looking between Sebastian and Catherine. Agreed, Sebastian said, his heart thudding hard in his chest as Catherine nodded, wordlessly, tears streaming her own cheeks. 
Elizabeth's arm looped through Lord Lyle's as they walked along the promenade of Swanage Beach, staring out at the ocean beside them. Not much had been said between them on their walk, not that Elizabeth cared very much today. She was lost in her thoughts, repeatedly going over old ground and asking herself the same questions. What would have happened if I had kissed Sebastian that day in the kitchen? Would he have told me the truth of being behind those letters? Or was I somehow falling into a trap he'd laid? Why have I thought so much of him as of late, if I was indifferent to him? No, I certainly wasn't that. But how could he do this to me? To the whole town? To deceive everyone? You have heard of the latest whispers through the town then, Lord Lysel said to her as they walked down the promenade, nodding to those that passed them by. I'm sorry? Elizabeth tore her eyes away from the ocean and looked at Lord Lysel. I swear I've barely heard anything else these last few days. Lord Lyle chuckled deeply. This witch's name, Bonadea, seems to be on everyone's lips. Elizabeth flinched and glanced back to see her maid, Sarah, chaperoning them from a distance. When Elizabeth revealed all to Sarah of what she had discovered, Sarah had been tossed into equal turmoil and confusion, confessing that she too had written to Bonadea. Yet she insisted that the words of Bonadea had helped her. Now she was second-guessing the motivation behind that letter. Yes, everyone does seem to be talking about this woman, Elizabeth said pointedly, though Lord Lysel didn't appear to notice her stress on the last word. It is baffling, is it not? he asked. That a lady who many suspect of being a witch, so many young ladies would turn to in their hour of need. It is not what you think. Elizabeth found her anger bubbling to the surface as she returned her gaze to the ocean. Sebastian said he loved me, but did he? Would a man who loved me go to such lengths? Surely love cannot be built on lies and deception. Maybe he even did such things not for love, but out of some sort of childish game to toy with me. She tossed and turned with such questions all night, and in her sleepless state, she found those questions simply came faster to mind and remained unanswered. With no wish to speak of Bonadea any more, Elizabeth sought to shut down the conversation with Lord Lysel by revealing the truth. Bonadea is not real, she said simply. What do you mean? Lord Lysel seemed greatly interested, tapping her hand that rested loosely over the crook of his arm. She is a creation, something that was made up. Elizabeth shrugged, trying to look nonchalant as if the idea did not affect her at all. How can you know that? Because two of my friends were behind the creation, Elizabeth muttered in her anger. It was a deception, my lord. That is all. A cruel one indeed. She huffed and watched the waves rolling in, with the white foam bubbling across the shingle shore. What friends would create such a woman? Lord Lysel asked shock tinging his tone. Friends, I thought, were good people, Elizabeth said and turned back to face him. Let us just say that when Catherine told me of Bonadea's name, I had no idea that she and Lord Wareham knew much about this woman already. It was just a creation, my lord. That is all. Did you write to her? Lord Lysel asked with sudden fear. Please, my lord, I do not wish to speak any more about it she begged. His smile softened, and he tapped her hand again. Then we shall be silent on the matter, I promise. Let us talk of something else instead. Something that will make you smile. She was gladdened by his words, but feared a smile would not come easily today. He lifted her hand and paused on the promenade, turning it over so fast and pulling her close that she was startled by the sheer intimacy of it. She looked back at her maid, noting that Sarah's eyebrows had shot up in surprise. Others on the promenade turned to look at them. My lord, Elizabeth said in a low tone, perhaps not here. We are in public, after all. Elizabeth, what would it matter? Lord Lyle asked, her hand so close to his lips. His mouth curled in such a way that it wasn't quite a smile, almost more of a snarl. You and I are so close as we are. Please, my lord, 
she whispered. I said no. She wasn't sure why she didn't want him to kiss to her hand at that moment. Was it because of the sheer informal way that he had done it, overbearing and in public so they could be seen? Had it been made worse by the fact he was reluctant to do as she asked? Extraordinarily slowly he released her hand, and she took it away from him, walking on. Sebastian's hands tightened around the shotgun cartridges as the pheasants flew into the sky. It was supposedly a good day for shooting. The sun was bright and many gentlemen had come to take part. Daniel had insisted it would take Sebastian's mind off things, but contrary to his father's insistence, Sebastian felt this was akin to torture. Daniel was off somewhere with other men of his own age, further down the field as they shot and chatted. Sebastian was forced to stand with men closer to his own age, and amongst them was Lord Lysel, who had not stopped bragging about his courtship with Elizabeth this last hour. Were you not interested in her at one point, Lord Wetherington? Lord Lysel asked, with a full smirk, as he raised his shotgun into the air and shot at one of the pheasants that had been roused by the beaters from the forest. God's wounds, are you still going to brag? Lord Wetherington asked, and moved away from Lord Lyle, coming to stand on Sebastian's other side. You would think you were incapable of talking of anything else. Nonsense, I am just a content man. You would be much the same if you had a promise of getting your hands on that dowry, would you not? Lord Lysel laughed when Lord Wetherington said nothing. Lord Lysel missed his faison, but Sebastian caught the wing and sent it spiralling down, earning praise from the gentlemen around him, all except Lord Lysel. That gentleman glared at Sebastian, reminding him of the night when he had been warned off going near Elizabeth again. Sebastian popped open the gun and let his spent cartridges fall to the ground. If he mentions Elizabeth's dowry one more time, there is no need to deny it, Lord Wetherington, Lord Lysel said, though his eyes lingered on Sebastian, showing he spoke to him as well. She was a much-desired young lady. All's fair in sport now, is it not? I thought the phrase was all's fair in love and war, Sebastian said tartly, receiving just a mocking laugh from Lord Lysel in reply. When his gun didn't fire and the cartridge grew jammed in the barrel, he turned away, returning in the direction of the beaters and footmen. Unable to hold himself back, Sebastian passed his gun to his own valet, Marty, who took the gun with a wince. Don't say anything, Marty pleaded, but Sebastian couldn't hold himself back. He hurried off after Lord Lysel, following him until they were quite isolated. Lord Lyle, Sebastian called. Lord Lyle stopped short of reaching the beaters and looked back his smirk growing insufferably wider when he saw Sebastian. Come to hear more of the woman who will be my bride. She's not your bride yet, Sebastian seethed, stopping in front of him. How dare you brag of her here as if she's some fine ornament to put on your mantelpiece. Neither she nor your dowry are there to deck your walls and make you look a finer gentleman. Your envy is palpable, my lord. Lord Lyle continued, that smirk not faltering. You do not deserve her, Sebastian said simply, wanting Lord Lyle to know it. For the first time the smirk slipped from its place. She is a good woman and deserves someone who loves her for who she is, not someone who thinks nothing more than the fact she is pretty and has a dowry. Sebastian turned around, happy to have said his piece and returned to the others. Yet Lord Lyle caught him up. Speak this way in front of the other gentlemen, and I'll be forced to speak of what I also know. He sized up to Sebastian, forcing him to move back a step. Know what? Of poor Bonadea, Lord Lysel whispered, reveling in saying the words. Imagine if I told the world all I knew about her identity, eh? What would the world say about you and your family then? Sebastian felt winded, as if Lord Lyle had kicked him in the stomach. No, he knows. Elizabeth has told him both about me and my mother. What happens now? Hate me if you must, Sebastian muttered, stepping back toward Lord Lysel, 
but you cannot do something like that. You think not. You'd be destroying my mother, not just me. That is madness. She has done nothing to you, Sebastian said in a rush. He reached for Lord Lyle, grabbing hold of his jacket, shaking it threateningly. Lord Lysel brushed him off sharply, then blinked, his smile growing into a full grin. Wait. He didn't know. He didn't know the full story. Your mother, eh? He laughed deeply. Well, thank you for that information, Lord Wareham. You have just given me even more ammunition than I had. Sebastian stepped back. He turned in a sharp circle, panicking about what to do now. He lurched in Lord Lyle's direction, who scrambled back across the earth like a spooked animal. You are not to do this. You shall not go near my mother, Sebastian said, his voice low. He advanced toward Lord Lyle, who grabbed Sebastian's shoulder, holding him back. They tussled, glaring at one another. Ho! Oh, what's going on over there? A voice called from the distance. Lord Lyle looked toward the sound, but Sebastian did not. He wrenched his shoulder out of Lord Lise's grasp, his hand bawling into a fist at his side. Lord Lysel, is something wrong? The man called again. He was moving toward them, away from the other shooters, with two other men behind him. You want them to learn the truth, Lord Wareham? Lord Lyle hissed in Sebastian's ear. Sebastian jumped forward, that hand a little behind him, certain that he would hit Lord Lyle in his outburst of anger. Let us speak plainly. Lord Lyle gestured between the two of them, lowering his voice to a whisper. I shall speak of everything I know of yours and your mother's involvement in the tale of Bonadea to these men walking toward us now, unless you agree to stay away from Elizabeth for good. You understand me? You will not visit her. You will not stop to speak to her in the street or at the market. Sebastian's hand shook behind him as he looked at the men coming toward them, their eyes narrowing in suspicion. It wouldn't be long now before whispers spread that he and Lord Lysel had some sort of argument. I have no choice. I cannot let my mother ruined, but is this to be it? I cannot even speak to Elizabeth again. Is that understood? Lord Lysel hissed with the words, stepping closer still. I have no choice. I have to agree. Sebastian's posture crumpled as the men reached them. At last, we understand one another. Lord Lysel turned away with a victorious smile on his lips. Just a misunderstanding, gentlemen. All is sorted now. Sebastian watched him walk away with the other men, his fists still shaking. Chapter 26 Sebastian. It has to be done. Sebastian had made up his mind. There was one way to guarantee his mother's safety and to keep to his promise not to go near Elizabeth again. It would be a sadness indeed to part from his home, the home he loved so much. But as he had said to Lord Lysel, he did not have a choice. With the candle he carried in one hand, he raised the other to knock on the door to his father's study. Enter, Daniel's voice called from within. Sebastian opened the door and stepped inside to find Daniel hard at work with the tenant's papers, flanked by many candles on the desk. When he saw Sebastian, he pushed away his quill and the papers and sat back in his desk chair. Seb, come in. How are you doing after today? I heard whispers from the men at the shoot that you and Lord Lyle were seen at loggerheads once. You could say that? Sebastian shut the door behind him and walked in. He put the candle with his father's own, then sat down heavily in the chair opposite his father. Daniel pushed up his shirt sleeves to his elbows, then waved at Sebastian with that knowing look on his face. You only come here when you have something on your mind. Come on, out with it. Daniel gestured to him. What is it you have to say? Sebastian inhaled sharply, preparing himself for his next words. I think it's time I made preparations to leave on that grand tour you've spoken so much about. His words had an instant effect. Daniel stood from his seat and rounded the desk, coming to sit on the very edge. He folded his arms with a deep-set frown on his face. 
This wasn't the response I expected. I thought you'd be dancing for joy at my decision to go. Sebastian waved a hand at his father. Look, Seb, Daniel leaned forward. I cannot deny I have wanted you to go on a grand tour. My own was cut short because of my health. He breathed heavily. As much as I would have liked to have travelled more in my adult life, it was not something that was ever going to be easy. The lines in his face appeared stronger. Sebastian shifted in his seat, seeing a glimpse of his father's pain. Do not misunderstand me. I've loved my life, many minutes of it, Daniel said with a smile. But we all have our regrets, and I did not want you to have my own. Then why are you not happy that I have now declared an intention to go? Sebastian asked, holding his hands open wide and attempting an easy tone. Because it is your motivation that worries me, Daniel said, grimacing. You and I have already talked a lot about this. The last time we spoke, you dug your heels in. You had no wish to leave your home. You love it here. I know. Sebastian rested his elbows on his knees, leaning forward. So, what has changed? Daniel asked, waiting patiently for an explanation. The silence that followed urged Sebastian to speak as much as that keen look. He'd seen many times over the years just how good his father was at making him speak. It's to protect you all, Sebastian's answer caught his father's attention. Daniel sat back a little on the desk, his arms loosening from their folded position. My errors in judgment have led to my mother fearing to go out. I can't live with that. He shook his head. Catherine and Aunt Clara are arguing constantly too. I cannot stand that. He couldn't admit to his father that Lord Liesel knew the secret as well. That was his own cross to bear. It is for the best, father, Sebastian said, holding Daniel's gaze. I should go. Even if it's not what your heart wants, Daniel asked with another grimace. Sometimes the head should be listened to, not the heart, Sebastian murmured. Wise words indeed. Daniel sighed and stood, walking around the desk again. Well, I am not entirely sure I am elated with your decision, but I understand it. I shall make the preparations. We can arrange it so you will leave within the week. Yet there is one more thing I must say, Seb. What is that? Sebastian asked uncertainly, his hands fidgeting together restlessly. It is harder to mend wounds and hurt hearts when there are oceans between you and an injured party, Daniel said, his voice deepening. If you are to leave, mend what you can before you go. Sebastian hung his head forward, thinking about his father's words. Perhaps there was something in what Daniel said. Thank you, father. Sebastian forced a smile and stood from his chair. Where would you like to go? What? Sebastian froze, looking back at his father. The continent is a big place, Daniel said, chuckling. Which parts would you like to see? Oh, I... Sebastian didn't really care where he was going to go, as long as it was far from here. You choose for me. You know the continent better than I. I trust your opinion. With these words he left hurriedly, aware that Daniel's gaze burrowed into him as he left. Rather than returning to sit with his mother in the parlour and explain his decision for a second time, Sebastian retreated to his chamber. He lit another candle and placed it beside him on a writing bureau, then pulled out some paper, ink, a quill and blotting paper. If I'm going to leave, there is something I must do first. He dwelled on his father's advice, knowing how right it was. He had to do what he could to mend things before he parted. He pulled forward the paper and dipped his quill in the inkwell, determined to write a full confession now of what he had done and why. If he was going to turn his back on Elizabeth for good in order to protect his family, then she deserved to know everything. At the very least, he could go to the continent with the comfort that she knew what was in his heart, even if she would still hate him for it.
Please forgive me, Elizabeth, he whispered, before placing the tip of the quill on the paper and beginning his letter. Dear Elizabeth. Come on, Lady Elizabeth, will you not smile? Sarah pleaded and held up another of the gowns. What about this one? It would suit you beautifully. I do not doubt that Lord Lysel would like you very much in this dress. Perhaps he would. Elizabeth took the gown from her maid, but still felt unable to smile. The last few nights had been as sleepless as the first after discovering Sebastian's secret. Though she knew that what he had done was wrong and she could not quell her anger, her thoughts had dwelled on other things about him since. She'd thought of his declaration of love, the time in the kitchen together, and how easy conversation had always been between them, full of spark and excitement. Yes, perhaps I shall wear this one, Elizabeth muttered as she held the gown up against her body and stood in front of the mirror. Her eyes flitted to her expression, and she saw how wan and miserable she looked, with her lips flattened together. Or perhaps not. She stepped away from the mirror and dropped the gown on the bed. Well, how about this one? Sarah reached into the wardrobe and pulled out a new day dress, one that was beautifully designed with soft blue thread embroidered into the bodice and the hem. Quite perfect for your picnic, is it not? Lord Lysel will love having you on his arm in this. Hmm. Elizabeth plopped down onto the bed beside the many dresses they were now laying out. She wondered why it was necessary to spend so long picking a dress. Surely Lord Lyle should like her no matter what she turned up in, even if it was a hessian sack. What do you think? Sarah pushed the dress toward Elizabeth once again, but she did not take it. Sarah, may I ask you something? Elizabeth asked, staring at her maid over the gown. Yes. You said that you wrote to Bonadea as well, Elizabeth murmured. Oh. Sarah's eyes widened and she moved to lay the gown down with the others. Yes, I did. May I ask about the advice he gave you? She addressed Bonadea as he, for they both knew Sebastian was truly answering all those letters. Not the exact words, for I would not pry into your life that much. I just wish to know what you made of what he said to you. I am happy to tell you the details. Sarah sat down on the other side of the dresses, adjusting them and fussing over them. I asked for advice on the fact my heart has been attached to a man for some time now. You must remember the number of times I've spoken of the coachman here. Oh, yes. Elizabeth smiled softly. Sarah had had something of a liking for the young coachman for a while now, but nothing ever seemed to be happening. I asked Bonadea if I was being a fool waiting and hoping for something that could never pass, or if I should wait a little longer yet before endeavouring to give up my liking. Sarah smiled rather sadly. The letter I received was a kind one indeed, which is why I am so shocked that you say this Lord Wareham was the writer of the note. He said that I should not dwell on a man that did not deserve it. The kindness of the words made Elizabeth jolt sitting straighter. He urged me to discover if there is any chance of the coachman returning my feelings, to be bolder and drop hints, for only then will I know the truth. If he does not respond to any such hints, then I know that I must move on. Is that not good advice? Sarah murmured and stood, hurrying back to the wardrobe once more. Yes, it was, Elizabeth said, chewing on her lip in surprise. She had hardly expected Sebastian to put so much work into his ruse or to give such sound advice to others. Now, what of this one? Sarah asked and turned around, holding up a bright pastel pink gown with far too many bows on it for Elizabeth's liking. It is one of your mother's favourites. Definitely not, Elizabeth said eagerly and waved a hand, begging Sarah to put it back in the wardrobe. A gentle tap at the door called their attention. The butler entered looking somewhat nervous. Forgive me, Lady Elizabeth. There is a visitor downstairs for you. 
Who is it? Elizabeth stood off the bed, wondering why her stomach fluttered when she thought it could be Sebastian coming to see her. It is Miss Catherine Aldington. Oh! Elizabeth sat down again. With sudden strength she could not bear to see her friend, not yet. Sebastian had insisted it was not Catherine's doing, but clearly Catherine had played a huge part in it. Tell her I am unwell and cannot see her today. Very well. The butler bowed his head. She has brought a dress back for you. She says they washed it after it got covered in flour. He shrugged, clearly uncertain what the tale spoke of. Yes, of course, Sarah, would you collect the dress from her for me, please? Elizabeth asked. Of course. Sarah smiled in reassurance and left the room, leaving Elizabeth alone with her thoughts. The moment the door was closed, Elizabeth stood and walked to the window, peering down in the effort to catch a glimpse of her old friend on the driveway. Catherine stood there with a gown in her hand that was quickly taken from her grasp by Sarah. When the door was closed promptly on Catherine's face, she stumbled back and reached for her horse. She pulled herself up into the saddle, the strong wind of the day buffeting her gown and her hair. She looked at the windows, clearly endeavouring to see something of Elizabeth. Then she was gone, riding off with speed down the lane. Here you go, my lady. Sarah's voice called Elizabeth's attention back to the room. She removed the gown from its long bag and laid it out with the others. Oh, there seems to be something here. She found a scrap of paper in a pocket of the gown and held it up. It's addressed to you. Thank you. Elizabeth took the paper from her maid to see that it was actually a letter with her name written across the top. She moved back to sitting on the bed and broke the seal, her eyes dancing across the words fast as she read the letter, recognising Sebastian's handwriting on the page. Dear Elizabeth, I know you will no doubt despise me for what has passed, but I beg of you now, at least read this letter before deciding to cast me into the flames of hell forever. I know I have done little to earn your goodness at this time, but I must take the chance to explain myself, for I fear I will not have another opportunity. I am to leave for the continent and go on the grand tour my father has so longed for me to do. I confess I have no great love or excitement about the idea, but I recognise now it is something I must do. Enough people know hints as to who Bonadea is, and out of fear that I have brought danger to my mother I must go to protect her. I wish you to know that my intention was never to manipulate you as you described that day at my cousin's house. Yes, it was misguided, and in reflection the act of a fool, but I can put it down to a desperate heart who thought he had little chance of being noticed by you in any other way. Elizabeth, you are admired wherever you go. After meeting you again and feeling myself falling for you so swiftly, I went to see you, and your mother wouldn't even let me glimpse you. I sought desperate measures because I knew not what else to do. My endeavour was never to coerce you into loving me too, but to show you that I loved you. All I wished to do was show you my heart, and to warn you that others may not be so honest in their pursuit of you. Everything that ever passed between us in conversation was genuine, and that moment you and I shared in the kitchen of my cousin's house passed naturally indeed. I was drawn to you as I've been so many times, and I fooled myself for a minute into thinking I stood a chance to earn your love too. That was my error, and I cannot apologise enough for it. My greatest fear is the danger I have now put my mother in. Bonadea was the pseudonym of my mother once, as I alluded to the other day in our discussion. She was a healer and advisor to this town and did wondrous things for many people. I have since learned the good she did for my aunt, Baroness Aldington, and my own father, who needed her help greatly indeed at one time. She was praised for her wise mind and good counsel, but those who love gossip and like to fuel people's fear and hatred wrote stories of her in scandal sheets, so she retreated and chose to no longer be Bonadea. In my effort to do something good, I have brought her into danger. Please, I beg of you, say nothing more about my mother's or my family's involvement in this matter to anyone. 
I could not bear it if anyone discovered my mother's secret. I know now I have marred the legend of Bonadea. I have ruined the good work she has done for so many years, which is why I am begging you for this favour when I know I do not deserve it. Keep my mother's secret. I fear men like Lord Lyle would use such information for their own ends. I will sign off now and wish you goodbye. I have vowed to another not to come near you at events, and I know after our last parting that is your wish too. So be assured that I will not pressure you to speak to me at such events. I will say goodbye to you now, for I am to leave for the continent in a week's time. Let these be my parting words to you. I do love you, Elizabeth. Perhaps I am a fool in the way I have acted and have made bad decisions, but I know you deserve to be happy. If I am permitted to say one last thing as Bonadea before we part, let it be this. If you marry Lord Lysel, please, make it the choice of your head and your heart, not just one of them. I shall miss you when I am gone. Your friend, Sebastian. Elizabeth lowered the letter to her lap, her whole body trembling. She did not realise she was crying until Sarah thrust a handkerchief into her hands. She dabbed at her cheeks, reading Sebastian's words again. I have missed him. There was something in his letter that made her long to see him again. For all the anger that was pent up inside of herself toward him, at once it dissipated. Instead, there was a great sadness lingering in her gut. He's to leave, she murmured. What was that, my lady? Sarah emerged from the wardrobe once again, practically smothered in the gowns she was retrieving. Sebastian is to leave for the continent. When the tears came harder, Elizabeth knew she had to do something for Sebastian. His heartfelt plea to protect her mother made Elizabeth afraid. Just how much had she revealed to Lord Lysel that day on the beach promenade? She had mentioned Catherine and hinted at Sebastian. Had she mentioned his mother too? There's something I must do now. Chapter 27 Elizabeth You seem eager to get to the picnic today, Elizabeth, Miranda remarked, hurrying behind her. I'm glad to see you are rushing to meet your beau. What? Elizabeth halted suddenly, her feet falling still amongst the long grass as she looked back to her other. Well, Lord Lysel will be there, will he not? Miranda said simply, and waved a hand at the footman following behind them who carried their picnic basket, and Sarah, who carried spare pelisses for them in case it grew cold. Oh yes, he will be, Elizabeth muttered, sharing an uncertain look with Sarah. She realised that she hadn't thought properly about Lord Lysel for some time. On the contrary, her mind had been taken up completely with thinking of another man entirely. Sebastian. Let us hurry to join the others. Elizabeth walked on, forcing her mother to totter behind her once again, her skirt so narrow she was in danger of falling over. When Elizabeth reached the clearing where the picnic was to be held, their hosts, the Earl and Countess of Dorsetshire, both greeted them warmly. Elizabeth smiled and said pleasantries, as did her mother, but her attention was divided. Hurriedly she looked over the meadow and the fields that were full of butterflies, hunting out one face in particular. She saw the Duke and Duchess of Gordon sat off to one side with the Baron and Baroness of Aldington. Though the three of them spoke and laughed together, enthusiastically, there was one who did not. The Duchess of Gordon stared down quite a bit, appearing unable to find much vigour for chatter. She fears what will happen next. Elizabeth crossed to the clearing where her friends waved at her in greeting, with Lady Yates and Miss Mirabel amongst them. Here, let us set up in this spot, Miranda said, taking charge and urging the footman to put down their basket and blanket. Sarah assisted him in laying out the blanket and Elizabeth sat on the very edge craning her neck back and forth as she searched for another's face. She saw Catherine, sitting with the group of ladies, though she did not look much like her usual self. Rather than taking part eagerly in conversation, she poked and prodded at the bread before her, barely raising her head at all. Where is he? At last, she spied Sebastian. He walked across the clearing from the path where all the carriages had been stopped. 
Under his arm, he had a small picnic basket. He placed the basket down beside his parents and sat with them, dropping down easily and extending his long legs in one athletic, swift movement. Elizabeth's heart ached as she looked at him, for she longed to be as they were before. If only she could turn back the hands of the clocks and be free with him again, as she had been before her discovery of his secret. Then Sebastian looked up. Their eyes met across the breadth of the field, and her breath hitched in her throat. It was an intense look indeed, and there was no trace of a smile on his face. Then he turned away and looked down. The absence of warmth in that look had her aching all the more. What is wrong with me? Why is it that I do not wish for him to leave? Ah, there you are, a voice interrupted her thoughts. Lord Lysel sat down beside her and offered his hand. Forgive me, Lady Grey. Would it be possible for me to take your daughter away for a quick walk? I wish to speak with her, and I promise not to go far. Of course. Miranda waved them away with a proud smile before Elizabeth could voice her objections. Reluctantly, she took Lord Lyle's hand, then begged Sarah to follow as a chaperone. Every few seconds she looked back in Sebastian's direction, though he appeared not to notice her exit, and was much more focused on conversation with his own family. You seem out of sorts today, my lady, Lord Lysel said, threading her arm through his own. Do I? My apologies, I was caught up in my thoughts. She glanced back again, and this time Lord Lyle must have noticed, for he dragged her forward with some haste toward one of the paths through the surrounding woodland, escaping the clearing. Sarah had to practically run in her effort to keep them in sight. Maybe we should not go so far from the others, my lord. Nonsense, it is just a short walk. We are courting, after all. What should be the harm in spending a few minutes alone with you? He raised her hand to his lips, but rather than kiss the back, he kissed her forearm instead. It was a daring and bold touch. Startled that she had no liking for that kiss at all, she took her arm out of his grasp and slowed her pace. He halted a few steps in front of her, staring back at her in alarm. We should wait for my maid! She gestured back to the distant figure of Sarah, whose gown had got caught on some trees. She is chaperoning us? She is not needed, not today. Lord Lyle took Elizabeth's arm again, too tightly for her liking. Ow! Oh, my lord! That hurts! She winced as she was suddenly dragged forward, far away from where Sarah struggled with the trees. Release me at once! You need not worry. You're always safe with me. Something in the deepness of the tone didn't make her feel safe at all. She remembered their last meeting, where he had grasped at her hand, and she had pleaded with him gently not to in public, and the reluctance with which he had released her. It had felt forced and unnatural. Something in the way he looked at her now was equally wrong. The hairs rose on the backs of her arms with fear, and she dug her heels into the ground beneath her. I must beg to return to the picnic. At once. She tried to spin on her heel and turn back, but he pulled on her arm again so that she fell into his chest. Oh! One kiss, Elizabeth, eh? He whispered, coming so close that she jerked back. Seal the courtship. No. Just one. His voice hardened. I said no. She spluttered louder and pushed against him, wanting nothing more than to be as far away from Lord Lysel as she could possibly get. At last, she managed to get distance between them and stumbled into a tree behind her, her back going flat to the tree trunk. Gazing at Lord Lysel, she saw the shock on his parted lips. There may have been a handsomeness to his face, but that was it. At once she felt how cold his presence was to her, and everything slid into place. All their conversations had been stilted. The only time things had ever flowed between them was because he had been complimenting her, flattering what little vanity she had. This meeting is at an end, 
she walked around the tree as quickly as she could, cutting onto the path further down. I must find my maid and return to the picnic. Elizabeth, we are not done here. Lord Lyle shot back in front of her. She leapt back to avoid colliding with him again. I said we are done. She seethed, but realised she might as well have not spoken at all. He reached for her, and though she tried to wriggle away from his grasp, his arm threaded around her waist and pulled her forward again. No, she complained loudly. Release me. He moved his lips toward her, trying to kiss her, and everything inside Elizabeth recoiled against the idea. She was repulsed by him and wanted nothing to do with him at all. Let go of her, that voice. Elizabeth didn't have time to look around in search of Sebastian, for Lord Lysel was abruptly knocked back from her. He staggered on his feet as Sebastian moved between them, blocking Lord Lyle from reaching her. Elizabeth stood straight, her hands on her stomach, as she tried to catch her breath. You didn't listen, did you? Lord Lysel said sharply, shaking his head as he looked at Sebastian between them. You were supposed to stay away from her, not go near her again. I thought I made that threat quite plain. Threat, Elizabeth spluttered, realising what was afoot. You think I could stand back and watch you attack her like this and not do anything about it? Sebastian held his arms open wide. Come near her again, and I swear I will not be held responsible for my actions. You interfering back. The curse was lost in the air as Lord Lysel took a swing at Sebastian. Elizabeth leapt back, her hands over her mouth, as Sebastian easily dodged the blow and shoved Lord Lyle in his back, making him fall to his knees. As Lord Lyle tried to catch his breath and stand again, Elizabeth moved to Sebastian's side. He tried to... I know, I saw your maid struggling to follow the two of you, he explained in a rush. You should go back to the picnic, Elizabeth, please go. He ushered her forward, but she couldn't go anywhere. With his back to Lord Lysel, Sebastian could not see what she glimpsed. Lord Lysel had recovered, and he was advancing towards Sebastian. Look out! She pushed Sebastian out of the way, as another of Lord Lyle's struck nothing but air. As he tried to attack Sebastian another time, Elizabeth looked around desperately, searching for sort of weapon. In her franticness, she took her shoe from her foot and threw it at Lord Lyle's head. It struck him clean in the temple and drew a little blood with the heel. He fell against the tree trunk, dazed enough to no longer pursue Sebastian. Sebastian snatched up the shoe and gave it back to Elizabeth, then hurried her back down the path. He didn't take her hand or reach for her in any way, but the repeated way he glanced at her made her feel cared for. Thank you she murmured in a rush as they escaped to the tree line where they found Sarah. She tugged on the skirt of her gown, tearing it open, but at least she was finally free. When she looked up and saw Elizabeth's expression, she turned white. What has happened? she asked. Best leave that for another time, Sebastian said, stepping in, quickly back to the picnic, before Lord Lysel can get there first. Tell your mother of what has happened, Elizabeth. She nodded, intending to do just so. From this distance, as they crossed the fields, she could see her father had arrived now and sat beside her mother on the blanket. She would reveal to them both how Lord Lyle had tried to force her into a kiss, demanding to be alone. Surely that would be enough to call an end to this courtship. She certainly wanted no more to do with him. Sebastian. Elizabeth hesitated and looked around to him again as Sarah hurried off, holding her torn gown as close as she could. Yes. He stepped toward her and she placed her hand on his arm, needing some sort of touch between them. Just to be beside him, she felt that heat again. It was sudden, striking her like a string of a harp that had been plucked boldly. This has always been here, has it not? I always liked him, even in my confusion. Please do not leave because of me and certainly not because of Lord Lyle, she begged. 
Sebastian looked down between the two of them at the grass beneath them, such a look of agony on his face that she could not bear it. I have to go, he whispered, for my mother's sake. But God's wounds, Sebastian's words suddenly cut her off. What is it? she asked, noting the way he was looking over her shoulder at someone else. She looked around to see Lord Lyle had returned to the clearing from another path. He had dabbed at the blood on his temple with a handkerchief and marched straight toward the picnic blanket where her parents sat. No. Elizabeth took Sebastian's hand and dragged him forward. He stalled for just a second, before giving in to her and allowing her to drag him forward. Something tells me we need to hear this. Oh yes, I have a great secret, some wonderful gossip to reveal to you all. Lord Lysel clasped his hands together, laughing and beckoning to more than just Elizabeth's parents, but others on nearby blankets. Come, come listen to what I have to tell you. Soon enough there was no one at the picnic who was not listening to his words. What tale is this? Miss Myers called up from her own blanket, one that you know something of. It concerns that lady we have all been speaking much about as of late, the mysterious identity of Bonadea. At his hearty declaration he looked around, his eyes finding Sebastian beside Elizabeth. Sebastian came to a complete halt, as did Elizabeth. His face grew pale and his hand shook within her own. No, no, that snake. He would not actually do this here. My mother, he whispered. Elizabeth's eyes flicked across the picnic to see that the Duchess of Gordon had frozen completely still with a glass of lemonade in her hand. Her husband was endeavouring to make her stand, clearly keen on escape, but she was doing a perfect impression of a statue. Do you wish to know who she is? Lord Lysel turned back to face everyone. For she is amongst us all now. Is it true? Miranda asked with an amused giggle. I thought she was some old witch, that's what the scandal sheet suggested. Mama, please, Elizabeth hissed, moving closer to the picnic blanket as she released her hold on Sebastian. Looking back, she saw that he too now was reaching for his mother. He and the Duke of Gordon were trying their best to get her moving, to urge her to stand. No old witch, but a deceiver. Certainly, Lord Lysel said, continuing to speak with drama and full amusement. His eyes met Elizabeth's, and she tried to put into that glare all the anger and hatred she felt for him in that moment. He is not the man I thought. Not if he can try to force me into a kiss and would not seek to ruin a good woman's life. Go on, tell us, Miranda pleaded. Others joined in with the chorus, wanting to know more. Then I shall tell you. Lord Lysel held up a hand, pleading for silence. Across the blankets, the Duchess of Gordon had been practically dragged to her feet by her husband, and Sebastian tried to pull her away, but now they all froze as Lord Lyle's next words resounded loudly across the field. Bonadea is the Duchess of Gordon. Chapter 28 Sebastian Sebastian felt as if his whole world was crashing around him. In his grasp was his mother's hand that was trembling non-stop, as the whole gathering at the picnic turned to look at her. There were mostly judgment looks narrowed eyes and gasping faces, with hands thrown over their lips. Behind Arabella stood Daniel, with one arm around his wife's waist. Time to go, he pulled harshly on Arabella, trying to pull her away. How has it come to this? She murmured so quietly that only Sebastian and Daniel could hear her. On the other side of the blanket, Horatio and Clara stood too, beckoning to Catherine, who hastened to their side. It was clear they all intended to leave at once. The Duchess is Bonadea, a voice called from the crowd as Sebastian turned away, intent on getting his mother as far away as possible. She is not the only one, a voice he knew cried up. Fearing what was coming next, his heartbeat thudded in his ears. Was Elizabeth going to reveal that he'd also taken on that identity? I'm Bonadea too. 
Elizabeth's words drew him to a stop. As if he'd been struck in the back of the head, he froze, as did his parents at his side. I'm Bonadea as well. Catherine's voice piped up next. Sebastian sharply turned around to see that Catherine hadn't reached her parents' side after all, but ran to join Elizabeth and held her hand in the air. So am I, another familiar voice cried. Sebastian stared, slack-jawed, mirroring the same expression that was in his mother's face as they stared at the women at the picnic. In turn, one after another all stood up. Miss Myers followed, as did Lady Yates, and even Elizabeth's maid Sarah stepped forward and claimed the name as well. What in God's name is going on? Baron Grey asked, standing up and looking at all the ladies as if they had lost their minds. What is going on? Arabella whispered. Shh, don't question it, Daniel pleaded with the trace of a smile on his lips. This might just get us out of this. Sebastian waited, not saying anything. Lord Lysel, your accusation is a strange one indeed, Elizabeth declared, moving to stand beside him with her hands on her hips, for as you can see, we all claim to have that name. What? Lord Lysel spluttered, looking around at all the ladies that had stood up. Bonadea is no witch, no cruel woman as was described in those scandal sheets, Elizabeth explained, her voice loud and clear. She is a source of wisdom and advice that many ladies here have gone to. Many people can take on her name and become her. She is not just one woman, but all of us. Sebastian had to bite his lip not to laugh. This was absurd. How had it all come to this? Yet many of the ladies agreed. Hear, hear, Lady Yates cried and thrust a hand into the air. Ask around and I'm sure you will not find a lady here who does not have to thank Bonadea for something. Is that not true? All the ladies nodded in unison. Sebastian, Arabella whispered, tightening her hold upon his hand. Just how many ladies have you been writing to? Well, it's hard to say, Sebastian confessed hurriedly. They all wrote wanting advice. It seems you gave good advice, son, Daniel remarked, nodding at the crowds. Bonadea is about finding advice when we all need it most. Elizabeth took the reins of the conversation again being confident to speak of what we want and what we do not want. She eyed Lord Lysel carefully. To have the confidence to turn down a gentleman when he is forward, demanding, and tries to take advantage of ladies, as you today have tried to do to me. Dear God, this is getting out of hand, Daniel murmured, and took Arabella's hand from Sebastian's grasp. What? Sebastian looked around, finding Horatio appeared behind him. Her reputation will be marred now, Seb, after such a declaration. You might have to do something. He pushed Sebastian forward. What the? Sebastian trailed off again, watching as Elizabeth accused Lord Lysel openly of trying to get her away from their chaperone and force her into kissing him. There was shock and horror in the crowd. Some ladies looked away as others whispered into one another's ears. The gentlemen all glared in Lord Lysel's direction. That is not what happened, Lord Lysel denied it vehemently, but turned to Baron Grey as he spoke, appealing to him rather than his supposed love. My lord, you must believe me, that is not what took place. It is true what Elizabeth says. Sebastian found his voice and hurried forward, moving to Elizabeth's side. I saw it all, Lord Grey. He intervened. I am indebted to him. Elizabeth looked at him. There was such strength in that gaze he was lost for words. Their hands were so close as they stood side by side, he could practically feel her fingers brushing his. This is outrageous, Lord Grey thrust Lord Lysel in the shoulder, pushing him far away from Elizabeth. You think I would give permission to a man like you to continue to court my daughter? You must. Her reputation would be damaged after this. Lord Lysel's brows arched, showing his cunning at last. Sebastian was disgusted, as were many others who all looked away from him. I'd rather see her unmarried than married to a man like you. Lord Grey stepped back from him. We are leaving, now. 
Their footmen gathered up their picnic with Sarah's help as Lady Grey hurried after her husband, heading to the carriage. Elizabeth was careful to give Lord Lysel as wide a berth as possible before following her parents. Sebastian glanced back at his own family, uncertain what to do for the best. When he saw both Daniel and Horatio waving at him, urging him to follow, he ran after the family. He left the picnic far behind and hastened through the long grass, catching up to Elizabeth shortly before she reached the carriage. He took her hand, startling her so much that she whipped around, the loose locks of her fair hair dancing across her shoulders. Elizabeth, a minute, I beg of you, he pleaded. She showed no sign of walking away or even releasing her hand from his. You do not have to remain unmarried, despite what your father has said. I beg your pardon. Her lips parted. I mean... God! I'm useless when it comes to these sorts of declarations. It's why I hid behind another's name in the first place. He shrugged off his fears and spoke firmly. After all, he'd already told her he loved her in his letter. This time, it should be easier. It would be a blessing indeed if you would consider marrying me. She stilled completely. The only sign of movement was the wind picking up her hair. I know I have done little to earn your trust after all that has happened. But please believe me, I am not a monster like Lord Lyle. I pursued you because I loved you, not because I was interested in your dowry, and I would never take you far away from those you did trust and try to. He trailed off, not wanting to say the words of what Lord Lysel had attempted to do to her. If there is any way you can forgive me for your deception, I would love to marry you. She smiled. Her response was so sudden he was left breathless. Her hand tightened through his. Yes, I will marry you. A sudden exhale escaped him in a rush. Truly, he said, spluttering in his shock. Your letter, Sebastian, she whispered, stepping closer toward him. I have not been able to get it out of my head. Everything you said has stayed with me. Yes, what you did was certainly a strange way to get my attention. I cannot deny that. But you did it out of love. I could not stay angry at you for that. She smiled fully again. There's something more you must know. I look. Sebastian waited to hear the words, his whole body tense when Baron Grey suddenly appeared behind his daughter, cutting her off. What is going on? he asked sharply. Baroness Grey appeared on her daughter's other side. Father, Lord Wareham has just asked me to marry him, Elizabeth said, her words escaping her fast. Marry him? But he's too young, Miranda said at once. He's still a little older than me, Elizabeth pointed out. You were happy for me to wed, were you not? A Marquis? Baron Grey seemed taken up by the idea. Unlike the Baroness who now voiced her objections, Baron Grey stared straight at Sebastian. You are in earnest, Lord Wareham, or are you proposing to my daughter in the hope of rescuing her reputation? I am proposing to her because I am in love with her, my lord, Sebastian answered honestly. Oh, well, I... Baroness Grey petered off, her objections falling away as her lips parted and closed with no words passing between them. If I have your blessing, of course, Sebastian said, waiting for their answer. Father, Elizabeth said tightly, her hand closing firmly around Sebastian's own. You gave permission for me to marry a man that I was persuaded into believing I cared for. I pray you do not now withhold your permission when I am certain of the man. I do care for. With these final words, she looked at Sebastian. Then you have my blessing, my lord. Baron Grey extended his hand to shake Sebastian's. What a strange day this is indeed. So much has changed. Indeed it is. Sebastian couldn't stop smiling at Elizabeth, seeing the way her cheeks blushed red and she moved to stand closer to him. You and I must talk more he whispered to her. Later, I promise. 
When their fingers entwined together, Sebastian felt such a thrill he barely noticed his own family arriving behind them. The champagne seems to be flowing rather quickly, does it not? Sebastian asked as he sat down in the window seat beside Elizabeth. She laughed heartily and bumped him with her shoulder. Look at my mother. She can barely stand straight. Elizabeth gestured to Baroness Grey. I never thought she would celebrate so much at this news, though I confess I fear she is somewhat delighted with your position, Sebastian. I am sorry for it. Fear not. If it has helped me to win your parents' blessing, then I'm glad for it. He winked at Elizabeth, then looked at their families gathered together. Horatio, Daniel and Baron Grey were laughing as they passed around fresh glasses of port. Baron Grey seemed most intent on ingratiating himself with Daniel. Now he realised that he would have the heir to a dukedom for a son-in-law. Baroness Grey was drunk indeed tipping back more champagne as Clara and Arabella spoke with her, eagerly talking of preparations for the wedding already. Amongst them sat Catherine, who was happily sipping from her own champagne. She waved at Sebastian across the room contently, then nearly dropped the glass from her hand. Fortunately, the butler who was passing around fresh glasses caught it in time and passed it back into her grasp. It is done then? Sebastian whispered for Elizabeth's ears only. Your father has cut all ties with Lord Lysel. Entirely, Elizabeth said with drama. Father even sent a letter to Lord Lyle's father this afternoon to reprimand him for his behaviour and say that Lord Lyle should have been raised a better gentleman than he was. I am hardly surprised. Sebastian sat back, smiling, still too overwhelmed with his own happiness to dwell on another's sadness. Elizabeth moved with him, leaning against him. I am surprised at a few other things, though. For instance, why on earth did everyone start declaring today that they were Bonadea? Ah, that had something to do with me. Elizabeth lowered her voice further still. After you sent your letter, Seb, I realised what an error I had made. She grimaced badly. I was the one who revealed you and Catherine were behind Bonadea, and I feared what he would do with that information. I had to do something to ensure your family's protection. You did? Of course. She smiled fully. You have a good heart, as does everyone in your family. I would not want to see any of you hurt, ever. Her voice was firm. I wrote to all the ladies I knew had written to Bonadea and asked them if they had been helped. You'd be amazed at the gushing replies I received. You seem to have assisted many in this town, Seb. Thank God! He tipped his head back in relief. I feared some of my advice might not have been wondrous. They all loved it. When I explained to the ladies that Bonadea was in need of our help and could be ousted, they agreed full-heartedly that if someone should ever come to be accused, rightly or wrongly, of being Bonadea, that we should all claim to be her. That way no one could point the finger. She smiled with pride and nudged his shoulder again. That is quite brilliant, he chuckled. Clever indeed. I have my moments, she giggled with him. There is one thing more I do not understand, Sebastian said, and turned a little more to face her on the bench. What is that? she asked, sitting forward, her attention alert. You have agreed to marry me, Elizabeth. He breathed heavily, feeling his nerves return. You forgive me for what I have done then? She reached for his hand and held it tightly in his own. I forgive you, she said, in a whisper. And in truth, the moment I saw you this morning, I realised how attached I had been to you for some time, without really knowing it. All this talk of wanting to know what a man feels, my foolish ideas of needing proof of it, blinded me to see that my own heart had already attached itself to one person in particular. She nodded at him. Maybe my vanity was flattered a little by Lord Lysel, something I shall be endeavouring to forget, believe me. 
but my heart is not injured by him. Thank the Lord for that. He lifted her hand between them and kissed the back. As his fingers brushed her skin, she jolted, a pleasant kind of shudder that had him gazing at her all the more. Such tension crackled in the air between them that they both stared, not one of them looking away. You two aren't married yet, you know. Catherine's voice made them veer apart. She laughed and plopped down on the window seat between them, forcing them to back up from each other. To matchmaking, she declared, lifting her champagne glass high. May I never have to attempt to do it again, though it seems I was rather good at it after all. They all laughed together and found fresh glasses to toast Catherine's words. Epilogue Elizabeth two months later Please join me in congratulating the happy couple and welcoming Lord Sebastian Wareham and his wife, Lady Elizabeth Wareham. The vicar's words echoed around the church off the stone walls as Elizabeth turned to face Sebastian beside her. He was dressed handsomely in a dark green suit that complemented his hazel eyes. Her own white gown was embroidered with green flecks that passed through her veil and the hem of the train that trailed behind her. In her grasp, was a bouquet full of yellow roses. Kiss the bride, a voice called from the congregation, hardly discreetly. A loud applause struck up as many laughed at the words. Sebastian smiled too and leaned toward Elizabeth. Well, he whispered, clearly waiting for her permission first. Kiss me, Seb, she murmured for his ears only. When Sebastian pressed his lips to hers, Elizabeth lost her focus for a minute. She had so long imagined this kiss that she could have easily forgotten that they were in a church, had it not been for the applause that continued. The kiss was chaste but thrilling indeed. As they both moved back from each other, just an inch, they shared a broad smile. Now that was worth waiting for, he said, his voice deep. She laughed as he took her hand and threaded it through his arm. Ready, wife, he said, nodding down the aisle of the church. Very ready, she whispered, and let him lead her forward. The applause of the congregation grew louder as they made to leave the church, with their family and friends spread around them. Elizabeth's eyes flitted to her side of the pews, where she saw her mother and father standing together. Her father clapped eagerly, telling anyone who cared to listen that someday his daughter would be a duchess. In contrast, Miranda stood at his side, crying soft tears and repeatedly dabbing her cheeks with her handkerchief. Some weeks before, Miranda had taken Elizabeth to the side and sought to check that Elizabeth was certain of her decision. After everything had gone so awry with courting Lord Lyle, Miranda clearly felt the need to talk alone. When Elizabeth revealed to her mother that she loved Sebastian, that it wasn't just a decision made by choosing her greatest friend, someone who could also support her, but that it was also a choice of her heart, it had connected deeply with Miranda. Since then, Miranda had appeared to be much more of a romantic to Elizabeth's eyes, plainly something she had tried to keep hidden before. Sarah waved and called her congratulations, throwing petals in the air to wish Elizabeth good luck and her friends waved too, with Mirabelle and Lady Yates among them, with more than one set of cheeks with tears upon them. On Sebastian's side of the pews, Elizabeth saw his mother and father, who had asked her to call them Arabella and Daniel. Both were smiling broadly, as were his aunt and uncle sitting behind them. But perhaps the most excited was Catherine, who kept bobbing up and down on her toes as she clapped. They left the church together, where more people showered them with petals. We'll never find where all these petals go, Sebastian said as he led her through the churchyard. Perhaps not, she laughed, gazing up at him in her happiness. To the wedding breakfast? Yes, the breakfast, and tonight we shall have the wedding night, he winked at her. The word sent a shiver of excitement up her spine. They had rented a large estate on the edge of Swanage for the two of them to live in, away from their parents, but close enough so that it was easy to visit. Elizabeth could not deny that she was excited about being alone with Sebastian at last. 
far away from the gazes of their parents or a chaperone. You'll have me running to that house, away from the breakfast if you continue winking at me in such a way, Elizabeth said. He laughed broadly and led her to the open-top phaeton carriage that awaited them on the road. He helped her inside as their guests gathered around, each one talking to one another about the best way to return to the Duke of Gordon's house, ready for the wedding breakfast. Do not forget, cousin, Catherine's voice called to be heard over the clamour. Elizabeth turned in the carriage to bend down and listen to their conversation, just as Catherine stopped by their side. Forget what? Sebastian asked, not quite climbing up into the carriage just yet. You owe me something, remember? Catherine said in a teasing tone, tapping her own ear. I believe you promised me a certain pair of earrings in order to assist the arrival of this day. That's what you promised her? Earrings? Elizabeth laughed heartily at the idea. Since she and Sebastian had been betrothed, she'd heard all about the details of their previous scheme and could see quite easily how it had snowballed, especially when Catherine's excitable ways had got involved. She wished to borrow a pair that belonged to my mother. She has adored them for many years, Sebastian explained as he stepped up into the carriage to sit beside Elizabeth. Fear not, Catherine. Now I am married. I will be buying you your own pair of earrings, a pair that is infinitely finer than my mother's. Ha! Then you must be grateful indeed, she giggled. Very, Sebastian acknowledged, though he looked at Elizabeth as he said the words. Shall I? she said and stood in the carriage, holding up the bouquet of flowers. There was a call from the other ladies who shouted to her, eager for her to throw the bouquet. She tossed it into the air, and ladies squealed with more than one woman throwing herself at another in order to get the bouquet. Oomph! A voice called out in pain as suddenly the crowd parted, and they saw where the bouquet had landed. It knocked Catherine on the head before falling down into her fumbling arms. She looked up from the yellow roses at Sebastian and Elizabeth in surprise. Your next cousin, Sebastian called, just as the carriage lurched forward. Indeed, Catherine is next. But her mischievous demeanour and bold character cannot but drug her into great trouble. Bonadea's letters and Regency Society's cruelty is no place for romance for a determined soul like hers. Or maybe not. Scan the QR code or click on the link in the description to read the next book in the series. Share this video with your friend or watch on of the following videos. Subscribe to our channel, like this video, and hit the notification bell to not miss any new audiobooks. Thank you for watching.